Can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma allamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'na wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilman innaka ala ma tasha'u qadir. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, respected elders, honorable guests watching us from all around the world, I want to greet you with the blessings of Islam. May the peace and blessings be upon you all and the mercy of Allah. I'd like to welcome you all to this year, to the fifth annual Knowledge Retreat with the Muslim American Society. I'm your host, uh, Muhammad Atta. It is an absolute pleasure and an honor to be with all of you wherever you are in the world. SubhanAllah, we uh, usually have this event uh, live and in front of an audience, uh, but this year with the pandemic and with the way things have been, uh, we have to adjust and we have to adapt. And Alhamdulillah, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today and to speak with you and to host this year's Knowledge Retreat. The Knowledge Retreat is a particularly special event for me because I always feel like uh, it's more of an intimate setting. We invite just a few speakers and they come and they uh, speak for a lot, for usually a lot more than how long the speakers are in, are, are in session during the annual convention. And uh, in particular with the Knowledge Retreat, we tend to focus on things that might be a little more spiritual or maybe a little bit more technical or a little more intellectual than you'll see with the uh, Masikna convention this year. So this year's theme is in the shade of Surah Fatir. In the shade of Surah Fatir, pursuit of divine connection and Muslim identity. And this year's knowledge retreat, we're going to have more of an intellectual focus on the divine connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what does it mean to have that divine connection with Allah and how it manifests into our own identity? And what does that mean for us from a practical sense? How does it change how we think? How does it change how we feel? How does it change how we perceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And consequentially, how does that influence our relationship with Allah, with humanity, with nature, all together? And how does that drive our perception of Allah and in His awe and glory? Uh, before I introduce our first speaker for the night, I want to uh, just give you all a, a piece of advice. Since we will be focusing on Surah Fatir, I would like to welcome you all to grab your Qur'ans and open up to Surah Fatir. Surah Fatir is the 35th uh, chapter of the Holy Qur'an. And uh, it starts, and I'm pulling it up myself, uh, it begins on page 434. Ideally, we would go in order of the surah. However, uh, with the first uh, uh, segment today with uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi, we'll be starting from ayah 41. Inna Allah yumsiku samawati wal arda an tazula. So again, that's on page 439 of uh, the Quran. Surah Fatir is surah number 35 once again. And it begins on page 434, but this lecture will begin on page 439. Verse number 41. Our first speaker for the evening will be uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi. This will be the first time that we have him for both the Knowledge Retreat as well as for the Mass ICNA Convention. And it is an absolute pleasure and absolute honor to introduce him and to bring him on to our uh, segment uh, for the Knowledge Retreat. Dr. Yasser Qadi, as many of you know, is the uh, resident scholar and imam at the East Plano Islamic Center in Texas. He completed his primary and secondary education in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and uh, he studied also at the Islamic University of Medina. Uh, many of you probably follow him on social media. He's got his own YouTube channel and he's very active on social media. So I would encourage you all to subscribe to his uh, lectures and to uh, immerse yourself in his knowledge. So, Jazakumullah khair. Please uh, welcome Dr. Yasser Qadi with our first lecture, The Sky is Not Falling. As much as we think that things are bad and how dark and tumultuous the world may seem, this lecture aims at reminding us that as chaotic as the world gets, Allah is not only in charge of the chaos, but He is in charge of everything that revolves around it, and He will stabilize 
you and stabilize the world in his own way. Welcome, please. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa ma ba'd. Uh, so this is the last of a, a series of lectures uh, that uh, you have been listening to about Surah uh, Al-Fatir. Uh, and of course, uh, Surah Al-Fatir, as you know by now, it is a, a relatively early Meccan Surah. And it is a powerful and beautiful Surah. Frankly, on a personal note, it is actually one of my uh, favorite uh, Surahs. It's a powerful Surah that summarizes uh, the common themes of all of the Meccan Surahs, which is number one, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, number two, Two, proving the day of judgment. Uh, number three, Surah Fatir also has uh, one of the motifs of the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number four, of uh, marveling over the creation and power of Allah, both via uh, the histories of the past and also via the creation around us. So Surah Fatir is indeed a very key, a very important surah. It has a number of key uh, passages that are oft recited um, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the salawat that we do. Uh, for example, the famous verse, Ya nasu antumul fuqara'u ilallahi wallahu wal ghaniul hamid, that, O mankind, you are impoverished in front of Allah Azza wa Jal, and Allah Azza wa Jal is indeed al ghani, the one who needs nothing, and al hamid, the one who is uh, praiseworthy. So all of this you have already uh, done in the previous lectures, and I'm sure that um, uh, my colleagues uh, and uh, friends and mentors have done an amazing job. I have been tasked to summarize uh, some of the primary benefits of the last section of uh, the surah, and that is uh, verse number uh, 41 onwards, verse number 41 to verse number 45. So inshallah ta'ala, uh, in the next uh, half hour, 40 minutes or so, I will inshallah ta'ala go over uh, that section and derive and explain uh, to the best of uh, uh, the ability that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me. So verse number 41 begins, إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُمْسِكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ أَن تَزُولَ وَلَئِنْ زَالَتَا إِنْ أَمْسَكَهُمَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ حَلِيمًا غَفُورًا That verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يُمْسِكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ So masaka means to hold on to. And so most translators, they say that Allah is holding on to the heavens and earth, and tazula, that they, some earlier translators said, from falling down. But of course, I mean, the meaning here, and tazula, does not just mean to move or to fall. It means really to be eliminated. Zala yazulu means to be eliminated. And so, uh, and tazula means to cease to exist, really. Uh, and and so Allah Azza wa Jal is saying that Allah is the one who keeps everything in check for the heavens and earth so that everything remains in order. The harmonious nature of the creation, the, uh, the, the ways that everything around us is interconnected together, uh, the mechanism by which nature and by which all of the celestial objects and spheres, they interact with one another, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has set everything into place. And of course, from our perspective, all of the natural disciplines that we study, now we study them separately, we study chemistry, and we study physics, and we study biology, and we study astronomy, and we study mathematics, and all of these are separate disciplines. But in reality, these divisions are in our mind. The actual existence around us there is no division between biology and chemistry, between uh, uh, um, uh, astronomy and mathematics. They're all intertwined together. Everything exists as it is. And you know, all of these equations that we derive, all of the facts that we get from science, science, as this famous saying goes, there's an element of simplicity, but it is very true that science explains how but it does not explain why. That's something that is very, very true. We all know any basic scientist knows that there are specific constants of the universe. There are constants like the speed of light. There are constants like the uh, the weak force and the strong force. And there are so many uh, specific constants that are there. Even, for example, you know, the ratio pi, for example, right? The ratio of certain sizes and dimensions to others. These are things that we, we don't even know how they, they came about. And Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, I am the one that has set everything 
everything in order. And so the way that we should understand or translate is not just the simplistic that Allah is holding on to the heavens and earth that they don't uh, you know, fall down. Rather, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put everything in place and then He maintains it in place so that it does not disintegrate, so that it does not lose any aspect of its beauty. And of course, in another verse in the Quran, we are told to marvel over the creation of the heavens and earth and to then use that to derive the fact that there is in fact one God and one creator. Allah Azza wa Jalla clearly mentions in the Quran that if there were multiple gods, these gods would indicate or would be fighting one another such that the creation around us would not be in the beauty and in the uh, perfection that it is. So Allah says in the Quran that if there were more, if there were gods besides the one God, the true God, the entire creation around us would go to turmoil. That Allah says in the Quran, the gods would be fighting each other and there would be complete chaos. But because everything is in perfect order and because there is ultimate harmony in all that we see around us. So therefore, this clearly indicates that uh, the, uh, the uh, perfection of the creation indicates the perfection of the creator and that that creator is one being. Now, this verse also tells us that we are not deists. We are not simplistic theists. What is a deist? A deist is somebody who believes that there was a God or there is a God and that God created us and that he then left us to be. And this is something that was very common uh, in the 1700s, 1800s. In fact, many of our founding fathers of this country, many of them were not technically Christian. They were deists and deism was in vogue at that point in time before the rise of Darwinism and then agnosticism and atheism, which is now in vogue. Uh, deism basically posited that uh, there must be a God because the creation is too perfect to not have a God, but then that God does not interact with us directly, that that God has nothing to do with us right now. And so deism posited that God created the creation and then let it be. That's obviously false. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a living God. He is al-hayy al-qayyum. He is sami' and basir. He is the one who yujibu al-muttarra idha da'a. He answers the one that is in distress. Allah knows us. Innani ma'akuma asma'u wa ara. Allah sees us. Allah is aware of us. And this verse also proves this. Inna Allah yumsiku samawati wa rada an tazula. Allah is perpetually maintaining the heavens and earth. And by the way, the term heavens, samawat, right? We translate it as heavens. And what it means is the visible and beyond the visible worlds above us and around us. And the ard is, of course, the earth that we live in. And so the heavens, what it means is the galaxies, the existence around us. Everything that we can see and even what we cannot see, this is under the samawat. And the ard is upon us here, that we are uh, the earth that we are upon. And so Allah is saying, I maintain the heavens and earth so that they do not disintegrate. in zalata in min min Then Allah posits a hypothetical scenario, situation. And this is very common in the Quran that sometimes Allah posits something that is impossible to demonstrate the power of His possibilities. Allah says in the Quran, that if God were to have a child, then I would be the first to, to worship him, right? And God can never have a child. Allah can never have a child. But Allah is positing on the hypothetical scenario, if that were to happen, then indeed the Prophet and all of the Prophets would be told to worship. But they are not because Allah is not uh, a being that has uh, children. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, mentions other things that are uh, impossibilities. For example, I just mentioned that if there were other gods, what would happen that is an impossibility yet Allah is demonstrating the power of his knowledge by positing that which is impossible if it were to be possible what would happen when the impossible becomes possible and this is one of those verses that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying Wala in zalata in that in case if somehow uh, the system that Allah had put into place if somehow it were to disintegrate and it would cause the heavens and earth to then uh, basically basically go into uh, a chaos and to completely fall apart if, if, hypothetically, this is impossible, if 
uh, that system were to be destroyed, Allah is saying, who could put it back together? Who could protect it other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So Allah Azza wa is telling us that He is the one who maintains and that if there were anybody who were to cause any problems, none can protect other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wala in zalata in amsakahuma min ahadin min ba'dihi innahu kana haleeman ghafura. That indeed Allah is Haleem and Ghafoor. Now, this leads us to a very uh, interesting point which I have spoken about in other lectures, and that is the uh, reality of the combinations of Allah's names in the Quran. If you notice, this is something we are all aware of that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala typically typically always pairs together two names in the Quran. It is the default that Allah always mentions, not always, but usually, very, very rarely, Allah mentions one name, Ar-Rahman, very rare. Very, even more rare than this is that Allah mentions more than two names, right? That who Allah al-Khaliq, al-Bari, al-Musawwir, three names, right? Or uh, uh, that, uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal is uh, al-Malik al-Quddus, al-Salam, al-Mu'min, al-Muhim, al-Aziz, al-Jabbar, al-Mutakabbir, that Allah mentions that long list of proper nouns. But generally speaking, the Quran comes with pairs of names, right? So al-Samir al-Alim, al-Aziz al-Ghafoor, right? Wa huwa al-Rahman al-Rahim, al-Ra'uf al-Rahim. And then here we have uh, Halim al-Ghafoor. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes these two names, they are complementarily paired together such that, listen to this now, the first name deals with the perfection of Allah in His own essence, fi thatihi. And the second deals with the perfection of Allah in His actions to the creation. So the first name is a perfection that goes back to Allah and who He is. And the second name is the perfection of Allah that goes back to Allah and how He deals with the creation. Right? So the, these, um, uh, this type of combination or this type of pairing is actually very, very common in the Quran. And generally speaking, when such two names come together, then uh, they form some of the most powerful combinations. For example, al hay and Al-Qayyum. al hay Allah is ever-living in His Dhatihi. Al-Qayyum, He maintains and sustains every living being around to also be alive. So Al-Qayyum, the one who sustains life in others. al hay the one who is alive in His own, in the perfection. Likewise, for example, Al-Ahad and Al-Samad. Right? Al-Ahad, He Himself is one and unique. Al-Samad, the creation turns to Him for their needs. So again, Al-Ahad in His own self. Al-Samad, dealing with the uh, creation. Uh, also, for example, Al-Aziz Al-Ghafoor, one of the most common combinations. Al-Aziz, he himself is all-powerful. Al-Ghafoor, he forgives others. So these are very common uh, motifs throughout the Quran. Uh, that you have, for example, the first one goes back to Allah Azza wa Jal and His perfection, and the second name goes back to Allah Azza wa Jal and His perfection vis-a-vis -vis dealing with the creation. This example or this ayah in front of us is one of those examples, Halim and Ghafoor. Halim and Ghafoor. So what is Halim and what is Ghafoor? The name of Allah, Al-Halim or Halim, uh, it is something that indicates uh, the uh, Hilm. Hilm means two things. The first of them, and they are related to one another, the first of them is to control one's anger. And the second meaning of hilm is to act in the wisest manner. And the two are related because a wise person does not act emotionally. A wise person controls one's anger and is able to act in a dignified manner. That is what al-halim is. Al-halim is the, uh, the opposite of impetuous, right? So that's a good way to put this, right? Is that the opposite of halim, it is the one who is acts upon ajala. He is very hasty. He is impetuous. He just does and without thinking of the long term. The Halim is the one who does not act rashly. He does not act impetuously. And that is the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, Ghafoor, we know what it means. And Ghafoor is the one who covers the mistakes of his servants so that they are not facing the consequences of that mistake. And so we translate it as forgiveness. But technically, Ghafoor means the one who covers the mistakes such that the mistakes do not come back and haunt or do they do not cause any harm to the one who did them. And so Ghafoor is the one who covers the mistakes of his creation. Halim is the one who controls 
uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal does not act in a, <clears throat> a rash manner or act in an impetuous manner, but rather He acts uh, wisely. And uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, mentions these two names in the context of uh, the maintenance of the heavens and the earth around us, in the context of maintaining the perfection that Allah Azza wa Jal, if He were to act, a'udhu billah, rashly or impetuously, then this world would not be in the perfection that it is, and that Allah. Subhanahu wa Taala would uh, not uh, if 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 one of us let us say were to be given such power, we would not be able to control our anger. We would act in a rash and impetuous manner. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has the ultimate power, and He chooses because He is so perfect to control uh, and to act in a manner that is of the utmost wisdom, and that is why He is Al Aziz, and He is Al Alim, and He is Al Karim, and He is. Al-Halim. All of these are of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Verse number 42, uh, billahi jahda imanihim. They swear by Allah their most solemn oaths. Who, who is the one swearing? These are the Quraysh. The Quraysh are swearing that لَإِن جَاءَهُمْ نَذِيرٌ If any prophet were to ever come to them, if any warner were to come to them, لَيَكُونَنَّ أَحْدَى مِنْ إِحْدَى الْأُمَمِ They would be more rightly guided than the other nations out there. Any nation or that one nation. Uh, so what is being m mentioned over here? That the Quraysh would uh, boast, the Quraysh would say that, oh, uh, remember, the Quraysh had an inferiority complex when it came to the Christians and the Jews. The Quraysh felt that uh, they, that, that the Christian civilizations, the Jewish civilizations were superior to them because they did not have a prophet or a book. And so the Quraysh would say that um, uh, if only a book were to come, for example, we would believe in a book. Uh, and the, the Yahud would also say the same thing, that, uh, that this is something that we're waiting for the Prophet to come. So the Quraysh are saying that if the, we would also have a Prophet like that Prophet, or we were to have a book, then we would be the most rightly guided. We would be better than the Christians, we would be better than the Jews. We would be more rightly guided than one of the nations or than any nation. If it is one of the nations, they mean Christianity or Judaism. So they're saying that we are going to be better than Christians. We're going to be better than Jews. Or we can say we will be more rightly guided than any nation. So the Quraysh are boasting. And this, by the way, is a problem that we should learn from. Never ever boast conditionally that, oh, if I had this, then I would do that. You do not know. Never ever make that boast without adding, I hope that if Allah blessed me with this, then He would also bless me with that. Never make that type of arrogant condition. It is also mentioned uh, in Surah Tawbah as well. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ عَاهَدَ اللَّهَ There are those who promise Allah that if Allah were to give us wealth, we will be لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْمُصَدِّقِينَ We're going to be of those that are uh, giving the utmost charity. فَلَمَّا أَتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِفَضْلِي When Allah gives them from His bounty, they become stingy. So never ever boast in front of Allah. Never say that you know the future future that if you have this you will do that rather put conditional clauses oh Allah uh, I pray that you make me wealthy and if you make me wealthy make me of those that are generous put that type of dua so the Quraysh said that if only we had a prophet then we would be the best and the most rightly guided of all peoples then Allah says when the messenger actually comes what happens they only become even more driven away they turn away even more from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so subhanallah this is what happens when you have an arrogant attitude and you think that you know best and you think that if only I had this this would happen if I were wealthy I would do this if I were in charge I would solve all the problems of the ummah you do not know what you would do if you had that much wealth and power and frankly wealth and power are so corruptive that the default is that whoever has them is in fact corrupted and that is why we ask Allah for afia that he only gives us what we can bear we do not want to be tested beyond our uh, means and so Allah Azza wa criticizes this arrogance this cockiness of the Quraysh that you want a prophet to come and now that the Prophet is here, you have become worse than you were even before. Istikbaran fil ardi wa makra sayyi'i. You are behaving arrogantly in the land and you are plotting evil things. And so Allah Azza wa Jal is describing that they are 
haughty and arrogant. And of course, what is their haughtiness? Our Prophet Sallallahu defined arrogance is to reject the truth when it comes to you. It is to reject the truth when it comes to you. So here the Prophet of Allah came to them and they knew he is sincere. Many of them knew that he has been sent by Allah and yet their arrogance that uh, why should we accept somebody from that sub-tribe for example? Or why should we leave the religion of our forefathers? And so istikbaran fil ardi. And they had arrogance in the land. And we know that arrogance, kibr, is the worst sin in the eyes of Allah because kibr leads to shirk and kufr. The basis of kufr and shirk is kibr. The one who is arrogant against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never lower his head to Allah. And that's why Iblis, of course, Iblis, his sin was the sin of kibr. Istikbaran fil ardi wa makra sayyi'i. Makra sayyi'i here means the evil plotting. What is the evil plotting? The plottings of trying to figure out how to stop the Muslims, ban the Muslims, exile the Muslims, kill the Muslims. That is makru sayyi. And then Allah says, وَلَا يَحِيقُ الْمَكْرُ السَّيِّ إِلَّا بِأَهْلِهِ But evil plotting, evil planning, it only backfires on those who are doing the plotting. You cannot win against Allah. وَمَكَرُوا وَمَكَرَ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ They plotted and planned, and Allah plans, and Allah is the best of planners. You cannot outwit Allah. You cannot outsmart Allah. And so Allah is saying that if you think you're going to outsmart me, that's not going to happen. Your plans will backfire. And that is exactly what happened. And we see this throughout the seerah, most, I think, illustrated, most easily illustrated in the famous Treaty of Hudaybiyyah. In the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, when the Quraysh thought that they had the upper hand and they put the conditions that they thought would be for their benefit and they said that, yeah, if anybody uh, uh, becomes Muslim, then they're not going to go to Medina, etc., etc. And they themselves, they had to send an emissary to beg the Prophet to cancel uh, the, the conditions of the treaty. And the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah, they thought it was a victory. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it is a victory for the Muslims. Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. So this is the point here that... Uh, 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 that uh, that don't they benefit what are they waiting for are they awaiting the sunnatul awwaleen means the customs of those before what does that mean here the customs of those before means the punishment that comes to those who reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the punishment that comes to those who reject Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we, if we look at the previous nations if we look at the histories of those before us where are they now they are all gone and so the prophet system is being told to tell them what are you waiting for are you waiting for Ad? Are you waiting for Thamud? Are you waiting for Fir'aun? Are you waiting for all of the ancient civilizations? Where are they now? Are you waiting for that? The same thing might happen to you. You will never find any change, nor will you find any diversion from the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What this means is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he chooses to, he will punish the zalim. If he chooses to, he will destroy those that are arrogant. And so Allah is saying that you will not find that change in my ruling. And then Allah finishes the surah with two very powerful verses. أَوَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مَقَبْلِهِمْ وَكَانُوا أَشَدَّ مِنْهُمْ قُوَّةِ Don't they travel in the land? It's a rhetorical question. You travel. You see yeah, what, what is happening. You go. You, you know the remnants of the civilizations before you. فَيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ They can see for themselves the effects of those who were destroyed before them. And of course the people of the Quraysh, they traveled through the lands, especially in particular, uh, they saw the remnants of Ad and Thamud and the remnants of the Nabataeans that are still standing to this day. And so Allah Azza wa is saying that look at them and benefit from them. That وَكَانُوا أَشَدَّ مِنْهُمْ قُوَّةِ Those civilizations were more powerful than the Quraysh. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعْجِزَهُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَلَا فِي الْأَرْضِ That there is nothing in the heavens and earth that can escape uh, the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is never incapacitated by anything. إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَلِيمًا قَدِيرًا Allah is all knowledgeable and Allah is most capable and all powerful. So, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us a number of things. Of them is that we should benefit from history and from the signs around us. 
we should learn history and we should learn history for theological benefits. In fact, we should say every discipline and science that we study, whether it is physics, whether it is chemistry, whether it is astronomy, whether it is history, whether it is sociology, whether it is psychology, whatever discipline we study, we should approach it with the mind of a believer who believes in La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah and the mind of somebody who believes in La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah and the mind in somebody who understands that nothing happens, not a leaf falls except that Allah has willed it. When we have that understanding, when we have that belief, then every single discipline will increase our iman. If we study ancient history, if we study archaeology, if we study biology, if we study chemistry, whatever discipline we study, if we approach it with the mindset of La ilaha illallah, then we are going to be astonished and we're going to learn so much and it will reinforce our worldview. It will reinforce our faith. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, travel in the land. See for yourself the realities of those before you. See for yourself what happened to them. And of course, uh, this also is a, not just a permission, but it is a encouragement for us. It is an encouragement for us that when we travel, we should once again travel with the eye of a believer. There's nothing wrong with sightseeing. There's nothing wrong with having a vacation. That's all good and fine. It is mubah. But why not go to the level of mustahab? It is mubah to take your family on a vacation to have fun. But why don't you let, let, take it to the level of istihbab? Go to places that will teach us the realities of the past, that will demonstrate for us the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also notice the Quraysh are being put in their place. They felt themselves to be so mighty and powerful. And Allah says, your civilization is nothing compared to theirs. That's so true. Look at the power of the Nabataeans. Look at the structures of Ad and Thamud. Look at the governments and civilizations that they produced. Their legacies are far more powerful than the legacy of the Quraysh. Frankly, to be brutally honest, if Islam had not come, the Quraysh would have had no legacy whatsoever. لَقَدْ أَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكُمْ كِتَابًا فِيهِ ذِكْرُكُمْ We have revealed to you a book and in that book is your legacy. In the Quran is the dhikr of the Quraysh. If Allah had not revealed the Quran to the Quraysh and upon the Quraysh, the Quraysh would be not even a footnote in history. They did not produce the type of civilization or the type of infrastructure or any type of archaeological findings that would have been of interest to anybody other than the most you know, obscure. And so Allah is saying, who are you? The people before you, they were more powerful than you. They were more knowledgeable than you. They did things you did not do. And still, what was their fate? Their fate is that they are non-existent. And you know that they were destroyed for their crimes. And so Allah is saying, وَكَانُوا أَشَدَّ مِنْهُمْ قُوَّةً And so nothing is able to escape from the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing can make uh, the, the uh, can, can be a protection when Allah azza wa jal decides to send his punishment down. There is nothing that can come between uh, the punishment and the recipient of that punishment. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the very last verse in this uh, surah. وَلَوْ يُؤَاخِذُ اللَّهُ النَّاسَ بِمَا كَسَبُوا And if Allah were to this is a hypothetical, right? If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were to, uh, to do what? To deal with people and to punish people and to call them to task, yu'akhid or yu'akhad or mu'akhada, it is to uh, basically call to take the, uh, the to, to do a detailed as analysis and accounting and then to give what is due uh, as a reward and to punish what punishment is due. And so Allah is saying, if I were to audit you, and if I were to then deal with you the way that you deserve, bima kasabu, right? What you yourselves have done, there is no injustice. Whatever happens, it is because Allah Azza wa Jal is dealing with His creation the way that they deserve. Allah, inna Allah la yadhlimu mithqala dharra. Allah does not show injustice the weight of an atom. And so Allah is saying that if Allah Azza wa Jal were to deal with mankind, and notice, no one is saved. No one, not even the righteous is saved. Why? Because 
How little good have we done compared to our sins? How small is the good that we have done? You know, even the most pious worshiper, if you were to add all of that worship and compare it to all that Allah has given of the blessings of sight and the blessings of breathing and the blessings of life and the blessings of consciousness and the blessings of just being who we are and the blessings of Iman, if you were to look at all those blessings and then contrast them to our two, three hours of dhikr and dua and sajda, because really, how long do we actually worship Allah in our 24 hours? How long is our actual ibadat? Not more than a few hours. And on top of that, there is none amongst us except that there are sins that we are embarrassed about. We are using the very blessings that Allah has given us. We seek Allah's refuge, astaghfirullah, to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is saying that if Allah were to punish people the way that they deserve based upon their own deeds what would be the result there would not be left a single creature in the entire face of the earth not a single creature would be left standing and that's not just human beings that is even the animals that if we, when we deal with one another, if Allah were to deal with us the way that we deal with one another, if Allah were to weigh the pros and cons and the bad and the good and count everything the way that we deal with each other, not a single entity would be left standing. No one would be there. Subhanallah. This is the uh, reality of Allah Azza wa Jal's mercy. And this also goes back to the names. And that's why we understand now. Why did Allah say Halim and Ghafoor in verse number 41? Because Allah is preparing the way or, or opening up to verse number 45. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now going to bring up verse number 45. And this verse, it mentions the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to punish uh, uh, those who deserve punishment. And that is exactly the meaning of Hilm. The whole point of Hilm, like we said, the whole point of Hilm is what? It is to control one's anger. It is to make sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not act uh, in a manner that is, we would call it in English, impetuously. We would call it uh, basically uh, with a, uh, in a, in a rash, uh, in a rushful manner or acting brashly. Allah Azza wa Jal does not do that. So by mentioning the, mentioning the name Halim, Allah is indicating that he controls his anger. And that's why Allah is saying that if I were to deal with mankind the way that they deserve, then not a single creature would be left standing. But what is Allah saying he's going to do? وَلَكِنْ يُؤَخِّرُهُمْ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّى Instead, he shall delay. He shall delay until the appointed time. أَجَلٍ musamma. And the point here of saying أَجَلٍ musamma, the Quran multiple times, uh, the Quran mentions أَجَلٍ musamma, uh, And the, the meaning here is that it is a time that Allah has ordained, that Allah has decreed. The day of judgment is already there, set in stone. That Allah Azza wa Jal says that uh, it is not going to be changed. No one can go back and forth. When it is there, it is there. In Allah عِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ السَّاعَةِ Allah Azza wa Jal has the knowledge of the day of judgment. And when Jibreel asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what did he say? That Mal Mas'ulu Anha bi A'lam min as Sa'id. Neither me nor you know when exactly will be the day of judgment. So Ajali Musamma here, Allah is indicating, I know when it is. And whenever it is, it will not be changed backwards or forwards. It is exactly set in stone. And so Allah Azza wa Jal is mentioning that I'm not going to call you to task right here and now. You are given some leeway. And that is the whole purpose of this world, to have some leeway. But all of us eventually will have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why the Day of Judgment is called one of the names. There are over 30 names of the Day of Judgment. One of the names of the Day of Judgment is Yawm din And what is Yawm din Yawm din is going to be the day that we shall be accounted for. It's called Yawm al-Hisab as well. The day that the accounting and the reckoning is going to be done. And so uh, Allah Azza wa is saying on that day, I shall call you to task and I shall uh, go over all of the deeds. Now, of course, we learn from the sunnah of the Prophet 
that uh, not everybody is going to be given a hisab. There will be a group of people and we want to be amongst them that Allah Azza wa Jal will uh, enter them into Jannah bi ghayri hisab. Right? Yadkhulunul Jannata bi ghayri hisab. They shall enter Jannah without any hisab. And that will be the elite or the krem de la krem. That will be the best of the best. And bi ghayri hisab means the book will not even be opened. It will simply be said, go. You, are, you, you have passed. You're, I don't even have to go over it. And uh, the hisab, of course, we know uh, that Aisha radiallahu anha, uh, she asked the Prophet that, you know, what is the hisab and yasira? What is the easy hisab? And the easy hisab, our Prophet said, it is the ard. It is just to see the long list and then just to just say, okay, go and pass. So to go over line by line in the famous hadith manhusib, Uzzib, that whoever is going to be held for accounting, that is a punishment and torture. So there are basically uh, three categories when it comes to hisab on the Day of Judgment, right? The first of them, بغير hisab, And that is basically not even uh, opening up the registrar. Just literally go, Bismillah. That's what we want. That's going to be uh, the smallest of the batch. And that's what our Prophet said in the famous hadith of Ukkasha ibn Mihsan, that he said there will be 70,000 people that will enter Jannah without any hisab. And then in one hadith he said for every one there was going to be another thousand. In one hadith for every batch there's going to be another batch. So basically, not exactly 70,000, but basically a small quantity uh, of Muslims that are going to enter without hisab at all. Then there's the second category, and that is the hisab of the righteous. And the hisab of the righteous, it is mentioned in, in the authentic hadith, Allahumma hasibna hisaban yasira. Oh Allah, give us the easy hisab. So there's bighayri hisab, and then there's hisaban yasira. And the hisaban yasira, as Aisha uh, was told by our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is simply uh, al-ard. And al-ard, like, you know, imagine, I mean, you know, uh, when I give this example, I don't want you to imagine literally on the Day of Judgment. Imagine for us in this world that you go to the IRS accounting, right? Suppose the IRS is going to look, you know, and they you give them the, the ledger. And they just take the ledger and say, okay, thank you, you're done. And they just put it away. That is بغير hisab. Okay, that's completely. Now imagine another person comes and they open the ledger and he just glances up and down. Goes, okay, everything's fine. And then that's it. That's hisab yasir. Okay, and that's that. We we are happy with that. We're more than happy with that. Alhamdulillah. We want بغير hisab and hisab yasir is okay. And then the third category, which is we do not want that. And that is the IRS person, if we were to go to him with the ledger, he opens it up and he goes, where, where is the receipt of this? What happened here? Show me your bank account. And he goes line by line by line by line. And that's what our Prophet Sallallahu said, من حوسب عذب. Whoever is taken to account, shall be punished. What does this mean? It means that even if they get away, even if everything is fine, the very fact that they had to go line by line by line and they had to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is a type of punishment, even if they don't get into Jahannam. And of course, those that are not able to answer, those that don't, you know, they're not forgiven or whatnot, then in that hisab, of course, will be, uh, billah, their punishment as well. So the point being, Allah is saying, that if I were to deal with people the way that they deserve right here and now, there would be no people left on earth. But what I will do is that on the day of judgment, all of mankind will have to answer to me. And then Allah says, فَإِذَا جَاءَ أَجَلُهُمْ When that time comes, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِعِبَادِهِ بَصِيرًا Allah Azza wa Jal is well aware and watchful of His servants. Meaning what? This verse is an indication of both uh, a means of love and a bit of a frightening for the believers. As for the means of loving and compassion, Allah is saying, everyone has to do the hisab. Everyone has to answer to me. But oh my servants, I have you. I'm watching you. Oh my servants, I'll take care of you. Right? So there is that, that element of, if you could translate here, ibad, because again, uh, generally speaking, ibad is used in a positive uh, sense in the Quran. Uh, that um, uh, So the term abd uh, has two plurals, uh, ibad and abid. 
and generally speaking, ibad has a more positive connotation and abid has a more negative connotation. And that's why when Allah references his own servants, his own worshippers, he says ibad or rahman. Uh, and uh, here, uh, now sometimes it can also apply to all of the creation of Allah. So we can translate this last phrase in one of two ways. The first way is that when that day comes, then Allah Azza wa Jal will make sure that His select servants are taken care of in a nice manner. That those that are righteous, Allah Azza wa Jal knows who they are. And Allah will separate them and Allah will deal with them in a gentle manner. We already mentioned, بِغَيْرِ hisab and hisab and yasir. So this is a reference to that. Or we can understand it in a different way. And ibad here is not just the righteous, but rather the creation of Allah. Because again, all of us are ibad in, in one sense. And in another sense, with the, the righteous are ibad. So again, the, this is a word that has two connotations. Ibad can mean the entire creation. And ibad can also mean the choicest, the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are the blessed servants. So Allah is saying, in the second connotation, that when we mean the entire creation, Allah is saying, just wait. When the day of judgment comes, then I have watched and seen all that you've done, and I shall call you to task for your deeds. And this verse, it should give us a sense of fear. If this verse does not send some fear in our hearts, then wallahi, we have a weakness in our iman. If it does not cause us to reflect and think, if it does not cause us to think about standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having to answer for every single dhulm and every single injustice and every single backbiting and every single pain and suffering we have caused and every private sin we have done, if we cannot envision and visualize that and it does not send uh, a, a shudder of fear in our hearts, then wallahi, it it is a sign of weakness. It is a terrifying scene to imagine that Allah Azza wa Jal will be asking us what we have done, why we have done it. We have to answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَإِذَا جَاءَ جِلْهُمْ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِعِبَادِهِ بَصِيرًا Now, uh, the point here that is very, very important is that uh, we can, from based on this verse, also bring about a very beautiful consolation. And that is the consolation of understanding where and why zulm or transgression takes place. Because you see, dear brothers and sisters, the world, the world seems to be very unfair. The world seems to reward impiety. The, the, world, the, the, the world as it exists, it seems to allow uh, tyrants to go unchecked. It seems uh, that those that are uh, struggling, those that are being tortured, those that are in prison, those that are being killed by tyrannical regimes, that there is no justice. That is what it seems. But see, here's the point. There is no ultimate justice in this world. That's not the case. Ultimate justice is in the next life. And in fact, one of the most amazing, and I need you to pause and listen to this, one of the most amazing Quranic methods to prove the day of judgment is to use the justice and injustice argument of this world. In other words, the fact that there is no ultimate justice in this world proves that there must be a day of judgment where there will be ultimate justice. Multiple times in the Quran, more than once. Do you think we're going to make the criminal and the pious person the same? What's the matter with you? Don't you think? Don't you understand? Allah is asking a rhetorical question. How could you deny a day of judgment when you see for yourself that piety goes unrewarded and evil is sometimes rewarded in this world? How? How could you do that? Right? Uh, Allah says in the Quran that uh, do you think we're going to make the muttaqin like the fujjar? Do you think we're going to make the pious like the evil, the wicked, the iniquity, the, 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 the unrighteous? Is that what's going to happen? That's not fair. That's not right. And that is why we believe in a day of judgment. And the day of judgment brings about a consolation to our hearts. Ultimate justice is not meted out in this world. And frankly, 
You know what? Even if you caught a criminal, even if suppose a tyrant who's killing his own people, right? Torturing scholars of Islam, millions of his own countrymen, he has killed them. Chemical weapons he's used, right? The Fir'aun of our times and great scholars he has assassinated or thrown into jail. You know, these tyrants that are doing all that they're doing, suppose, suppose that the international court were to capture them. And suppose they were to stand in Hague, in the Hague, and the punishment is given, life imprisonment, let us say, because that's the max they're going to do. Okay, Or even in some other country, some execution is given. Do you think 6 million people, 10 million people, a country destroyed, awliya killed, do you think being put into a five-star jail with food and drink and water and air condition and television and whatnot, or even an execution, do you think that is fair? Do you think he's gotten what he deserves? There is no ultimate justice in this world. We cannot give and mete out ultimate justice. Rather, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who meets out ultimate justice. And that's why Allah is saying that if I were to give ultimate justice in this world, no one would be left standing. Rather, I shall delay justice until the next life. And when that comes then don't worry. Those that were righteous, those that were pious, Allah Azza wa Jal is uh, Halim and Ghafoor. Remember, verse number 41. Allah is Ghafoor. Allah will forgive. I'm watching you. I'll take care of you. And those that were not, and those that were evil, and those that disobeyed and sinned, then Allah is, look at verse number 44, Alim and Qadir. Allah knows exactly what you did. And Allah Azza wa Jal is all powerful, and Allah is capable of punishing you. And therefore, this verse really demonstrates for us the realities of uh, justice, the realities of how we deal and how we psychologically reassure ourselves about uh, dictators and about oppressors and about anybody who has oppressed us, whether it's on a national level, a personal level, a societal level, an international level. We take consolation from the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in fact the Alim and the Qadir and that on the day of judgment, He and only He will be the one in charge. And that's why we say, Maliki Yawmiddin. He is the one who is the one in charge of the day of uh, judgment and with this inshallah ta'ala let me just recite these beautiful verses and then inshallah ta'ala we will call it we will call it a, 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 le a lecture evening and inshallah I hope there was some benefit over here and I always believe by the way anytime we do tafsir anytime we we study the Quran there should always be the tadabbur of the verses there should all be a tilawa of the verses along with the uh, recitation and along with the tafsir it should all go together realize that uh, we have revealed, Allah says in the Quran, we have revealed this Quran so that you may ponder over this meanings and to recite it the way that it deserves to be uh, recited. So these verses from 42 to the end of the surah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إِنَّ اللَّهَ يُمْسِكُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ أَنْ تَزُولَا وَلَئِنْ زَالَتَا إِنْ أَمْسَكَهُمَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ إِنَّهُ كَانَ حَلِيمًا غَفُورًا وَأَقْسَمُوا بِاللَّهِ جَهْدَ أَيْمَانِهِمْ لَئِنْ جَاءَهُمْ نَذِيرٌ لَيَكُونُنَّ أَهْدَى مِنْ إِحْدَى الْأُمَمْ فَلَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ نَذِيرٌ مَا زادهم إلا نفورا استكبارا في الأرض ومكر السيء ولا يحيق المكر السيء إلا بأهله فهل ينظرون إلا سنة الأولين فلن تجد لسنة الله تبديلا ولن تجد لسنة الله تحويلا أولم يسيروا في الأرض فينظروا كيف كان عاقبة الذين من قبلهم وكانوا أشد منهم قوة وما كان الله ليعجزه من شيء في السماوات ولا في الأرض إنه كان عليما قديرا ولو يؤاخذ الله الناس بما كسبوا ما ترك على ظهرها من دابة ولكن ولكن يؤخرهم إلى أجل مسمى فإذا جاء أجلهم فإن الله كان بعباده بصيرا 
We ask Allah for afiyah. We ask Allah for salam. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla for maghfirah. We ask Allah Azza wa Jalla for, for hidayah. We ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to make us of those who recite the Quran the way that it is deserved to be recited, and that the Quran acts as an intercessor for us on the day of judgment. Wa akhir da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our Jazakallah khair, uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi, for that wonderful uh, speech. Inshallah, we will be uh, getting ready for our next le lecture with uh, Stada Sister Lubna, but first, a word from our sponsors. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. refugee and an orphan and you are the person who helps me every year you make sure I have food to eat and a place to sleep you make sure that I'm taken care of when there is no one to take care of me and you have given me hope for the future I'm not the only one who needs help there are many more that need someone to care for them donate now thank you for being there for us We are the millions of displaced refugees living in camps worldwide. For us, winter is a battlefield that we're ill-equipped for. Our tents are not insulated and our bodies are exposed to the harsh elements. In the depths of a cold winter night, our beds don't provide any safety from the freezing temperature. And because of this, many of us will become sick. And some of us may not survive until spring, especially the kids.
winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. Winter is coming. As our hands... Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters in Islam, respected elders, honorable guests. Welcome once again to the fifth annual Mass Knowledge Retreat. Very excited to be your host for this uh, for these uh, sessions. My name is Muhammad Atta. I'll be introducing the next session and the next speaker as well. Before we begin, let me remind you all we are we are reading from Surah Fatir. Surah Fatir is cha is chapter number 35 of the Quran. Uh, if you can open up to page 435, we're going to be Going a little bit out of order, uh, but uh, we're going to start from Ayah 5. Ya ayyuhan nas inna wa'adallahi haqq. So this session is called The Devil is in the Deception. Allah sets the stage for us in this surah by emphasizing three main points. Number one, Allah's promise is the truth. Number two, shaitan wants to take you away from that truth. And number three, your sins will be beautified to keep you away from that truth. So this lesson was going to focus on realigning our focus so that we recognize Allah's promise and we recognize what takes us away from that truth. Our esteemed speaker for this session is Ustada Sister Lubna Mullah, uh, Barakallahu Fiha. I have had the pleasure and the privilege of working with Sister Lubna on multiple knowledge retreats. She has always provided just an array uh, of knowledge and she has been of a paramount uh, benefit to her community and to the Muslim society in America. She's probably going to not like that I'm saying all this about her, but wallah, yani, we can't thank her enough for everything that she has done and what she has impacted. She is uh, the former uh, uh, Terbiya director of the Muslim American Society. Uh, currently, she resides uh, and was born in Los Angeles. She graduated from California State University, uh, Northbridge in uh, business administration with a focus on accounting. And uh, she moved uh, to Egypt uh, for three years with her husband, Sheikh Suhail Mullah, and her children. She studied Arabic, Quran recitation, Islamic sciences under the Azhari scholars. She currently, again, like I said, resides in California with her husband and four children. So please uh, welcome Sister Lubna. Barakallahu fiki. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's my pleasure to be here, my honor to, uh, to share the stage virtually with the, our esteemed scholars. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can uh, enjoy a fruitful discussion on something that's uh, quite evil, which is, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, as the brother Muhammad mentioned, uh, uh, one of the main deceptions in this world and the main deceivers is shaitan, is iblis. And, you know, a lot of times we don't like to, um, you know, focus on, on uh, such a great enemy, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that educates us and advises us in Surah Fatir and throughout the Quran about our chief enemy. So how can we uh, understand this life? How can we understand our weaknesses? And how can we understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and what he wants from us if we don't understand somebody who has dedicated his life to leading us astray? So with that, inshallah, uh, Brother Muhammad opens with Surah 5 of uh, Surah Fatir. Uh, sorry, Aya 5 of Surah Fatir. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising that, uh, is telling us that Allah's promise is true. What is Allah's promise? Allah's promise, what we know without a shadow of a doubt, without any interpretation other than what we know as truth, is that there will be a day of judgment. There will be a day where we will all be gathered. 
there will be a day when we will be asked about our deeds and what we have done that was pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be held account for. And the things that we have done that was displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will be taken account to. Uh, SubhanAllah, we know that the Quran is truth. We know that Islam is truth. We know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is truth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us of this. And, and, and within the same ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then warns us. You already know what's true, but be aware. There is something lurking. No, it's nothing uh, 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 that we don't know about. It's something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us. What is it? فَلَا تَغُرَنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا يُغَرَنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغُرُورِ SubhanAllah, very, very strong reminder and warning. So two things. Don't let this life deceive you. And let's pause on that for a moment, and then let me just finish that, and then we'll, we'll go back. Nor let the chief deceiver. Who's the chief deceiver? Shaitan. Don't let the chief deceiver deceive you about Allah. Two very, very powerful uh, concepts that can not only lead us astray, but also while we're trying to achieve goodness in this life, be patient, do the things that Allah wants, and stay away from what Allah Allah forbids, it, those two things can cause us much pain and suffering. SubhanAllah. In striving for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us, we can avoid a lot of pain and suffering even though difficulties come to us. Let's take this, uh, this quarantine that we're living in, for example. You know, many people have uh, uh, suffered great calamity during this time. They've lost loved ones. They themselves have gotten sick. Uh, they've lost income. They've lost, uh, subhanAllah, maybe their home. It's very difficult times. Uh, they watch their friends suffer. And then we have the mental suffering of the unknown. Uh, SubhanAllah, I'm speaking to a few therapists and they're telling us that the number of cases of anxiety, of OCD, of depression is skyrocketing amongst people who normally did not display, you know, some of these symptoms, for example, of these uh, mental health challenges. Because this great fear, when are we going to see people again? When are things going to go back to normal? Am I going to make it through? Uh, you know, is my family going to make it through? Am I still going, am I going to be able to find work? All of this unknown causes much distress. So this is an extremely difficult time. And other people have already faced immense difficulty throughout their life before this quarantine and before COVID. So what is Allah telling us here? Don't be deceived. Don't let the world of this life, uh, the life of this world deceive you. Don't let the life of this world deceive you. Don't think for a minute that this was supposed to be an easy life. That uh, if you did good as Sheikh Yasser Qadi, Jazakum Allah Khairan, that he reminded us, uh, you're not going to find ultimate justice in this world. Ultimate justice is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always. He's, he's aware and he knows everything and we'll find that in the akhirah. So don't think because you've done everything by the book that, that life will be easy or that there won't be painful, painful difficulty in this life. Don't let that uh, um, uh, delusion of this world take you off the track. Because what happens? What happens when we go through difficulty, then shaitan can whisper to us. You know, we have our own weakness. We have our nafs is weak. Our, our you know, our ego, our thoughts, they're weak and they're susceptible uh, to negative thinking. And the whisperings of shaitan. So he can tell us, you know, what's the point of doing all this that you're doing? You're struggling so hard to keep on prayer or to keep, you know, you know, uh, uh, on your belief. Maybe you're surrounded by people who are in disbelief or they're encouraging you or they're making fun of you for your, uh, your um, strong commitments to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are, there are people that I know they're living, uh, whether their family is practicing or they're of a different faith and they make fun of those who follow uh, Islam, and they'll say, oh, are you a big sheikh or sheikha? Or are you an extremist? I mean, these are the difficulties. So Allah's reminding us, don't get off the track uh, by the difficulties, and don't let shaitan fool you and say some of the things like, you know what, why are you going through all this difficulty? It's not worth it. Why don't you just enjoy your life? This is too much. It's not worth it. What have you, what, what have you enjoyed in your life to say that all of this is, uh, is worth it? SubhanAllah. So Shaitan uh, 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 can make us suffer by just suggesting, and of course, that's all he can do. He can only suggest things to us and tell us that all that we're doing is not worth it, or why don't you go ahead and indulge in some of these sins? And we'll talk about the, way, the ways in which he deceives people 
why don't you go ahead and indulge in some of these things? It's not a big deal. Allah will forgive you. Right? These are the ways in which uh, we can be deceived in this life or we can let shaitan deceive us. And this unknown, this getting off the track, this uh, um, you know, anger towards the difficulties of this life can let us suffer. Yet we can have difficulty and then be at peace with the difficulty. We can have rida, we can have acceptance, we can have satisfaction even while we're going through the darkest moments. Why? Because we know that we will meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the promise of truth that Allah has promised us. We will meet him in the day of judgment, inshallah. We will be, uh, uh, our deeds will be evaluated. So this gives us some satisfaction that all of this that we're struggling to do and struggling not to do is, is not gone to waste. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not let any good deed go to waste. And that includes being patient through struggle. So what a great way uh, uh, for us to, to uh, start this session by remembering this um, warning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let's go to A number six, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, in more clear terms, in case we weren't uh, uh, sure. Inna shaytana lakum aduun fattakhidhu aduwa. Surely Satan or shaitan is an enemy to you, so take him as an enemy. Be conscientious of it. Don't just say, well, you know what, we were, uh, you know, maybe we were burdened too much in our childhood and this is haram, we're going to go to hellfire. You know, some, maybe some of us in our upbringing that was too much in the forefront and maybe we've come to either take it lightly or joke about it, or maybe it has even scarred us in some ways. And, and in some people, they, they share this uh, with us that uh, this type of upbringing and, and pointing out shaitan, 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 and, the, and, and hellfire and what this is haram, it makes us so hyper uh, uh, vigilant that, you know, sometimes we're scarred by it or, you know, traumatized by that. But when we view the deception of shaitan and what he set out to do in a healthy way, it just becomes in our remembrance. So we will be careful not to be neglectful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will be careful to say, wait a minute, shaitan has a playbook. Let's understand it so that we don't think uh, 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 that we're immune to his deceptions. And he's very clever in his deceptions. And again, we'll talk about that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us, take him as an enemy because he is a clear one. He only invites his followers to become inmates of the blaze. And subhanAllah, when uh, on the day of judgment, uh, uh, we will say it was shaitan that had misled us. And shaitan will say, no, I only suggested it to you. I didn't make you do anything. And I clearly fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm paraphrasing the Quran here. This is a reminder that with all the beautification that shaitan does, at the end of the day, he knows who his Lord is, but he has asked to have that reprieve, to have that amount of time where he can uh, um, prevent or, or uh, distract or let astray the, those who are trying to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he is sitting on that path and he has promised that this is his job, that this is what he wants to do until the day that he is taken to account, that he'll sit on the path to goodness and that he will distract the believers and he'll be in front of them on the right and left and from behind them. SubhanAllah, this is a clear declaration of war. So understanding the ways in which shaitan disguises, you know, our thoughts and makes us feel like they're reality, like they're the truth uh, is, is really paramount for us surviving not only difficulties, but also uh, uh, helping us, inshallah, to stay on that path, because that is the, the difficulty. Uh, not knowing what the path is, but staying on it, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us that way. And in A number seven, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now says, الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لَهُمْ عَذَابُ الشَّدِيدُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ وَأَجْرٌ كَبِيرٌ Those who disbelieve will have a severe punishment, but those who believe and do good will have forgiveness and a great reward. What a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's reminding us that those who turn down the truth, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful and that he gives us the signs that he puts people in our path to remind us that those who are searching for the truth, they will find it. Even those who don't know what they're searching for and they're lost, uh, when they have that intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts people in the path, puts the truth in their path. Whoever wants the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it so that they will see it inshallah. 
So Alhamdulillah, there's so much forgiveness. There's so much uh, uh, mercy in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in guiding us. But for those who actively reject and push away the guidance, who push away the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that for them, there will be a severe punishment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us uh, from such things. And finally, in, in surah number, uh, uh, sorry, A number eight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَمَنْ زُيِّنَ لَهُ سُوءُ عَمَلِهِ فَرَآهُ حُسْنًا That uh, are those whose evil doing is made so appealing to them that they deem it good like those who are rightly guided. Uh, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يُدِلُّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ فَلَا تَذْهَبْ نَفْسَكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَسَرَاتٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us here that for those whose evil doing has, made, has been made good to them, is it, are they the same ones who have been rightly guided? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us again that it is Allah who guides and Allah who misguides. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not put a label or put misguidance on someone and that's their fate. No, that means that they have pushed away the truth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them many chances. Of course, uh, subhanAllah, the, the will, the desire for us to believe or disbelieve is with us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot force somebody to become kafir or, or, or somebody to become a believer. It is through our actions and our repetitive, um, either following the guidance, uh, even though we make mistakes and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness or our repetitive pushing away of that guidance. So we want to make sure that we understand that. Uh, and then this last uh, uh, portion is a reminder to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam: Do not grieve yourself to death. Do not tear yourself up, uh, because he would be so saddened when uh, his some of his uh, family members or, or tribes or the the people that uh, lives amongst him do not want to accept the truth. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala is reminding him: Don't grieve over them. Allah is aware; He is all knowing of what they do. So here we have these ayats that we'll be discussing uh, that we've gone over quickly. So again, uh, in, in talking about not letting ourselves be deceived of this life and not being deceived by shaitan, we also want to point to um, uh, some other ayat in the Quran that relate to this. And one that comes to mind is from Surah Al-Kahf, which we, inshallah, engage in reading or listening to uh, every Friday. And this is very powerful, subhanAllah, powerful remi uh, reminder. Uh, especially relating back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just mentioned in surah uh, in verse 8 uh, that we were just reading that how people's evil deeds have been beautified for them. And we know this in surah Kahf when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, uh, Shall we tell you about the greatest losers in respect to their deeds? Who are the greatest losers? Subhanallah, this is amazing. Those are the ones whose effort in the worldly life has gone in vain while they think they are doing well. This is the deception Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us about. It's very easy for us to um, justify what we're doing. Well, I'm going to go to this group so that I can... Uh, make da'wah to them. I'm going to go to this place that's not probably very becoming of a Muslim to go to so that I can make a connection. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give an example. Not to say that any field necessarily is off limits for Muslims, but some fields of, of business or, um, you know, art, for example, it comes with its, uh, subhanAllah, maybe any business can come with its, um, uh, possible traps of us falling into sin or falling into maybe not going to a good place. And I'll just use one that I've been exposed to just to give an example, not to say that we shouldn't go into the film industry or into the arts. But I remember when I was going uh, to um, going to my master's program and uh, working on screenwriting, it is a very difficult field to navigate. Do you go to a mixer or to a gathering or to an opening or to a premiere? Do you go because you'll make a connection which will allow you to, inshallah, you know, put your Muslim story, your Muslim voice, your good story that you want to share, it will give you those connections to facilitate that. If I don't go to this meeting that's going to have alcohol there, if I don't go to this gathering that has alcohol there, subhanAllah, I was shocked by how much uh, of a connection there was in that field. Uh, you will say, well, if I don't go to these gatherings, how am I going to further my goal? If we remember then that 
our good intentions, um, uh, the success comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We cannot have a good intention and then follow it by a means that is not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have good intentions, yes, but keep, continue. How do you follow those good intentions? Do the things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't fear, uh, um, you know, failure or loss of wealth or loss of life or what have you uh, from the people. Fear it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seek the success from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this deception that we can have of our own deeds is very, uh, can be very tricky. Um, same thing, for example, um, uh, going into politics, for example, a great, a great place for Muslims to, uh, to delve into. But again, how much mixing, how much part, you know, uh, uh, gatherings will you go to? Where will you draw the line on trying to please uh, people, but then following what we have been commanded to do and staying away from what Allah SWT has not commanded us to do. So these fields, again, I'm just giving some examples, uh, are areas in which our good intentions can lead us astray if we start rationalizing things that we know are not very, um, it's not safe. And I'm not saying, uh, you know, there are things that are questionable. They're the gray areas. And we keep delving into them, delving into them until we get led astray while thinking, you know what, I'm sticking up for the Muslim community. I'm doing something great. So we always want to make sure that we surround ourselves with people who will remind us, no, this is not a good thing for you to do. We need those people in our lives. Let's not shun that away. So we'll, we'll make sure that we, I'll remind that and bring that up again. And we talk about how, um, how we can protect ourselves from falling uh, astray and following our own deception, subhanAllah. Uh, and then this reminder that we get in Surah uh, Zukhruf. This is uh, Surah number 43, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, وَمَا يَعْشُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ يُقَيِّدْ لَهُ الشَّيْطَانٍ فَهُوَ لَهُ قَرِينٍ Whoever makes himself blind against the advice of the Rahman, you know, whoever disengages in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is not engaging in their salah and is not doing it with, with uh, khushur, with uh, not intentional in their remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is the warning here? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we assign for him a devil who accompanies him all the time. And every one of us have it. Aisha radiallahu anha, she asked Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what about you, Prophet Muhammad, you, do you have one too? And he said, uh, yes, but uh, uh, he was able to uh, uh, make him good, you know, make him believe and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, subhanAllah. So we all have that. The, the idea is, again, not that shaitan or any of his helpers can, can make us do anything or they don't read our thoughts. You know, I remember this is one of my questions uh, uh, in learning more about Islam. You know, you start to, for lack of a better word, you start to freak out. Like, does he know what I'm thinking? And can he get into my headspace? SubhanAllah. Uh, just as you know your family members, your friends, by their actions. You don't, you're not in their head. You can't read their minds. But in uh, knowing them, watching them, you know how they react, you know how they say things, you, you kind of understand how they will react to certain things, what they would like, what they wouldn't like. And that's the same way of Shaitan and his followers and his helpers, is that just by watching you and your actions, that's how uh, Shaitan can get into your headspace not physically, but be able to whisper the things that you are worried about or, um, you know, cause you to delve into certain areas that are important to you that may lead you astray. So it's important for us to know that, that when we pull ourselves away from the Muslim community, for example, when we pull ourselves away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that remembrance comes in reading the Quran, in praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in saying our ma'thurats, you know, saying our adhkar in the morning and at night, uh, so engaging in, you know, listening to lectures and, and being in study circles, being with the people and, and being connected to Allah SWT through mindfulness, you know, mindful, mindful remembrance of Allah SWT uh, will protect us from falling uh, to the deception of shaitan and, and, and those who have been assigned to us, subhanAllah. So Ibn al-Qayyim, he addressed different ways in which uh, shaitan can lead us astray. Again, just by whispering, not by being in our head. So just important, I want to quickly quickly go over them. But first is kufr. 
to to uh, not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not believe that Islam is the deen, in the deen and the Allah Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Islam is the way. Not some other, you know, oh, well, you know what, I like Islam, but I really like this other concept, you know, that goes against Islam. It doesn't work that way, right? So kufr, uh, disbelief, uh, is one way, and this is the, the biggest way in which shaitan can pull us. And I want to say something about this for a minute, because, you know, doubt falls into here. And I think one of the most important things in working with college students and working with youth and even adults who have experienced some type of spiritual trauma. And, and just touching upon that quickly, spiritual trauma is maybe they've been in a masjid or in a community or, you know, it, you know uh, getting advice from a sheikh or an imam or, or any type of person of religious uh, authority, shall we say. And they, they felt wronged by them. Either they felt like they weren't welcomed or they were judged or they were treated harshly or, you know, they were just part of a system uh, that, you know, mixed a lot of untruths with truths, whatever it is. So sometimes, and, and, and I understand and rightfully so, that people, because of that spiritual trauma, they, they start to disbelieve in certain aspects. Okay, I believe in Allah, but I don't know about this portion of, of Islam or what they believe to be part of Islam, and maybe it isn't. So doubt is something so easy for, for you know, to come up for many reasons, one of them being spiritual abuse or trauma, um, but, you know, other reasons. Uh, being in a philosophy class and not having the right answers, you know, uh, having certain things that you've just never addressed. I just wanted to take this moment to say that doubt is, is something very powerful. And if anybody has even a doubt about a small affair, but it does, you know, interfere with their faith, they should take good measure. And alhamdulillah, we have so many resources out there. Take good measure to go to somebody you trust and get the answers uh, about the questions you have about Islam, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the existence, about life, about uh, the tests that we experience in this life, about shaitan, whatever it is. Uh, because when we let those small seeds of doubt fester, uh, those doubts can lead to bigger and bigger things like, may Allah protect us from leaving the deen altogether. And this happens because, you know, of, of, of too many different reasons, but we want to make sure that we address doubts. And if we are in a position where uh, we have somebody coming to us with a doubt, we want to make sure that we react in such a way that does not push them away even further. We shouldn't react, for example, if somebody asks a very valid question, you know, how do we know Allah exists? I've been asked that question and, and you're surprised because like, wait a minute, this is not a question I would expect from you, you know, based off of your upbringing and, and your understanding. Should we react and say, oh my God, astaghfirullah, where, what have you been doing? It's because you've been going here and there and, you know, and you condemn them for asking. You should, you should ask the question, you should, um, you know, have a reaction that invites them in, that allows them to feel safe for asking these questions. Let them uh, understand that it's okay to ask questions. And, and then help them find those resources, the individual, the, the, the resources online, um, valid resources that allows you, them to help answer the question. And uh, if you are the one that's searching yourself um, and you don't get a satisfactory answer, then it's your uh, obligation, inshallah, that you keep finding. Allah SWT has put so much in our way to help us understand the truth that you will find it as long as that is something that you seek. Uh, bidar, innovation, is the next. If, 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 if shaitan cannot get you to disbelieve, then he will get you to innovate. He will make you think that, oh, if I do uh, uh, um, this differently, if I reinterpret the Quran in this way, and this happens, you see people, they feel like they are doing something good by saying, oh, all of the scholars that have ever existed, they were wrong about this part of the Quran. I have the right understanding, and this is what I'm going to do, even though it goes against uh, 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 what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, the Quran, and you know the broad understanding, or the you know the the unanimous understanding of what this means. So doing things that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, has not asked us to do, but we think it's good. Again, this is part of the deception. Uh, then, if 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 you if Shaitan is not successful in that, then he'll get you to commit major sins. And and if he's not successful in that, then he'll get you to commit the minor sins. Of course, they're both sins, but but this is the way it works. Then, uh, uh, if if that if uh, shaitan is not successful in that area, then he will get you busy in the things that are allowed. They're mubah. They're allowed. Uh, you know, let's just say, for example, watching sports in and of itself. 
uh, nothing wrong with it or, you know, playing games or, or, you know, whatever it is, right? They can be a form of entertainment, which is important, a little bit of uh, mental health, you know, uh, you know, kind of relief, uh, relaxation, even engaging uh, in games or watching uh, something that's inshallah clean, n not, not clean, <laughs> um, uh, is a way for you to spend time with your family. This is good, right? But then it can be taken to the extreme where now you're neglecting your salah or you're just doing too much of it. Or, you know, you could be doing, uh, you know, more good deeds, but instead you're just stuck in this. It's okay. It's not haram. It's halal, but it's nothing really beneficial. So we don't want to get stuck in those areas. And we can go on and on of what that could be. Uh, focusing on the less important deeds, uh, you know, focusing. So maybe somebody is saying, you know what, I really want to memorize, uh, uh, the last juz of Quran, but they're not praying. Okay, that's important. That's wonderful to memorize the Quran. And you should do that alongside making salah regular. For example, I'm just, I'm just giving an example. Uh, and then, you know, allowing shaitan to get you annoyed and get you off the track, letting you lose hope, letting you feel uh, that Allah SWT won't forgive you, letting him, letting, you know, uh, whispering to you, SubhanAllah, one of two extremes, either that it's not a big deal what you're doing, that sins are not a big deal, it's just minor, you know, it's not a big deal, there's a good justification for it, and Allah will forgive you, or the other extreme, that you, um, uh, you've you gone so far that there's no hope for you, and shaitan is so good at these extremes, SubhanAllah, we want to make sure that, that we're aware of them. And again, being aware does not mean we become obsessed and blame everything on shaitan and make us, but it, you know, we don't want to go in that direction, but we want to be aware. Oh, when I'm starting to think down, uh, you know, along these lines, catch yourself early, surround yourself with people who will remind you and say, these are the whisperings of shaitan. We want to avoid them. So, uh, you know, some beautiful, uh, uh, you know, uh, reflections from Ibn al-Qayyim, he said something uh, uh, very, um, very interesting that helps us kind of frame all of, put this in the framework. And he says, Rahimullah, uh, for among the most difficult things for the self at rest is to purify its deeds from shaitan and the nafs amara. The, the, uh, our soul, you know, incites us. We can be at a stage where our soul is, is pushing for us to do the things uh, um, that are not good, but we want it to push it, our soul, and towards things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to think of it this way, even if a single deed of it was accepted as it should be, he would be it would be generous of him. It would be generous of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he accepted any of our deeds purely on its merit. But the nafs amara and shaitan refuse to let even a single deed reach Allah. Meaning that is shaitan's um, mission is to not let your good deeds reach him. That to, 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 you start off with a good intention. You know what? I'm going to, you know, I'm just going to give example. I'm going to post online some good deed that I'm doing because I want to encourage other people. That's a great intention. Great thing. That's your intention. Either in the midst of that activity in and of itself, as you're snapping pictures and posting live, for example, then shaitan gets into your headspace and is saying, well, you know what, if you do this, then people will really think that you're amazing. They, they, they'll think that you're so generous, that you're so, you're such a great leader, for example. Even, and so power can mess up the deed that you are doing or after the fact, maybe the, the, the deed was pure, you posted it after the fact, but now that made it tempting, that attention, the likes, the shares, whatever, whatever it is that you're doing, it now made you seek that praise and that attention instead of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which you don't see. You don't, you don't necessarily get that instant gratification with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's not how it works. Sometimes you see it in barakah, you see it in the blessings and the good things that happen to you. And sometimes uh, it's protection of bad things that you never knew were going to happen uh, to you. And sometimes you, 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 know, you really would not see uh, the, the true uh, fruits of your good deeds until the day of judgment. So, so know that this is a mission of, of, of shaitan. Uh, and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he reminds us, he says the best, and this is in hadith uh, related by Ibn Hanbal, uh, sorry, in his collection, Ibn Hanbal's collection, the best of faith is to love for the sake of Allah 
to hate for the sake of Allah and work your tongue in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the things that would subhanAllah keep you on the straight path and protect you from any distraction, whether it's your own deception of this life or deception from shaitan. And then it was said to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how was that? Like, you, you know, explain. And Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that you love for people that you love for yourself and you hate for them what you hate for yourself and that you speak goodness or remain silent. And I, and I wanted to touch upon this uh, just for a couple of minutes here. When you love for the sake of Allah, that means, and, and, and putting it against, you know, to the golden rule as we understand it, to love what you would love for yourself, that means if I'm trying to get a job or I'm trying to start a family or I'm, you know, want to get cured of an illness, if I'm not getting those things, but I see other people get it, how should the believer feel? They should be happy for those people. And you can still ask. Yes, it, it, it can hurt sometimes. It can be a reminder of what you don't have. But truly somebody who's happy, you know, who loves for the sake of Allah, will love the good things for the people. They will love that they're getting married, that they're getting a job, that they're, they didn't get COVID or they got it and they got cured while maybe you lost somebody. Oh, you know, on and on and on. We can think of all the different examples. Um, and the same thing, that we wouldn't be happy, for example, that we're in a good situation and, we're, and we see people in difficulty and we say, oh, well, they must have deserved it or too bad for them. No, we, we will feel sad that they're in a bad situation. We will feel sad if they're sinning. Not in a judgmental way. I'm, I'm not, that's not something you should post or you should talk to other people about. But when you see somebody doing something that, well, Alam, you see in your eyes, that's I'm probably not pleasing to Allah SWT, or it's very clear to you, you wouldn't relish in that uh, uh, somebody going astray. You would feel sad for them, and even better, you would make dua for them. This is what we mean. We don't go hating people that uh, disagree with us or that uh, maybe even do wrong to us. Of course, we protect ourselves or uh, people who maybe that they, we once, it seemed like they were such a great leader or, or on the straight path, a leader in whatever uh, activity they were doing. And then we see that they've changed and this happens, you know, you know humans are created weak. Uh, so this happens. Do we look at them with, con upon them with contempt, with like stuff for Allah, look what this person is doing. Or do we look at them with sadness and say, we, 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 we love guidance for ourselves and we wish guidance for other people, whether they, are you know are believers current believers past believers they're searching for the truth everybody's going through their trial so this is what we mean when we love for the sake of Allah and we hate for the sake of Allah uh, and then this is such an important uh, you know concept for us to think about this last part of the hadith and that you speak goodness or remain silent speak goodness or remain silent you know I'm, I'm again I'm going to point to the internet because this is where we see a lot of uh, a lot of things, uh, and of course, it can be a good source of information, a good sense, uh, a good source of dawah, and a good source of uh, inspiration and spreading uh, truth and knowledge. And it can be a temptation for others to do a lot of things. Uh, you know, we see, for example, some people's mission; they've taken it to put down other people, uh, put down other organizations. And digging, digging deep to expose faults, whether you know they could be mistakes but to expose false, to, to expose whatever that they see in their mind. And this is an example, one example of how shaitan, you know, deceives us or how we deceive ourselves, and saying, I'm doing something good because I'm bringing truth to the forefront. I'm making sure that people know that these people are doing the wrong thing. That's not your job. If you want to spread truth, spread truth. You don't need to put other people down in the meantime. You don't need to be a troll online or in social media and put negative comments to every person's post. Sometimes even benign, you know, seemingly benign, somebody will post, uh, for example, you know, their understanding about fear and how that can be debilitating in a sense. We're talking about fear of, you know, failure, feel fear of losing love, you know, uh, from a human being, right? Uh, somebody posts that. It's a well-intentioned, good, uh, you know, article, something that they wrote. And then somebody will write, you know, fear can be healthy. Yeah, it can be, but this person is talking about the destructive type of fear. You know, don't be a troll. Don't be these kinds of people that make it your mission to point people's faults or, or always try to negate. Uh, unless it's something that you really feel you want to advise somebody, you do that in private. That is our understanding of nasiha. It's not to do an expose, a big shame. Um, I, you know, and, and if there is something that warrants some type of great warning to the community, be aware of this individual, then you consult with somebody 
many people of knowledge to say, is this something that needs to be done to protect the people? That's different. So anyway, this is such an important concept for us uh, and, and ways in which we can avoid the deception of this life and the deception of shaitan that we either speak goodness or we, we remain silent. Uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, he also, uh, um, you know, in, in putting all of this in perspective, he makes a beautiful statement and says that the entire religion, our entire understanding of the deen consists of the ability to distinguish right from wrong. This is going to lead me towards the pleasure of Allah. This is going to lead me to the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is a clear thing. This is vague. Uh, this is, you know, part of the, uh, the, the gray areas that I don't know if it's good or bad. You know, these are all of the things, subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the ability to distinguish. And, uh, and as such, this is why uh, the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to the Qur'an as al-Furqan, which is the distinguisher, right? To help us distinguish the light from the darkness, truth from falsehood, so on and so forth. So one of, uh, you know, the greatest errors that we can, that we can commit, the, one of the greatest things is to place the worship of Allah or the fear of Allah alongside creation. So we fear the, the result of displeasing somebody, but we know it's pleasing to Allah. But that fear of displeasing somebody on this earth is greater, so we do the wrong thing. Uh, or we so much want to get the attention or seek the favor of, of somebody of this earth, and we forget that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that will grant us that success, even when it doesn't seem imminent, uh, that it seems like, no, if I do this worldly thing, that will lead me to success. It is that type of getting lost, of, of, of misunderstanding the furqan, that the distinguish, the distinguisher that so many ad advices and understandings we get from the Quran, it is losing sight of that that will lead us astray. So how can we, how can we not let this life, uh, you know, the, the, the deception of this life, meaning that we think that all of our joy will happen here, that no pain will happen here. And if we suffer any pain, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love us. How do we ensure that we don't uh, get lost, you know, in this life, so to speak. Uh, it is important um, that we, I want to make sure that I, I, I covered everything I want to. Um, it is important that we always surround ourselves uh, with people who will remind us of what is good. So important, whether that can consists of a halakha through mass uh, or, um, uh, you know, taking a class in Al Qalam, or uh, you know, being in a in a circle in Al Maghrib, you know, all, all the different organizations. Ikna, uh, you know, has these groups. The Aqeen Institute has conviction circles, and these are you know, again high level halakas. Being in these type of groups, and alhamdulillah, through the internet, and maybe Allah alam, you know, this is one of the the benefits that we've seen. Uh, to say benefit, you know, of course, barring all of the pain and suffering of the quarantine and COVID, but one of the benefits that we've seen that we have more access, even though in person we feel is better, but still being connected online with groups, all of these different uh, organizations are still holding all types of, of classes and study circles online. We see the, you know, alhamdulillah, it's much more available to us. I wanted to say that's the benefit of this uh, difficult time. Uh, it allows us to not get stuck in our own head. You know, uh, something something bad happens to you, quote unquote bad. And, you know, we know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us that that's the amazing part of the believer is that nothing is bad. Because even if something is bad, he is patient and uh, he praises Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. And when something good happens to him, then he is grateful and he thanks Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. Either way, it's not bad because we know in the long run, uh, that these are things Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put in our path to test us, to help us grow, um, uh, subhanAllah. And so when we uh, are alone, what happens? That our negative thoughts, this is, this is part of our nafs, you know, the, the, the uh, Ibn al-Qaim, he also, you know, describes the, you know, the fortress of the believer that, you know, there's guards, there's guards guarding our nafs. 
And what are some of these guards? What are these protections? It's surrounding yourself with people uh, that are, you know, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a prayer, Quran, doing good deeds, staying away from things that are displeasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, staying away from the gray area, all of those types of things, right? Those are your guards. You, you start to, um, you know, lose sight of your mission. You, you get weak. And this happens. This happens to people. What happens? The guards start sleeping. You know, he uh, starts looking at his phone. And what happens? The enemy can come in. And these are the whisperings. These are the doubts. These are the shayateen. These are, you know, our own uh, qareen, you know, our own, the shaitan has been, uh, you know, partnered with us. Our negative thinking, oh, nothing good ever happens to me. Why does this person get these good things? You know, I'm, I'm going to, uh, somebody did something to me. I'm going to make sure that everybody knows about it. I'm going to, I'm going to punish them. I'm going to like, you know, they did something I didn't like. I'm going to get back at them. I'm going to take revenge. Those uh, uh, subhanAllah, that's kind of like the mechanics. And it's a, it's a pretty interesting uh, way to think about ourselves and, and, and our nafs as a fortress. It's, it's protected by the guards and the good deeds allow those guards to do their job and misdeeds or shying away from the, you know, you know, slacking off, becoming lazy in our good deeds and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes those guards weak. There's holes in the fortress and now the, the bad thoughts, the negative thinking, the shaitan can all find their way in. When you're in a group, you can check yourself. You know, you're maybe reflecting on something and you're going to share something. You're going to open up more when you're in a group and then people can help you uh, check your thoughts, uh, can remind you about the blessings of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful when we just open up our intentions and make remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala something regular. Um, allowing ourselves to listen to Quran, to watch a, a good reminder, uh, to be in a good gathering, be amongst good people. But again, that reminder, it's not saying good or bad in a, in a human judgmental way. Um, uh, when we surround ourselves with all of that good remembrance, you will find that you will hear something or read something that day that just strikes at your heart. It's something that you felt upset about or something was paining you or somebody did something to you. And subhanAllah, you will find that exact ayah, that exact you know advice that you needed came from somewhere. It's, a, it's in a post, it's in an article, somebody says something to you, it was in the khutbah that day, your kid says it to you, you know, your mom, your, you know, whoever, somebody... Uh, that that is hidayah, that is guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is the beautiful way in which, you know, when we put out that good effort, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows us the way. Um, you know, uh, keep up in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, keep in the remembrance of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Quran, and, uh, um, you know, alhamdulillah, we have all of the technology to remind us because we're also forgetful. Sometimes you're like, yeah, I wanted to keep up on my daily reading, but because, you know, I deleted my app about Quran and the reminder, now I forget. You know, put all the things in place that will help you. And 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 last but not least, I just wanted to close with this, this last thought about how how our negative thinking or positive thinking, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Hadith Qudsi, that, uh, you know, we, the believer thinks about Allah. Allah is how we think about him. When we think that he's not merciful, we're going to feel all the things that happen to us are through that negative lens. And when we have the positive thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even through difficulty, we're going to see this good thing came my way, even though I had this difficulty. Allahu Akbar, I can breathe. Allahu Akbar, I have, you know, warm socks. You know, we see in these ads, you know, we have the boots, you know, we have ways to keep warm. Alhamdulillah for all those things. So when we have positive thinking, subhanAllah, we have the energy and the ability to do good for other people, to wish well for others, uh, to have the energy to to want to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet when we allow, because we're by ourselves, because we, you know, we get down and then we wallow in our thinking. And I'm not talking about a mental health issue where I'm not uh, putting any negativity on that. Talk about when we just allow ourselves to get weak and, you know, then those negative thoughts come. Then we keep reiterating those negative thoughts. Then we start thinking ill of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We get tired. We feel depressed. We don't want to get closer. Even though you ask people who said, I'm struggling with salah. They know that salah is the answer for them. But they don't feel like it. So, so my advice to all of you and to myself, first and foremost, don't let shaitan allow you to get lazy with your good deeds. Uh, when you're feeling down, uh, you know, barring needing, you know, a mental health expert, because we all need it sometimes, Barring, you know, some mental health issue, you know, don't let your 
uh, negative self-talk get to you. Don't let laziness, hatred of others, envy. Don't let negativity surround you and then you're stuck there. When you feel like you need, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the boost to be able to want it, to be able to get closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, get closer to the people who uh, uh, follow His way, do uh, immerse yourself in good deeds, especially the hidden ones, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala will open the doors and constantly ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for that hidayah. Jazak so I Allah ask Allah. that from uh, from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala for all of us that we continue uh, to seek His good favor and keep away from His displeasure. Sister I really appreciate everything that you put in and you had a lot of uh, great comments and you definitely inspired a lot of the people I can see in the chat with everyone else. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll conclude with this session, inshallah. Uh, we will be uh, breaking, but before our next session, inshallah, we will uh, have a word from our sponsor, uh, Islamic Relief, uh, as well as a uh, guest speaker, Ahmed Dweib, just to uh, tell a little bit more about uh, their projects. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Winter is here. Alhamdulillah, you are warm. You have boots, a thick coat, gloves, and a hat. Imagine if you didn't have these things. No coat, warm scarf, extra shirt, Fuzzy hat, gone. And those nice insulated boots, gone too. Winter rains are icy cold on your bare feet. This may not be your reality, but it's theirs. When you live in a refugee camp or when you're living in poverty, warm winter necessities are just a luxury. When most of the year is warm, you might not be prepared for cold. When you've had to leave everything behind, and flee to safety. You don't take your warm coat or blanket. And when you arrive, you don't have a job to buy new ones. For too many people, winter means choosing between sleeping on top of your blanket to block the cold from the ground or sleeping under it to block the cold air above. Buying a blanket or warm shoes or fuel means not buying food. Which is more important, food or warmth. Which one would you give up? That's why Islamic Relief USA is asking you to share your warmth this winter. Your gifts of warmth can make a big difference. You can send warm winter clothes, mattresses so they don't have to lay on the cold ground, and blankets to tuck under their little bodies. Even tents and plastic sheeting to keep out the wind and icy water. You can send firewood, heaters, and fuel and food too, so that nobody has to choose between buying food and the rest of their winter needs. These are things so simple that we take them for granted, but to families like Siham's, it means the world, a warmer world, a better world. Please share your warmth with a freezing family this winter. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Ahmed Adweb, and I am the regional manager here with Islamic Relief USA. First and foremost, we want to thank uh, Mass for this honor and uh, this opportunity to be their sponsor this year for the MassCon 2020. Um, it's been a very difficult year, and it's very, a very tough year for everyone. And um, organizations like Mass continue to provide services. Um, for our community and our partnership will continue to go on inshallah for years to come because when we see organizations like Mass doing their part we have to do our part. Uh, in regards to Islamic Relief this year like last year we had a campaign going on for um, 1,000 orphans and the concept of uh, at the end of the year we wanted to bring people together during a beautiful time of the year and um, engage and speak to them and explain to them our orphan program. And this year we were hoping for a different outcome. We were hoping that we would be able to see everyone again. But Allah has different plans and we understand that Allah's plans are beautiful. 
And whatever Allah decides for us is the beautiful plan. So we accept his plan. But we still have to do our work. We still have to do our part. And that's why we continue to do our work because this year, like uh, probably more than any other year, we need support. We need to support the most vulnerable humans on this earth. At Islamic Relief right now, Islamic Relief USA specifically, with your help, with donors like yourself, assist over 24,000 orphans around the world. And we just want to continue to do that part. And one of the things that I want to focus on is, is we know that a lot of people have been hit hard this year. And we notice that in some areas, our orphan sponsorships have gone down. And we're not going to ask why, we're not going to question why, the reasons for why those, uh, we lost those orphan sponsorships because we understand everybody might be going through a difficult time. But we also know that there are people who can take on that sponsorship. And that's why we're out here reaching out to you because we believe that you can help continue that sponsorship, that orphan in Gaza, that orphan in Pakistan, that orphan, the, the orphan refugee that's traveling throughout uh, Middle East and North Africa and, and in, throughout Turkey. You're the one who can continue to provide them hope. Just the concept of hope for them is a very big concept. The idea that they can still have school or education. Their parents don't have to go and beg on the street for food. Their mother doesn't have to go and ask all around, they have a service that continues to come to them and they can be able to, uh, to live their life in, in dignity, just the very little dignity that they can have. And we understand that it might be tough for us now when we saw some very difficult times, but we also understand that we still have to do our part. And that's why we ask you to donate today to IRUSA.org and continue to assist those in need, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. You don't know me, but I know you. I am a refugee and an orphan. And you are the person who helps me every year. You make sure I have food to eat and a place to sleep. You make sure that I'm taken care of when there is no one to take care of me. And you have given me hope for the future. I'm not the only one who needs help. There are many more that need someone to care for them. Donate now. Thank you for being there for us.
اتمنى انكم تجيبوا لنا مازوت انا بناشد العالم بناشدكم كلياتكم تجيبوا لنا مازوت كل الجمعيات بتمناكم تسمعوا ندائنا والاطفال كلياتها ما عندها جزامه يعني عم تطلع بالشحات لبرا We are the millions of displaced refugees living in camps worldwide. For us, winter is a battlefield that we're ill-equipped for. Our tents are not insulated and our bodies are exposed to the harsh elements. In the depths of a cold winter night, our beds don't provide any safety from the freezing temperature. And because of this, many of us will become sick. And some of us may not survive until spring, especially the kids. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brothers and sisters. Uh, welcome back to the, to the seventh annual uh, Knowledge Retreat uh, with the Muslim American Society. Our next uh, session that we are having tonight is titled Independence of the Independent. And this uh, lecture will focus uh, around the ayah in Surah Fatir, uh, verse number 15. Ya antum al ilallah. Wallahu wal ghaliyun hamid. Surah Fatir is uh, surah number 35 in the Quran if you all want to follow along at home. Our next speaker is truly uh, an honor and a treat to have her with us. It's uh, a Shaykha Muslima Permal. Uh, she was born uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina and raised in San Diego, California. She graduated from the University of California with a double major in religious studies, uh, Cal University of California, San Diego with a double major in religious studies and Middle Eastern studies. She has served several different roles at her local MSAs as well as the MSA West. After graduating, she left to study in Egypt where she spent the better part of the next seven years. Uh, she completed the bachelor's program in Sharia from Al Azhar University in Cairo and also completed uh, uh, nearly two years of graduate work at the American University in Cairo in Islamic Studies. She also attended the International Union of Muslim Scholars Future Scholars Program while she was studying in Cairo. Uh, Sheikh uh, and Sister Muslim Pramal it's an honor to have you with us. Uh, tafaddali mashkuran. It's an honor to be here. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as Everyone. Wa it's, uh, it's really, truly an honor to be here with, uh, with Mass for this annual convention, very special convention. Assalamu alaikum to those who are watching in Chicago. I know there's a special set of you guys have there. And assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to everyone around the world who is watching virtually. Um, I want to start with a special prayer for learning, as this is, inshallah, a knowledge retreat, and uh, there are adab for seeking knowledge and benefiting from them, and from the adab is actually to start with dua. So, inshallah, join me. Inshallah, bismillah rahman rahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, nawayna at ta'alluma wa ta'aleem, wa tadakkura wa tadkir, wa naf'a wa al-intifa'a, wa al-ifadata wa al-istifada, والحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وسنة رسوله 
ودعاء إلى الهدى والدلالة على الخير All praise is due to God, Lord of the worlds, and peace and blessings be upon our master, Muhammad, and his family and companions and followers. We intend to learn and to teach, to remind and be reminded, to benefit and be benefited, to improve and be improved, to encourage holding fast to the book of God and the way of his messenger, to call to guidance and to direct towards good, hoping for the countenance of God and his pleasure and his proximity and his reward, and peace and blessings be upon our master Muhammad and his noble family and companions and followers. Ameen. So inshallah, today I get to uh, discuss with you all the tafsir and some reflections from a beautiful verse of the Quran. Um, and I'm so excited actually to be given this particular verse. I was so happy to see it. Um, and I'm going to just share it with you all now. It was said in the introduction. Uh, again, this is in Surah Fatir, uh, Surah 35, verse 15. بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس أنتم الفقراء إلى الله والله هو الغني الحميد. O oh mankind, you are needful of God, and He is the self-sufficient, the praised. We are actually going to take around 50 minutes talking about just this one verse. And there's plenty that I'm not actually even presenting. SubhanAllah, whenever we prepare tafsir, you can only share, uh, you know, a small percentage because of time. But there is so much to say about this beautiful verse of the Qur'an. There are so many lessons to take from this beautiful verse of the Qur'an. This verse has played such an important role in the spiritual path, right? In understanding our spiritual path and the journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a spiritual level between the relationship of the human being with the divine and the relationship of the divine and the created order. First, the first part of this verse I want us to look at is God is completely rich and self-sufficient and human beings are completely poor and in utter need of God with regards to being both brought into existence and also uh, being provided sustenance, right? And so Imam Ibn Ajib in his tafsir, he talks about ni'matul ijad, right? The, the blessing of being brought into existence and ni'matul imdad, the blessing that we experience as God's creation of being sustained through him. He is the one who brought us about, allowed us to be, and then he is the one who continues to take care of us and, and continues to sustain us through all of the different provisions that he has provided for us. And so from this perspective, realizing the fullness um, or richness of God depends upon the realization of one's complete poverty before God. And just so people know, I'm using a couple sources for tafsir today. One of them is actually in English is the study of Quran and the one in Arabic that I'm uh, using is the is the tafsir of Imam Ibn Ajiba, which I find to be very beautiful. Inshallah, people who can access the Arabic, I encourage you to. And so the fullness or richness of God's, you know, like realizing this depends on our realizing how utterly in need we are. Imam al-Tusri, who is a, an early Sunni scholar and mufassir, he said, you depend upon him in your very selves. For when God created creation, he ordained poverty for his servants in relation to him. While he is the rich. So whoever claims wealth has been veiled from God and whosoever shows poverty in relation to him, God will join his poverty to his wealth. Okay. I want to go back to something he said in this statement. He says, so whoever claims wealth, what does that mean? Are we talking about whoever says, I have a certain amount of money in the bank? What are we talking about? And it's a claim, really. It's this idea of I'm claiming something for myself. And so it is when a person claims any good in their life, whether it's physical, material, uh, or immaterial, right? Something that could be of 
you know, uh, a person's intellect or intelligence, right? Or a person's um, doing well in school or a person's uh, have being successful in a job or a person's memorizing the Quran or a person's even like abstinence from sins, okay? Even those good and bad deeds or staying away from the bad deeds, whatever good, outward or inward, that a person claims and attributes that good to themselves. This is because of Anna. This is because of me. Then that is a false claim. And whoever claims in this way, they have been veiled from God. It is a veil. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from being the makers of claims. May Allah protect us all from being the makers of claims. And sometimes a person doesn't say it out loud. Right? They don't say it out loud, but they feel it on the inside. And that's where arrogance grows. And that's where pride grows. And that's where this idea of not needing Allah actually comes from. A complacency. Co the sides of this coin. It's on one hand, a person can have uh, this idea that I don't need religion. I don't need to pray. I don't need God. I don't need to do anything to better my faith. Right. And that's just and, and obviously that comes from a great place of arrogance, that all the good that they have and that they need and that they will ever need for their existence comes from them. They can handle it. And the other side of it is this complacency that can happen on a much more subtle level. This idea that I'm good. I don't need to try any harder, do any more, fix anything. I don't have problems. I don't have shortcomings. Um, and if I do, they're not that big a deal. And I'm fine the way I am. I have a sound understanding of the religion. I have a sound practice of the religion. And that is all that I need, right? A person can, a person can truly be deluded in this way. The one who is sincere to Allah always feels their need to Allah. The one who is sincere to Allah knows that if it was, if Allah were to leave them for the blinking of an eye, they would be ruined. So they attribute the good that they enjoy inwardly and outwardly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do not make this claim. They do not inwardly praise themselves, right? They do not inwardly say, I am rich because I was so smart. <laughs> this is a claim that's made by tyrants in the Quran and by the rich that Allah warns us about. I am successful in school because I tried so hard. On a level of asbab, that's true, right? On just like the created level, a person sees someone studying hard and then they see someone doing well on an exam. I got better because I took the medicine. These are all true statements, but who allowed the medicine to work is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two people can take the same medicine, and we know this right now, as people are really tried by the, by the tribulation of a global pandemic. Two people get the same illness, get the same hospitalization and treatment and care, and one person doesn't get better and another person does. The one who you know, Allah is the one who chose and decreed that the medicine would heal one person and not heal another person. So who is the true healer? It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The two people study for the exam, right? And one person, alhamdulillah, they were able to remember everything and answer it. Another person studied just as hard and they weren't able to remember everything. Who gave them that success is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who allowed one mind to remember correctly? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so all good, all good of any kind goes back to Allah. We can get caught up in attributing victories and successes to the asbab. And this is a great mistake. And if we rely on the asbab, we will be left to our asbab. Okay, so the one who relies on their efforts only, then you are left to your efforts. 
the one who relies on their strategies and their meetings and their, you know, all of the, you know, behind the scenes sort of organizing, which organizers do. I'm part of it, alhamdulillah. I have a, we have an organization in Southern California. We organize, we have these meetings. But the reliance is on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, needs to be on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have to remind one another of that, that if it was good, it's because it came from Allah that way. We are full of shortcomings and mistakes. This is the created order. For those who are creation, we will necessarily have mistakes and shortcomings. And it is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that something succeeds, does well. In a, in, and sometimes we think something has gone well in an outward level, and in reality it hasn't. And other times we think something is not going well, and in reality, it's actually very good for us. And so we are in every breath, fuqara, all of us. That is the ontological reality for human beings, for creation. We are needful of Allah, whether we realize it, and some people don't realize it, uh, or we do not. But if we are able to realize it, if we are able to truly acknowledge this at a very deep level, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he joins his wealth to our poverty. He is the self-sufficient. One of the ways that the word, the, the, the name al-ghani is translated is the rich, right? Self-sufficient, rich. His wealth comes from himself, not from anyone else. So the servant should feel poverty when it comes to towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their innermost being and even though they have you know they they do good deeds they uh and they they strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they you know they, these are these are things they must do they do so out, out of an, a sense of obligation and also out of a sense of doing so for God when they see the good in their prayers or in their, whatever those good deeds are, again, going back to the, to the reality that we are fuqara ilallah. We are in need of him. We haven't done anything to benefit him. We cannot. We are the ones who are in need of those prayers. And when we have those prayers and we do them, again, those are a blessing upon us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are people who take even in religious things. They'll memorize the Qur'an and take it as the false idol. They'll stay up all night in Qiyam al-Layl and as a false idol. And how do we take these things as false idols? We attribute the good of those actions to ourselves. We attribute the good of those actions to ourselves we don't attribute it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on top of that, we may turn the sabab, right, which is the cause, the immediate cause, we may end up worshiping that thing. So what do I mean? Can people forget Allah while they're doing an act of worship? Right? This is one of the ways that a person, that the shaitan comes and causes us to forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in something that is outwardly an act of worship. And we recognize that, what it looks like in prayer in terms of khushua. But how does it show up in other parts of our lives? Right? Even the spiritual path itself, the idea of journeying towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on a spiritual level, seeking to know him more, seeking to worship him better, can be a false idol. Because a person starts to feel content with that, satisfied with that attributing that to themselves. And once again, they don't feel needful of Allah because they've given themselves a check mark. <laughs> a check mark that says, you are a memorizer of Quran. You are, you know, you studied really hard or you worked really hard on this project and it was successful or you, you know, prepared a talk and it went well. In reality, the results are always with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are literally just receiving them from him. The deeds are done as an act of worship of, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, we try our best. But this is what, subhanAllah, is the, as I want to say, a test at a, at, on a very 
daily level for a Muslim. On a daily level. Because we have deeds every day. We breathe every moment. And how much of that day we feel truly impoverished in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in need of him versus how much of that day we feel completely like I got this. Anna, I got this. Not that I am doing this by Allah's leave and by his permission and by his blessing. Again, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to not be from those who are veiled. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-hamid. Only he is worthy of being praised. The prophets, when they came to the people and they were calling them to the truth, what would they say? They would say, La nuridu minkum jaza an wala shakura. We don't want from you thanks, right? We don't want from you any kind of worldly, like uh, material wealth. We're not asking for you for any kind of reward. And we're not asking for thanks. They're doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So their intention is Allah. And again, a sign that a person is faqir ila ghayrillah, is in need of other than Allah is when they do something and they are in need of people telling them, good job. You know, they are in need of hearing the praise. They are in need of hearing, um, you know, some kind of think, thanks. And in general, in our deen, Alhamdulillah, we are people who believe that the one who does not thank the people is not truly thankful to Allah. So we're supposed to give thanks. This is from our adab, right? We, are, we want to give thanks to people. And it's part of how we show our gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, are, we, have, um, we have adab even with the sabab that he sends us. And so we have to be grateful. But we do not expect gratitude. We, sh we should be the uh, people who appreciate and are extremely grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to his creation, but we should not be in need of that gratitude. And as soon as a person feels the need for gratitude, I need someone to say thank you, I need someone to notice and appreciate me, right? Then they have disclosed to themselves a level of faqr, of poverty to other than Allah. I need something of in acknowledgement of my good from other than the one whom actually he gave it to me in the first place, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, there's a beautiful verse um, in the Quran in Surah, in Surah Al-A'raf, verse 172 where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, describes it to us. And when your Lord summoned the descendants of Adam and made them testify, Alastu birabbikum, am I not your Lord? And they said, yes, we testify, right? And we said, bala shahidna. We said this, not they, we said this. We existed in a realm before this one, all of mankind, we were gathered. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us, Alastu birabbikum, am I not your Lord? And we all said yes, and we testify to this. And so it is in our fitrah, it's intrinsic to our human nature for us to have poverty towards our creator. Before we ever came into this world, we recognized it, that we have a Lord who has created us. We belong to him. And so we are in need of him. Now, when we are in need of other than him, right, that's not, that's not fitra per se, that's, that's hadith, okay, so that's something that happened, it's incidental, a person is hungry, they are in need of food, it happened at four o'clock, okay, that's incidental, right, that's also from, he, he, he created us in a certain way, so it's from his divine wisdom and his, from his divine plan, but the intrinsic need of the soul at its inception is the need for God himself, And if we can recognize that every other need, even the need for food, the need for family, the need for community, every other need that we experience in this world, they are veils and they may either hide God and they may also reveal God to us. 
And I wish, subhanAllah, I really wish I would have understood this or heard this a long time ago in my life, that every need that we experience as a human being can either veil us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or allow us to know him more. And so when we ask the question, you know, who am I, right? I am faqir. I am impoverished. I am in need of my Lord, right? And what is this life? This life is a journey of coming to know Allah. And we come to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the, I mean, in, in every situation, but we may especially come to know him through our needs, right? At the du'as that we supplicate. Every time something happens to us, Someone is tested in their family life. Someone is tested in their children. Someone is tested in their spouse. Someone is tested in their wealth. Someone is tested in their health. Someone is tested in their faith. All of these different tests and all of these different needs that we experience, they point to the ultimate need, which is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They may point to him, or they can be a veil for a person from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, how does something become a veil? How does something, be it's when it becomes, again, a false idol. I need this thing for its own sake. I need this thing because it's, it pleases myself versus I need this for Allah. And all that I need, I need for Allah because he is the goal. He is the purpose, he is the reason of my existence. Again, I just want to repeat the sentence because I feel like it's so profound that every need that one experiences is ultimately a need for God. Since the phenomena for which one experiences needs are veils that hide God but, and also reveal God. I need food right, to stay alive. When I recognize as a human being that I need, I was created in this way that needs a particular thing so that I can just exist, the source of that food, the one who will answer the prayer for that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I need him. Food becomes, this need for food becomes ultimately a need for God. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praised also, it indicates that being praised is intrinsic to the divine nature and not dependent upon anything to praise him. Al-Hamid is a beautiful name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, it describes that he is one who praises himself. So he's praised and he is the only one who can truly praise himself as he deserves to be praised. And also that his creation also praises him. The very first words of the Quran that are revealed by the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Surah Al-Fatiha, right? In terms of, I shouldn't say first revealed, but first in the order of the, of, of the Mus'haf, of the Quran is, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. It is a praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's often said that if you can only make one prayer, let it be thank you. If you can only say one thing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let it be to praise him. In this respect, uh, Al Maybudi, he states that the, that only those who truly realize their poverty with Allah can truly praise Allah. Right? Because a person knows when they know themselves, they know that they are left to themselves weak, left to themselves humiliated, left to themselves broken, left to themselves falling into sin all the time. Right? But it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who allows them to become strong to become healthy, to become uh, able to overcome the different sins that they commit. And so they realize that, the, that true strength and power comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to mention, I want to also talk about this in relation to, um, you know, like who is the faqir in terms of like, when we think about the faqir in Allah, the one who really, really needs Allah above and beyond all else, that this is someone who tries to eliminate from their hearts um, others other than Allah, that no one is competing for their intentions. No one is competing for them. Um, 
you know, this is a very high level. It's something that we as human beings, we endeavor towards. We endeavor to be of those who when we say la ilaha illallah, that there is no God except Allah, what we're truly trying to say is that we have no other goal in our lives except for Allah and his pleasure. Imam Ibn Ajiba, he talks about spiritual poverty and he says, spiritual poverty is to withdraw your hand from the world and keep your heart from showing complaints. The marks of a true faqir are three. He conceals his poverty. And what he means here is that, you know, there are, <laughs> we live in an age of like hum humble brags, right? Uh, everything goes up on social media. Every reflection, every spiritual like, advice, it's all advertised. We wear it on our sleeves. And so in some ways you can say that we live in an age of information, but we don't necessarily live in an age of knowledge. Um, the idea of someone who conceals his poverty, what, what's being discussed here is that they have a feeling or a sense, shouldn't say feeling, but a sense of the need for God in their hearts. This is so precious to them that they are not trying to expose it or show off with it. They are not trying to um, allow others to, to like praise them for it because they know what a treasure it is to actually have a sense of impoverishment with God. And so they conceal it. They want it to be only for him. If they have anything of it, whatever amount they have, they want it to be only for him and no one else but him. And so they conceal it. And they guard the secret that exists between themselves and God. That means the relationship they have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a secret. It's not for everyone to hear and know about. And that doesn't mean that people, you know, we can't share important lessons. We can't um, share knowledge in the, in the terms of, uh, you know, in terms of learning and teaching and whatnot. But as it relates to spiritual growth, individual spiritual growth, a person's relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself or herself, that is not something they want on display for anyone. That is such that that's the most precious of all that exists in the world is their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as something that is so precious, they don't want it to be for anyone other than him. And so they guard that secret and it is a secret. And they are people who maintain their religion. And this is also important because a lot of times when we talk about, um, you know, trying to better ourselves on a spiritual level. For some, unfortunately, it has come to mean, you know, to a, a, a disregard for the Sharia. Okay, a disregard for the Sharia. They say, okay, I don't follow these do's and don'ts, but I have a good heart, right? Um, it could be true that people on the outside are, again, as human beings, we are created, we're gonna slip and fall, we're gonna make mistakes and then we're gonna make toba. So that's definitely true. But we don't have a disregard for the Sharia. And that's something very different. It's the person who says, I don't really need to pray because my heart is so clean. I don't need to do this or that, which God has prescribed for me because my heart is so clean. There's, a compla there's not just a complacency in this, there is a claim that is being that a person makes when they say this. If a person says or thinks to themselves, "I'm not strong enough yet to do this, but inshallah one day I hope to," that's not a claim. That's that's the natural human condition where we try our best to fulfill the rights of God, right? We try our best to follow, follow the law of God, Sharia, and uh, both outwardly and also the spirit of the law, uh, inwardly. Okay, that's that's normal. But the idea that I don't need to, because I'm already good. All right, that's not that's not a person who's faqir with Allah. That's a person who doesn't realize that they've been deluded into thinking that they don't need sharia. And again, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. One who struggles and says, I can't do it all right now. I'm struggling. You know, may Allah bless your struggle and protect it and increase you in it, inshallah. So these are the three qualities. Jafar al-Khuldi, he said, I served 600 teachers and I did not find one of them who could cure my heart of four matters until I saw the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in a dream. And he said to me, ask your questions. I said, O messenger of God, what is the intellect? 
he answered, its lowest degree is to abstain from uh, attachment to this world, and its highest is to abstain from reflection upon the divine essence. So we we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of his names and attributes, but we don't think about, um, you know, the, um, about his essence. That is, that is a matter that we stay away from. Then I said, and what is the affirmation of God's oneness? And he said, it is to realize that our Lord is different from whatever your imagination presents to you or your understanding shows you. So as much as we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his beautiful names and attributes, and we try to understand them, know that Allah is greater than that. Know that Allah is even different than that. He's above that, beyond what, our, what, what we could ever fathom. And I said, and what is the spiritual path? And he answered, it is to give up pretense. It's to give up making false claims. Right? The spiritual path, this idea of being faqir illallah, it's to give up pretense. That sense of whatever... We have on our resumes, bios, whatever it is. There's pretense in it if we believe any of it comes from us. And to keep silent about meanings. And what he means here about being keeping silent about meanings um, is that sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may illuminate a person's heart and give them special insights. And the first purpose of those insights and illuminations is for personal practice. The first purpose of it is for personal practice. I uh, and arrives at something, realizes, subhanAllah, I need to do this, to change this. If they notice what's connected to the Quran that they're able to you know, put together or whatever that lesson is, whatever that wisdom of reality is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may, may expose to them or give them. The first purpose of that is to be practiced. It's not to be spoken about. It's to be practiced. It's to, it's to cause that person to better their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And later, much, much later, if there's a reason, if it's something that should be spread or, or, or given or offered, then it may come out. But its initial purpose is not to be talked about. The initial purpose of great meaning is for us to try to practice it ourselves, be grateful for it ourselves, benefit from it ourselves in terms of it making us more humble towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in our relationship with him. And it's not about posting it on Twitter or Facebook or any other um, social media platform. It can end up there one day, but that is not the initial response. Then I asked, and what is spiritual poverty? What is, what is faqr? He said, it is one of God's secrets which he places in those of his servants, he wills. Whoever conceals it will be made among its bearers, and God will increase him therein or increase her therein, while whoever discloses it will be deprived of its blessings. And so this is a really important part of the spiritual path, for it to be about God and for it to not have claims. One of the ways that we can be a people, inshallah, who, who don't have claims about ourselves at an inward level is for us to meet ourselves where we are. This came up actually last night for a program in Celebrate Mercy. To meet ourselves where we are. You are struggling with X or Y or Z. And while you're struggling with X or Y or Z, one of the ways, how do we, how do we gaslight ourselves? <laughs> how do we um, do spiritual bypassing, right? You can read books and look at the great biographies of, of the awliya who came, uh, the great, uh, you know, intimate friends of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who came before us and say, wow, look at how amazing those people are. And there's good in, in looking at the biographies of these amazing human beings that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent as guidance for mankind, prophets and those who inherited from them afterwards. But as much as we admire and love them, it doesn't absolve us of our own hard work. It does not absolve us of our own need for Allah. It does not absolve us from having to meet ourselves where we are in our journeys, not 
five years from now, not 10 years from now, but literally drop your bucket where you are, where you're standing right now. You know, there's this idea that a lot of people have that, you know, I'm going to become better. I'm going to, um, when, when this changes, and it's always later, it's always when outward circumstances change. And that's not how we become better. We become better by recognizing in this moment, who am I? Where am I? What am I doing? How do I spend my time? What are the issues I have in my heart? And I turn all of that over to God. Oh, Allah, help me with these things. I'm in need right now of your guidance and your help and making intentions, right? To try to become, uh, to try to, uh, uh, you know, purify ourselves from those things which, which are displeasing to him and to better ourselves in, the, in those things which are um, beloved and pleasing to him. And I want to also mention um, that there are two beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this verse, um, Al-Ghani and Al-Hamid. Both of these beautiful names are to be reflected upon. The first name, Al-Ghani, the Most High says, O mankind, you are poor unto Allah, and Allah is rich, worthy of praise. He is the one who does not need anything while everything is in need of him to secure its beginning and continued existence. He knows that he is the self-sufficient. And he who knows that Allah is self-sufficient will seek their sufficiency through him from everything. They will return to him in every matter and they will display their neediness to him in every matter. So sometimes a person says, you know, this issue is so small, I don't want to make dua about it. This issue is so like petty. The fact that I even feel tested by it, I feel like ashamed, right? Um, you know, I'll just share here. Full disclosure, the other day I asked my friends to make dot for me because I'm potty training my daughter. And so it gives me a lot of anxiety to do potty training with my two and a half year old. Please make dot for me, everyone. Um, and uh, I remember like even feeling like, how am I going to ask my friend to make dot for potty training? But what did I wanted to, what do I, what can I take from it? before all in every matter is actually good for us humbling for us it's humbling for us because we are forced to meet ourselves where we are this is where i am i need i need help in this thing i'm in need of allah's help and so for the smallest thing to the biggest thing we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask for his help. And the greatest of all needs, the greatest of all needs is the need for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, the need to be close to him, the need to remember him, the need to be with him um, and to be pleasing to him. That is the greatest of all needs. But if we turn to him in all of our affairs, right, then inshallah, he is the one who can make uh, our, change our hearts and make it such that our need for him is greater than all other needs. And we do ask for that, we ask, we pray for that. The way that we connect with this beautiful name is by seeking any kind of good that we want from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inwardly or outwardly, spiritually, physically, whatever it is. Um, and, by, and knowing that we are sufficed already by him. Not that I just, I'm asking him to suffice, he's already sufficed us. We've come this far because of what he has sufficed us with. And we want to eliminate from our hearts a needing for others besides him, that he is our ultimate need. And we seek our needs through him and we express our need and our poverty toward, with him. Abu Hafs and Nesa Buri, he was once asked, with what should the needy seeker, the faqir, meet his master? And he replied, and can the rich be met with anything other than poverty? What that means is a person, sh a person should meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a poverty from their own poverty. And what that essentially means is um, that 
the person realizes that even as much as they need God, they need God in, in their needing of God. There's even a shortcoming in their faqr, in their impoverishment. It's incomplete. It's imperfect. It has shortcomings. And so even in their faqr, they are faqir, right? Turning to Allah, saying that even my, I, am, I, am, I am in need for you in my needing of you. And this is why once um, uh, a great sheikh, uh, Ibn Mashish, he, when he was asked um, by Abu al-Hassan al-Shadili, with what will you, uh, shall you meet Allah? Then the latter replied, with my poverty. And then he said, by Allah, if you were to meet him with your poverty, you would be meeting him with your greatest idol. Your greatest idol. Why? Because a person can accidentally take pride again, attributing even that sense of need that they might feel, right, to themselves instead of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who gave them even that. That when we feel the need for him to know that even in that moment, that is coming to us from him, right? That is a blessing upon us, a, 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 something he has placed in our hearts. And so our response is gratitude. We cannot even claim, we cannot make a claim about our neediness, because even that is a gift to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we think about his beautiful name, Al-Hamid, and I'll say this inshallah and close, um, Al-Hamid is the one who is the one who's truly worthy of all praise. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he once said, in one of his pr uh, prayers is that I cannot enumerate praises to you. I cannot praise you enough. This is what he's saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are as you have praised yourself. Anta kama athnayta ala nafsik. Right? So even our praise has shortcoming. And he is the one who deserves all of it. All the good that we see. Um, when we think about his essence or his entity and his attributes and his acts, they are all praiseworthy. Everything is praiseworthy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should be far too busy in invoking and praising him to remember our own egos, right? If we're grateful to him and we're praising him, then and that's what we're truly busy with and noticing our many, many blessings upon him, uh, sorry, many, many blessings that we receive from him, um, then we're not actually in need of it from anyone else. Uh, from the hikam of Ibn Allah, he said, the believer is the one who is too busy extolling Allah to praise his own self and too busy fulfilling Allah's rights to mention his own. And we're not talking about social justice or abuse or things like that, but in, you know, just regular community life, there are, you know, normal human tensions. I didn't like the way so-and-so looked at me or whatever, um, microaggressions or whatever that may be, just like slights that people have. And... Uh, there are you can be completely consumed by those slights. You can live a life where you're constantly thinking about what did someone do to me, what did they owe me, what like, or you can be a person who's so busy observing the blessing and the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you don't notice all that. And if it's there, it doesn't actually it, it doesn't fill your heart or mind space. May Allah make us like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who is Al Hamid. And we are the ones who are in need of him. And I say this and whatever I say is that was beneficial is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whatever I said that was wrong and mistaken is from myself and shaitan. Barakallahu fikum. Jazakumullah khair. Inshallah, I will see you in the next session after the break. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, Shaykh Khab, appreciate everything and all of your insights. I uh, just have a couple of questions that uh, if we can... Uh, real quickly uh, get through, but one of them in particular that stood out. Uh, so what can we do to, you, you talked about actions being only for Allah. So what can we do to ensure that our actions are only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Because sometimes things get out or become known. Uh, so what, any practical advice? So the first is the intention, um, right? Starting with an intention that to, in, in our hearts that what we're trying to do to be counted as an act of worship um, that counts for us, inshallah, and not against us on the day of judgment. Um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counts as something that he's pleased with. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself grants us the ikhlas, right? So we try to check our hearts to see if there's anything other than him in our hearts before we do something. And of course, we can't see our, our, ourselves. The eye can't see itself. But Allah can see us and Allah sees all of us and he knows what we don't know about ourselves. So 
we, we try as much as we can, but then we turn it over to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in, in making a sincere intention or trying to be sincere about something, we are faqir, right? We are in need of Allah and we have to uh, make dua for that. If there's some work that is public and there's some work that is private, it's going to come up inshallah in the tafsir of the verses that I do in the, in the second session. But um, in general, what can be done without people knowing, we do without people knowing. There are some things that have to be done publicly and um, they're important to be done publicly. Uh, we do those when in that manner if you know that's what needs to get done. Uh, one of my teachers once said, uh, the one who is um, who needs, right? The one who needs to have everything in private is a worshiper of everything being in private. And the one who needs everything to be done publicly is a worshiper of everything having to be done publicly. But the one who finds both of them equal in their heart, whether it's private or public, right? They are the one who is actually a worshiper of Allah. So, um, <clears throat> We, like we may get placed in different places, sometimes in the front, sometimes in the back, sometimes to the side, sometimes in the corner, sometimes hidden, sometimes not. But if it's all the same in our hearts and we're only asking, oh Allah, place me where I can worship you best, right? And we again, rely on him for the ikhlas too, in terms of asking the dua from him, then um, then inshallah, that's something that can help us, uh, you know, in terms of trying to have a sincere intention. Jazakumullah khair, uh, sister. Inshallah, we will uh, uh, await your uh, next session, which will be at uh, 6.30 uh, Central Time, inshallah. Uh, we'll uh, adjourn for a break for about 40 minutes, and then uh, we will return, inshallah, with more for the knowledge retreat. Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
brothers and sisters from Muslim American society and Islamic circle of North America. They have spent days and nights in organizing this beautiful convention. I love our brothers that are organizing this. I think they did a great job. Do you think so? I think it's so important we protect the faith of every single person in our country and definitely here in our state. Assalamu alaikum, this is Maher Zain. I'm in mass convention, about to go on stage. So I'm really excited. It's full house out there, it's great. I want to begin by congratulating Mass and ICNA on such a successful conference, mashallah. This has been a great time, mashallah, a beautiful turnout. It is wonderful to see so many people, so crowded, and it is very hopeful picture for the future, for the future of Muslim, for the future of our children. And I want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to tell you my story, and inshallah, it has inspired many of you women here because we can provide a voice that will create a much more welcoming, beautiful community for our children and for our grandchildren. So we have to restore sincerity to the Book of Allah and make the next generation a model for hope and returning back to the Deen of Allah in the spirit that it should be. About a week ago, I was sent a message on Twitter from a brother by the name of Brian Lopez who asked if I could give him his Shahada at the Mas Ikna Convention. And Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, he's here. And inshallah ta'ala, he's going to be taking shahada with us tonight. Yes. And that Muhammad, and that Muhammad is his final message. Is his final message. Is his final message. Congratulations. <laughs> The lectures are a great opportunity to learn, to know who we are, but what is more important is to actually carry the words into actions. Come to the mainstream and show how much you are proud of being who you are with the dignity, with the intellectual capacity, with the cultural commitment. The Muslim community in this country is the most diverse community across the globe. If we are able 
to transform this diversity into a power base that is rooted in social justice, America will be different. That is the challenge for us to make America different by our diversity and our engagement in this society so we could end racism, we could end bigotry. I hope as we leave this convention, then each and every one of us will take it upon ourselves that I've gained some information, I've gained some knowledge, I've dusted off my moral compass. I know the direction I need to go in. Let me start walking. And let me start walking not just by myself, but very importantly, let me bring my family along. Let me bring my community along. Let us all walk down this path together towards a better United States of America. happy that the Mass Agna Convention is here over the holiday week. When you're in the facility and you're walking around, the first thing that struck me was what a family-oriented event this is. As you grow, we want to grow with you and be a part of that evolution. For a nonprofit to really have the production values that you guys bring to an event, it's impressive. I anticipate you're going to bring the level up another notch. Really, really happy and grateful to have an opportunity to be in Chicago. The crowd in Chicago is absolutely amazing, and so is this conference. The Muslims here in America, we're here actually to make America better. That's the whole purpose of this diversity, to get to know each other, not to fight one another. It's not about winning battles, it's about winning hearts. And let the people in America understand that out of love for them, you want the best for your country.
when I was in Boston and the Boston bombing happened. You know why there was very, very little drama? Because we had served the city of Boston. Everyone around the city said they do good things in that building. You're not guaranteed protection from Islamophobia. You're not guaranteed protection from haters. But the Prophet ﷺ taught us with his example that it was worth it. Teach our children that their roots in this country run deep. That this is their country and no one has the right to tell them otherwise. Assalamu alaikum, it's your boy Harris J. My first time in the United States and my first time performing at Mass Ikra, man. I'm so excited. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. It's Mahar Zain. I'm just about to hit the stage. I'm really, really excited. It's over 10,000 people out there. The crowd is amazing, mashallah. We want America better, we want America whole, and we are going to stand out and show the light of Islam, and we're gonna do it with our patience, our love, and our obedience to Allah, and the messenger, may Allah bless all of you. Assalamu alaikum. Mass message is actually a global, and a, a particularly the United States message of unity and outreach, which I think is a very positive message, just particularly today. This is one of the best, best conventions that we have. We're so happy and blessed that you guys are here. We'd like to welcome back the Muslim American Society. We congratulate you on your 15 year anniversary for this event. The Mass Ikna Convention is not just for the Muslims. So it's a very good and useful, uh, the enriching platform to bring together people with different ethnic backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, and to give them a chance to learn more about uh, each other. We want our people to walk out of this convention thinking that, yes, I'm gonna make a difference in this society. I'm absolutely mesmerized by the level of organization, dedication, hard work to put this conference together for the benefit of all of us, and I think we owe them a round of applause.
know, there was a time where you could live a passive Muslim life, but that time is gone, my brothers and sisters. Now Islam is at the forefront. We all represent Islam now. We have to be part of the society and we have to care about the pain and struggles of others. We have to be at the forefront of this. This is part of our deen. Have we allowed for racism to not only persist in societies outside of our community, but inside our community as well? What have we done for the marginalized in this country? The narrative of black Americans in this country has still not been fully appreciated by the Muslim community. Those are very important things to, to own and struggle with. What do we stand for? Have we stood on the side of the disenfranchised in this country? It is indeed a pleasure to be amongst you today and an honor to address this wonderful community. As American Muslims, you live in a country founded on principles of religious freedom. While occasionally America may stray from these founding principles, inshallah, we will continue to honor these commitments for all of its citizens. to the urgency, we will finally do, we will finally get done what we should have been doing all along. And I believe, I believe with all of my heart, we can do this. This generation is going to have to stand tall and you're going to bring credibility and you're going to bring honesty, not just within the Muslim community, but outside of the Muslim community too. You're going to be the ones. And when you do that for the benefit of all of humanity, then you're on some ground where you get to say, this was inspired by my deen. Muslim.
Don't you guys notice that the energy level at Mass is unmatched? MashaAllah, may Allah bless all of you, bless the incredible organization of Mass and the conference organizers and all of the volunteers for everything that they've done. And may Allah reward you all for coming and being so present, not just with your bodies, but truly with your hearts, minds, and souls. They've done an incredible job. So may Allah bless them, inshallah, bless their parents, uh, bless the great work that they're doing, as well as all of the volunteers uh, at this year's awesome, amazing, incredible convention, inshallah. Ameen. On behalf of the entire staff of the Marriott Marquis Chicago, I would like to say, Shokran, thank you for allowing the hotel to be part of the Muslim American Society's 16th annual conference. Your guests truly made this event wonderful. This event offers a beacon of hope that the world we live in can be a better place. Thank you very much. We'd like to, on the behalf of the city of Chicago, present Mass Ikna with a painting by a local painter named Michael Cheney. And so this will be in the Mass Ikna offices. And again, just thank you for everything. We love you. they said I couldn't, everything was in me. I turned myself into the girl I've always wished and prayed and hoped I could be. And that is a hijabi. Islam will have a future in this country for the next 20 years. I am sure that Islam will have a future in this country for the next 200 years. And once we recognize that we have a vision that's been given to us from the Prophet and the expectation is upon us to buy into that vision and to provide that vision to the next generation as well. We are interested and invested in shaping the future of this country. We need to get out in the world you know, let our little light shine, you know, and share with the people. And everything doesn't have to be labeled Muslim or Islam. Go and join anyone who's doing good work. 
the American Muslim community is well and alive, will never be bullied, and cannot be banned. The Muslims are in America, and America is for all. And I know it says my time is up, but our time in America will never be up. Let's together build the true great America together. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Muslims, it's our duty, our responsibility now to put the Quran that we claim to be the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the book of guidance, to put it into practice. Mass is the only convention where people are in their seats before the session actually starts. for attending this conference, for making it something that our families can be proud of, somewhere that we can come together and learn and benefit and draw strength and empowerment from each other. Just like many of you here at Mass Ikna, I am an unapologetic Muslim who loves my faith and loves my beloved Prophet Muhammad. May peace and blessings be upon him. Allah. That's a Chicago salam. We have set a record of 21,000 attendees and participants.
Ikna, I want to thank you guys so much for this reward. This is so unexpected. This is the greatest accomplishment of my life. Welcome to the 2019 Mass ICNA Convention. First place, USA Quran competition, Ilhan Abdi. this gathering that brings us together and the beautiful diversity that we have from different backgrounds, different understandings, but with the same goal, that Allah be pleased with us because we have made the endeavor, we have made the effort, we have taken the time to come into spaces with others who come from different backgrounds. I cannot tell you how pleased I am to be here at Mass today and to support the work of Mass and ICNA and all of the organizations, every one of those organizations in that bazaar. And Alhamdulillah, I have not seen an organization that has reached out and welcomed other organizations to the table the way that this organization has. the great news that this year convention has surpassed 25,000 attendees and participants.
unity, the civil rights, the human rights, the equality. This is what America is. America is not to discriminate. America is not to build walls. America is not to separate families. America is not to charge its own youth with the death in their education. America is not about leaving people without health care. America is for all of us, and you are going to be the champion for America. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, everyone, to the seventh annual knowledge retreat with the Muslim American Society. Uh, it's been my pleasure to host you all tonight uh, with uh, being in the shade of uh, Surah Fatir. Uh, I encourage everyone, by the way, while we continue with our program to open up the Quran and to follow along with uh, Surah Fatir. Surah Fatir is uh, chapter number 35 of the Quran. Uh, inshallah, for our uh, next program, we will be continuing with uh, Sister Muslima Permal. Uh, the next uh, session, is uh, titled the best investment in a time of uncertainty and it's very relevant for our time as this year has just been a roller coaster ride for everyone whether it's from an economic perspective unemployment rates falling economic uncertainty is rampant people continue to struggle and there's still a lot of who knows and what if and why questions and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly articulates for us what we have to do and what is the best investment. So once again, we have a Shaykh Muslim promo to uh, continue where uh, she left off with the last uh, lecture with this one now, inshallah, the best investment in a time of uncertainty. So Shaykh Muslim promo, uh, tafaddali mashkuran. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. It's truly, again, an honor to be with everyone uh, today. And alhamdulillah for these very, very timely verses. Alhamdulillah for getting to spend time with the Qur'an together. Um, and, you know, in a, in a retreat like this, a virtual retreat. And we are more in need of these reminders during uh, times like this than any other time um, when in, in times of difficulty, tribulation, or test, that is a, a sign of, a mo uh, you know, the times that we need to turn even more to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, you know, to really try to grow our faith um, as much as we can and to ask him to help us grow our faith. So as we turn to the verses, inshallah, that I will cover um, today, the focus will be on the first few verses, but we're going to get to the others as well. These are verses 29 through 34 in Surah Fatir. And so, Truly, those who recite the Book of God perform the prayer and spend from that which we have provided them secretly and openly hope for a commerce that will never perish. These verses, or this verse that we're starting with is a really important one for us to take some time on. I want to say that if we look at the very last part of the verse, tijaratan man tabur, a commerce that will never perish, a commerce that, you know, some, an investment that doesn't go bad. Something that we put effort into that we cannot fail in. It's, it's necessarily a winning cause. There's a lot of places where a person seeks to invest and better themselves on terms of the worldly life, right? So they'll get an education. They'll try to get a good job. They'll try to marry into a good family, right? And any one of these efforts, these in and of themselves, they're good. But they may fail you, right? You may try and it ends up being a job you don't like. You may try and it ends up that this was coming from a place that you never knew it wasn't actually a halal income and then you found out and you had to leave it. Um, there's all sorts of tests and tribulations and filtering uh, that happen and we invest in different places in this life. But there is a commerce that will never perish. There is 
an investment that does not fail us, and that is to aim for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Ibn Ajiba talks about this. We'll look at the verse, inshallah, in some detail now. In this verse, we see that both the obligatory and the prerogatory manifestation of the three religious practices are mentioned and extolled. Okay, so this is, there is an amount of Quran that, we, that is called for us to recite, and there is that which is encouraged or not. Right? We, the, for example, the Quran that we recite in prayer. Prayer itself, we have prayers which are fard and we have prayers which are extra. We have uh, from our nafaqa, from what we have to spend, we, we give from what is fard upon us and we also give from what is encouraged and extra. So there's the cat and then there's also there's sadaqa. So the people who are you know, manifesting these acts of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, both in forms of obligation and in forms of that which is encouraged and but not an obligation. And they do so openly and in secret. And they are hoping, they do so because they have this hope in a commerce that will not fail them. A couple of things I want to mention. One is that there is an illusion in the way that the verse is structured to worship with the entire self. So here a person is worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their tongue, right? When they, when they're reciting Quran and with their bodies, when they pray and also an expending from their wealth. And, and the verse before it actually alludes to remembering or having taqwa of Allah. And that alludes to remembering Allah with the heart. So this is, you know, people who devote themselves in worship in a comprehensive manner. And they hope for this, uh, this important, you know, this, this, this handhold that doesn't break. They're, they're hoping for this commerce that will, will not perish, will not fail them. Now, there's, there are some comments in terms of الَّذِينَ يَتْلُونَ kitab, right? The people who recite the book, what is that a reference to? Imam Ibn Ajiba, he does mention that there are people who they actually recite Qur'an constantly, and that's from its meaning. Um, and that also that the people who spend their wealth secretly and openly, it indicates actually that people should spend both openly and secretly. Open spending encourages other people to spend, right? So when you see a Facebook fundraiser and um, you, know, you can donate, it's actually, that, that might be a place, I'm just giving an example, that might be a place um, where it's okay to have your name show because it's going to encourage other people that so-and-so gave to this cause, right? So it can encourage, but then also uh, to be of those who spend privately so that we are not boastful. And this commerce that doesn't perish, Imam uh, Arwazi, he mentions that this is in their sincerity, okay? This commerce is not just the deeds themselves, but it's the sincerity that they, that they are hoping for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are seeking only the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to be seen of other people, not to be praised of other people. We kind of talked about this in the previous verse a little bit as well. Um, and so this truly is the commerce that does not fail. Sincerity, sincere, righteous work does not fail. The reward is in uh, both this life and in the next life. Now, uh, what's interesting is, you know, Imam Ghazali, he talks about worship and how people can worship on three different levels and how some people, they do their worship because they're trying to avoid hellfire, right? So they, they do what's an obligation upon them. So they're just trying to avoid hellfire. There's other people who they, they worship Allah, but it's because they're looking for the, you know, the rewards and the, the pleasures of paradise. And the first two categories that I just mentioned, they are very transactional. I will do this so I can protect myself from that. I will do this so that I can enjoy that um, transactional, it's like a business transaction. But the highest level is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is Allah and the only one worthy of worship and he is worthy of as much worship that we can possibly worship him with, right? And so this is the highest level and it's to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of love, out of the acknowledgement of who he is. As our, as our Lord. And the highest level of sincerity, right, in terms of the intention, is to do so only out of the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
in again seeking his face, seeking his pleasure. This is what you love. I want you, right? Um, and uh, you know, I, I believe it was Imam Ali, Karamullah Wajha, who said that if you know paradise were to be placed on one side of him and hellfire were to be placed on the other side of him, it actually wouldn't change what he's doing at all because he's doing what he's doing. So he didn't say this, but he's doing what he's doing for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the, that the manifestations of both of these, um, you know, in these places that will exist forever in the afterlife, they, they will actually not be the motivator for him. The motivator for him is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the highest of all motivations. And that is truly a commerce that will never perish. And it doesn't mean that we cannot intend paradise and not be rewarded for that. You can, a, a person can, and a person can ask for that, and they should. But the, the heart, right, if the heart is attached to Allah beyond every, anything else, that it doesn't matter the, the rivers of milk and wine and honey, the palaces, the gardens, um, all of that stuff is there and it's wonderful, but what they really want, what they really aim for is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be close to him and with him. And so this is uh, subhanAllah the intention that all of us hope for and all of us seek. All of us turn to Allah asking of Him to grant us the highest of levels of Allah, to bestow that upon us, to help us with it if we, um, if we falter. There is something to be said here also of um, this idea of being, of doing good in a hidden way and in an open way and intending Allah. Now, earlier I was kind of talking about how we shouldn't just put everything up on social media because we, we do live in an age where um, actually everyone is a public figure. Everyone has a Facebook page. Everyone has a following. Every, and it's, um, it's, it's the time of actually, in some ways, there's, there's, there's a lot of khayr that is being passed, but there's also a lot of test that is uh, being experienced in a way that people just did not experience before. I remember uh, a, a long time ago, when I was very young, I remember reading a narration about one of the signs of the end of time. That one of the signs of the end of times would be that everyone would be satisfied with their own opinion. Everybody would be satisfied um, and uh, sort of admire, right, their own opinion. I remember thinking to myself, like when we get together in a gathering, right, we go to a, like the masjid and like the largest gathering is probably Jumu'ah or, or Tarawih in the masjid. Um, usually there's one person talking, everyone else is listening, or um, even in classes, it's a teacher, and then there's some question answer, but usually we're not in a space where, like, there's a space where there's thousands of people where we are all expressing our own opinions and impressed by them. I've never, I never, when I read that narration, I couldn't even imagine what that would be like. How, how do you get, like, everyone together to... Um, in, in, in a setting where they would be expressing their opinions and then be impressed by what they say. So I couldn't fathom it. And then, subhanAllah, just the other day, I was looking at scrolling through my social media feed, scrolling through Facebook. And what I found was it just dawned upon me that on social media, everyone, everyone puts up an opinion and a reflection and a thought. Everyone has a hot take, right? And then there's a bunch of likes, there's a bunch of comments, and, and I'm sure that this climate of everyone putting up an opinion that has immediate feedback and praise and whatnot is the one that is ripe for like everyone getting impressed with themselves, with what they, with, with what they think and what they, you know, again, the hot take. We live in that era now. Never before could you imagine a time where thousands of people get together and every person is expressing a very opinionated opinion about something <laughs> and feels extremely you know, important because of it. In the age of social media, that is one of the things that can happen and is a test. It doesn't mean we don't share things that are going to be of benefit, but uh, the check on our hearts is, is this for Allah? Is this because I want his face? Is this because the goal is to be of benefit and service to his creation? Is this something that, inshallah, is needed Right. So there's another aspect of it, which is um, if you're in a conversation in a room, if a lot of times if we don't say anything, the idea that we were going to say, someone in the room will actually say it. And you can test this. You can be in a, I mean, right now we can't gather physically, but if you are 
um, even in a halakha, you know, you have thoughts that come to your mind, you want to say it right away. If you hold on to it for like five minutes and let everyone else continue talking, you will notice that someone else will likely say what you were thinking to say. And so in this is also, uh, I think in our time, you know, when they say speech, is it necessary? Right? Is it necessary? Are you, are you, are we benefiting uh, the conversation? If someone else not saying it, if there are enough people saying it, we don't actually have to say anything. We actually don't. There's no, there's no reason for an added uh, repetition. We can share what someone else has said. Right? We can share it on our own pages. We can, um, that might be a little bit more sincere than saying the exact same thing again. Um, is it necessary, right? Is it true uh, in the age of fake news? Is it true? And is it kind? These are all, I think, important, um, you know, gates for us to check our speech with, not just, again, in person when we are with each other, but even in an online reality, uh, especially over social media. Because social media, everything is public. Whatever we put up is public, right? Is it necessary? Is it true? Is it kind? Three gates. Um, or kind or beneficial, I should say. It's of benefit. It's not, it's not level. It's not nonsense speech. Uh, and so, and, and I'm not saying that we can't like check in with each other and like, uh, how are you? How's your family? Things like that. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to, um, especially in situations where people want to express opinions. And we have this warning of the Prophet Muhammad about the signs of the Day of Judgment. Everyone will, will be impressed with their own opinions. They see only themselves. They see only their own intelligence, their own wiseness and wisdom. Um, and that's one of the tests, again, of, of things being so public right now. And this idea of privacy, which we are actually going back to, subhanAllah, by in the pandemic, you know, the stay at home situation does help us to actually remember what it's like to have a private life, right, with our own families and to invest in those things too, right, that which is not seen. There are some beautiful statements. Today is December 25th, right? So some people are celebrating Christmas. We as Muslims, obviously, we um, have our own holidays, but it's uh, it's also it's a nice time to reflect on what we do believe to be true about the Prophet Isa alayhi salam. And the Prophet Isa alayhi salam, he has some beautiful statements uh, that are narrated in the Ahiya al Medina of Imam Ghazali. I think these two are related to this idea of doing good publicly and privately. He says, in the Hayal al-Madin, he said, how can one be from the people of knowledge when his end is in the next life and his effort right, is in worldly things? How can one be from the people of knowledge when he seeks wisdom in order to speak about it rather than act upon it? Right? If a person is just looking up something so they can share it and speak about it, right? he's saying, how can you be considered from the people of knowledge? And that's why it is an age of information. It's an age, the information is there. But knowledge, I think, is something that, as we do, as, a, you know, as it comes up in the Quran, which is something that is embodied, uh, it is practiced that we need more of. May Allah help us to be people of those, of those people who actually practice. The example of one who seeks knowledge and does not act upon it. This is also from Isa alayhi salam mentioned in the Hiya al Muddin of Imam Ghazali. The example of one who seeks knowledge and does not act upon it is that of a woman who committed adultery in secret. Then her pregnancy starts to show and she is humiliated in front of the people. Right? So may Allah protect us from that. There are examples in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad of the first three people who are thrown into hellfire. The first three people thrown into hellfire, one of them being a religious scholar, one of them being um, someone who gave a lot of charity for the sake of God, and one of them being a mujahid, someone who struggled in the way of God on the battlefield, and they died on the battlefield. And each one of them, when they are asked what did they do, they'll mention their deeds, and every time Allah will say, no, you did not do that for me, you did that so that you might be praised. And so we are in dire need of ikhlas, 
not just because it is the commerce that will never perish, but because the opposite of that, to not have ikhlas, to do things um, for other than Allah, and especially public worship, um, is something that is punished. And we seek his protection from that. Amen. Now, but those who, again, they, and they, they are doing this investing in their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they're seeking him, they're intending him. They are trying to do, to be devoted to him in their selves, you know, in, in their hearts, in their speech, in their actions, right, in their charity, inwardly and outwardly, publicly and privately. They, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِيُوَسِّيَهُمْ مُجُورَهُمْ وَيَزِيدَهُمْ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ إِنَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ إِنَّهُ غَفُورٌ شَكُورٌ That he may pay their rewards in full and increase them from his bounty. Truly, he is forgiving and thankful. Now, I think the um, discussion about who am I Right? Who am I? I'm a servant of Allah. I'm a worshiper of Allah. I'm, a, I'm his servant. And who is Allah to me as his servant? Uh, in this verse, we have two of his beautiful names being mentioned to us. al Ghafur and Ash-Shakur. Right? He is the all-forgiving and he is the thankful. He is the one who appreciates what we do for him. And so... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward the devout believers that are mentioned in these verses. And one of the ways that he rewards them, I guess, in terms of his bounty, what is he would increase them from his bounty? Uh, there's different opinions about what that means. How does that happen to the person? So in the tafsir of Imam Ibn Ajiba, he mentions that one of them is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would expand their graves. That's what the increase is. Another opinion is that they will see the blessing in their families, right? In terms of the the, the faith and the iman that their families have. Uh, a third is that it, they will have their hasanat, their good deeds multiplied. Um, a fourth is something that is uh, very beautiful. Uh, it's tahqiq wa'ad liqa'ihi, that the realization of the promise that the servant will get to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, while Allah is so pleased with them. And there is this conversation that happens in paradise with the believers where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes to the believers all that he has given them, right, in terms of the, the bounties of paradise. And he asks the people of paradise, are you satisfied? Are you pleased? And they say yes. And he also says, this day I am pleased with you, right? And so then afterwards, the, he asks the believers of paradise, you know, do you want anything more than this? And the people in paradise, they don't, they, they're so happy. They're so overjoyed. They cannot imagine that there's anything greater than what they've already been given. They're in a state where they have met their creator and they are pleased with him and he is pleased with them. So they, they, they're like, what can possibly be better than this? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in that uh, conversation, he removes the veil and they actually get to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is the increase that they had never imagined. That is the, the bounty they could have never um, fathomed. And um, subhanAllah, that's the the, the greatest of all, of all of the pleasures and rewards of paradise, being able to witness Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the greatest of them all. Ibn Hajiba also mentions that this commerce from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his thawab that is a sign of his pleasure. So it's not just like the act, the good deed for its own sake, obviously, but that these good deeds, the things that are rewarded, the hasanat, the salab, this these are signs of that which Allah loves and is pleased with. And so uh, this is what the person is investing in. This is this is the handhold that doesn't break. What does my Lord want from me? What does he love from me? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to always keep that front and center, no matter how, what the ups and downs are. In a difficult time, we, there is the next step is, what does Allah want from me? In a good time, the next step is, what does Allah want from me? What does he love from me? The ending that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving and thankful, you know, it indicates obviously that our shortcomings he forgives. 
um, and that he rewards the, the good deeds and he's, uh, he's the one who truly appreciates the good deeds. In terms of his forgiveness, I think again, Paula, wherever, I want to, I shouldn't say wherever, but many times when the good deeds of the righteous people are mentioned, the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also mentioned with it, right? Um, even when the nasr of Allah comes, what do people do? They they praise Allah, they make istighfar to Allah. إِذَا جَاءَ النَّصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينَ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجَ فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ Right? إِنَّهُ كَانَ تَوَّابًا So this, the, when, the, when the victory of Allah comes, and, and all of these people enter into the religion of Allah, then we praise Allah, right? Again, giving the credit belongs to Him, and we seek forgiveness. Even though all these good deeds happened, right? When the victory of Allah comes, people are usually involved in some way of aiding that or helping in that or working in that. But the reward I mean, is from Allah. The, the good came from Him to us, and we had many shortcomings that He covered when He brought that victory. So the same in terms of, uh, you know, the good deeds of the devotee of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we have shortcomings in our prayers. We have shortcomings in our recitation and connection to the Qur'an. We have shortcomings in our giving of wealth. We need the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in the good that we do. We need the forgiveness for him in the things that we didn't notice about ourselves or our own hearts while we were doing that. And so he is al ghafur He is al shakur He's the one who forgives us when we turn to him seeking that. Right? We, we ask for that. We need that. And he's also Shakur. He's the one who gives to us in a generous way. He is the one who appreciates what we did. And he knows what we did better than we, than we know. He knows our condition better than we know our condition. A lot of times people put forth an effort, the same effort. And we mentioned this a little bit before, but one person, for example, had to struggle really hard to do that good. Another person, it came to them very easily. Allah rewards each person according to that struggle that they put forward for him. So let's say a person feels like getting up and praying Fajr is so hard, so hard. They are rewarded for that struggle. And they may struggle for a period where it's so hard for them, right, to just to get up and pray on time. And that is maybe meant as a blessing for them to have more reward. And then they get to a point where, inshallah, the prayers are easy and they come easily and the person enjoys them. And they, they're still rewarded for that. They have a very high rank. But to get to that place, they have to go through some struggle first. And so, subhanAllah, that, you know, only Allah knows what we go through. And some people, you know, people have struggles in different places. Something is easy for me in one area, but hard for me in another area. And Allah knows the details of our trials of our difficulties, of the pain that we have in, in whatever life circumstance we're, we're in. Someone has passed away, right? Many people are experiencing loss of, of loved ones right now. Yet some people may have, their grief may be heavier than many others. It's a heavy blanket. They almost cannot get out from underneath it. And they're trying to be patient for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? They're holding on to their iman and they're trying to practice as much patience as they can as they go through such heavy grief. And another person is also grieving for the loss of a loved one, but it's not as heavy. Allah knows. Allah knows the details of our struggles, the details of our pain, the details of what we put forward for him. So only he can be a shakur, the truly appreciative, the one who is truly thankful. He knows the inside and the outside. We could spend some time, actually, on these two beautiful names. If we have time, we'll come back at the end. I know we're, we left the Q&A session to the end of this, um, for both sessions, to the end of this particular uh, presentation. And so if we have some time before then, then I'll come back and we'll talk some more about the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. al ghafur al-Shakur. Who is Allah? He is al ghafur al-Shakur. He is the all-forgiving, the most forgiving, and the truly thankful the most appreciative of anything that's put forward for him. 
والذي أوحينا إليك من الكتاب هو الحق مصدقا لما بين يديه إن الله بعباده لخبير بصير And that which we have revealed to you from the book is the truth Confirming what came before it Verily God is of his servants aware and seeing From the book refers either to the guidance and clarifications from the Quran or the Quran itself being from the preserved tablet. This is in the Tafsir al Razi. Um, and it's, this is because it was the, 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 uh, Allah al the preserved tablet, is the source of all revelation. The book confirms what came before it, and so there, there is no difference between it and previous revelations. There's no contradiction. And so the Fusulat, uh, it addresses the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi saying, not has been said unto thee, save that which has been said unto the messengers before thee. So from this perspective, the Quran cannot but confirm uh, previous scriptures. ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَصِدٌ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ سَابِقٌ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ ذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَضْلُ الْكَبِيرِ Then we bequeathed the book to those of our servants whom we had chosen. Among them are those who wrong themselves, those who take a middle course, and those who are foremost in good deeds, by God's lead. That is the great bounty. In this is actually a really important indication about the relationship we're supposed to have with the Qur'an. So who has Allah bequeathed the books to? He has bequeathed them, uh, Imam Ibn Ajiba mentions, to the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu He has bequeathed the Qur'an to the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So the Sahaba, the Tabi'een, the Tabi'a Tabi'een, and those who came after until now, we are those who have inherited the book. And from the servants of Allah, in the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad there are those who wrong themselves. And who are they? Imam Ibn Ajibah, he said, these are the people who, they did not, um, they did not act on what they knew. Right? So they uh, fell into, they believed, they're believers, but they, their record is uh, one that is uh, full of wrongdoing, okay? The second is those who take a middle course, and Imam Ibn Ajiba mentioned, these are people who mix their good deeds and they also some bad deeds. This is the majority of the ummah, right? People who have both good and bad. Um, and then he says there are those who are foremost in the good deeds, right? The sabiqun, and who are the sabiqun? Imam Ibn Ajiba, he says, these are people who combined between what they know and what they practice. That's what true knowledge is, to be able to combine between the ilm and the amal. And so these were people who did good, and they didn't just do the good that was required of them. They did the good that was an obligation, and they did the good that was recommended. They did the good that would be pleasing to Allah, all kinds of good, right? And uh, they stayed away from the haram that was forbidden, and they also stayed away from all the things that were disliked. They just they, they didn't want to get close to what is displeasing to Allah. These are the sabiqun. And there are different rewards according to, again, the different levels of, the, of, of people. There's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu essentially saying that the sabiqun, they will actually enter paradise without hisab. And I want to um, just look at it just for a second. So one of the things that he mentions is that uh, the Prophet Muhammad mentions in the narration um, is As-sabiq yadkhul al-jannah bi ghayri hisab wal-muqtasib yuhasibu hisaban yasira thumma yadkhul al-jannah that the, that the one who takes the middle path they will have an easy reckoning they will, be, they will have accountability but they will um, it, it will be easy wal-zalimun yuhbah and so the, the volume is actually, uh, I want to say, imprisoned. And it's not really imprisoned. He's, he's, he's held captive. 
and two, he believes that there's no way that he could possibly, um, you know, win in his situation, that he could possibly, you know, uh, have paradise. And then after that, he receives the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he enters paradise. And so this is, I mean, kind of in terms of thinking about the, the, the mercy, the vast mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that the one who believes, right, they have inherited the book, but they have, uh, they have acted badly, they have acted wrongly constantly, um, but, you know, their, their, their record is, is full of, um, uh, of misdeeds. That that person is still someone who, on the day of judgment, when they think there's no way for them, there's no hope for them, they would still uh, receive the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be allowed to enter paradise. And that the person who's muqtasid, they have good deeds and they have bad deeds mixed. They have hisab, they have hisab and yasira, an easy hisab. And the sabiq, the sabiq and the khairat, the one who rushes ahead of everyone else, they are people who get to enter paradise without hisab. Uh, there's, you know, some discussion about this and how the different categories, you know, relate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of their worship. Now, the book has been bequeathed to all three groups, and even those who believe, again, even those who believe yet wrong themselves are people who are forgiven. And this is mentioned actually in the tafsir of Imam Ibn Kathir, Imam al qurtubi Imam al tabari So it's kind of something that we, um, we, we believe in. And it is, again, a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We will not enter paradise by our deeds. We will enter uh, from his uh, generous and divine mercy. Now the last verses, which I'm not going to go into in detail, uh, but I wanted to mention as they kind of close this, the, the section. Gardens of Eden, which they will enter, adorned therein with bracelets of gold and pearls, and their garments therein will be of silk. وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبَ عَنَا الْحَزَنِ and they will say, praise be to God who has dispelled grief from us. All of the pain of this life in that moment in paradise will be gone. Truly, our Lord is forgiving and thankful. I know we need to leave some time for questions. I just want to add one comment that's extremely important in terms of um, because a lot of this talks about those who recite the book and those who inherit the book, right? Um, Imam Ibn Ajiba, he talks about this at length and he says that the people of the Qur'an on the Day of Judgment, they will come and they will have, they will be on dunes of myth. Their faces will have so much light that it will overwhelm others. When they come to the Surat, the, the bridge, the angels will actually meet them. And those who were, you know, assigned to Hamlet al-Qur'an, to the carriers of the Qur'an, they will have crowns upon their heads and uh, the scent and the light of paradise actually reaches them on the Day of Judgment. The people of the Qur'an, he said, these are not the people who memorized the entirety of the book. And these are not the people who read the entirety of the book, even if they were a people who read it all the time. So the people of the Qur'an, what it actually means, and he does, he stresses this for a good period, a good amount of time in the tafsir, is that they are people who are sincere in their recitation. Sincerity, again. They guard the limits of the Qur'an, the hudud of the Qur'an, okay. They give it its haq in terms of following it. And he says, essentially, these are people who act upon the Qur'an. That is why they have such great reward. They, they memorized a lot of Qur'an and they acted upon it. So um, he says a lot has been narrated and about those who read the Qur'an and don't act by it, those who read the Qur'an and don't practice it, and about the punishment of people who recite it only to be seen. Um, there's many things. That, that, have been, that have been narrated about punishments of people who carry the Qur'an in terms of on an outward level, but it, again, it doesn't actually reach their hearts. It's not something they practice. It's not something they actually are seeking to, to, to be devoted in, in terms of their personal lives. Mm -hmm. And so he says that this is an important understanding because uh, from the Sahaba, most of them did, did not memorize the entirety of the Qur'an. From the great Salihin of the past, many of them were not memorizers of the Qur'an, but they were people who carried the Qur'an. They were Hamlet al Qur'an because they acted upon what they knew from the Qur'an, and they embodied it. And these are people who are going to be foremost, and people who memorized it but did not act on it. 
this verse doesn't apply to them. The recitation by itself, although it has many good spiritual benefits, recitation without seeking to act upon it does not have benefit. It actually has punishment if a person is doing it for others. So I say this, and I want to actually um, open it for questions. I know we have a little bit of time left for questions. Whatever is beneficial is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever is wrong and mistaken is from myself and shit. Jazakumullah khair. Uh, we had a couple of uh, interesting points that you bring up about the Qur'an, and it worries people sometimes because uh, a lot of people read the Qur'an and they feel like it's just kind of words coming out of their mouth, but it's not translating into action and they're looking for something uh, and it happens also with salah as well people you know con you know say uh, you know i'm not really getting any benefit out of my salah and that worries me because uh, you know compared to the sahaba who lived the quran versus now what what advice would you give to someone who is struggling with their relationship with the quran is trying to make that effort but just says it's just not i'm not really seeing any benefit from it I think one of the uh, mistakes that is a widespread mistake in the way that we relate to Qur'an today as a community is that we excel in the quantitative relationship with Qur'an and we are really behind in the qualitative relationship with the Qur'an. And what do I mean? I mean that a person can memorize from a young age Right, we encourage memorization. I'm not saying don't encourage memorization because little minds, alhamdulillah, memorize really fast. Many of them, not all of them. But to have a connection to meaning, and this is why, subhanAllah, for many converts who did not know Arabic, right, when they, they became Muslim, they didn't know any Arabic and they had to read the translation of the Quran, their first introduction to Quran was the meaning, right? And for a lot of people who are born Muslim, their first introduction to the Quran is memorizing. Um, the meaning of the Qur'an is something that we need to develop a relationship with. That's why I'm glad you guys are doing this program because we're talking about the verses and the meaning. And even Salah, like this is very concise. What is there in the tafsir is much more than what we're able to cover even in 50 minutes. But the, the meaning is really uh, inspiring. There's a beautiful uh, article by, um, it's been translated. It's advices of Imam al-Ghazali about how to um, how to better the qualitative relationship that we have with the Qur'an. And one of the things he actually says is that it's mandatory for us to have a qualitative relationship. It comes actually before the quantitative. We need to turn to the Qur'an to obey. <laughs> we get our deen from, from sacred sources. And uh, you know, the Qur'an is one of those sources. So we should know what Allah is asking from us. Um, we should have a connection to that. Not just in terms of even the do's and don'ts in the law, right? There's sharia, right, which we study, but that's, that's one aspect. There's also what do we believe, right? How do we strengthen that belief? Um, where, where is the guidance in terms of our makarim um, al-akhlaq, the qualities which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the characteristics which he wants from us? Some of them are mentioned here in these verses. Um, and so we turn to the Qur'an for, like, primarily, I want to understand this meaning that has been sent to me, that's divine, and I want to learn from it, benefit, and I want to practice, right? That, that's really what we want to turn to the Qur'an for is I want to, it, it's guidance, it's shifa for my life, right? It's not just, yes, there's healing for, you recite certain surahs for different things, but the whole of the Qur'an is shifa. If there's a healing for it, for what is in our hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Qur'an as many, in the Qur'an as many word names. And so this, this um, we need to turn to it with a qualitative. Even someone who knows Arabic, if your mind is shut off while you're reading the Arabic, then take out a translation in whatever language your your mind will not shut off in. Um, you know, if you can read it in English and you can reflect on the meaning, if you can look at tafsir and look, you know, wherever you have a question, the advice is by Imam Ghazali in terms of how do we develop a qualitative relationship with the Quran, you can find that on, um, I believe, on the Seekers Guidance website. Um, you can probably just search for it, Advices of Imam al-Ghazali Qur'an. And it should pop up. It's a short article. He has 10 advices. And it includes things about how do you have other words? How do you get into the mood and the mode of, of connecting to the Qur'an really in a meaningful way? And it doesn't, it doesn't say you have to read a lot. Like it, sometimes it's only two verses or three verses. Um, there's a, this is a whole topic in and of itself. But um, that's one of the ways is to develop the qualitative. The other thing is just to attend a weekly class in tafsir, um, in Qur'an, or include tafsir of the Qur'an in the halaqa that you're in. 
um, and you know, really to to have that in your life as a as a regular practice, inshallah. So, what was the the name of the book, by the way? You, you mentioned earlier that you're using uh, for your tafsir. Uh, was it the Clear Quran, I believe? Or there's two. There's so there's two in English. Uh, there is the Study Quran that I recommend. I think it's a wonderful resource. The Study Quran. Some some have said, well, there's comments in here that I don't agree because because it comes from Shia sources. The Study Quran has in there the, the comments for it has in parentheses it gives you the source of where it comes from, and so you can actually go through it and uh, pick out the, the who is saying what. Imam Al Qurtubi, Imam Al Razi, uh, Imam Ibn Ajiba. Um, and so, like something else I want to show you guys, I'm gonna stop the share real quick. Is um, is a bookmark. I don't know if I can show it on the screen if it's showing up. I have a bookmark that I use. It's not really showing. There we go. Some of it's showing. Huh. Um, and it's uh, it keeps disappearing. That's okay. But it's a bookmark where I took in the very first pages, few pages of the study of Quran. It gives you like a a guide for the names, like the initials that are used for every mufassir. And so I took all of that and put it on the back of my bookmark. So I know when it, when I see, for example, um, you know, uh, like BD, it, it's, from, it's taken from the Tafsir Imam al Baydawi. That's a source I'm very comfortable with. And so it's it's about how do you use a study Quran, you use it to study. And you should, um, I think it's extraordinarily beneficial, alhamdulillah. And it's even extraordinary to, to look at what other views are and other opinions are, and how there are so many opinions about the meanings of certain verses. That's one. The second one is the tafsir of Imam Ibn Ajiba. I, it hasn't been translated, to my knowledge, um, and it, it's not a full tafsir. So this is, again, it doesn't show on the camera. al um, uh, yeah. al-Madid is the name of it, tafsir al-Qur'an al-Majid. And uh, I love it because it also has spiritual lessons after the verses. So it has the general meaning of the verses and ahadith and things that are related to verses. And then it also has a section which is sort of... Um, spiritual lesson to take from the verses. Okay. Uh, and, and that's the one I use. I have a weekly class in Tafsir. That's the one I use for it. One, one last question, if you don't mind. And it's, it's off topic, but uh, it, uh, it's very relevant. And me, as a, as a father of, of, of a daughter who recently finished potty training, by the way, alhamdulillah, it's the best thing in the world. Uh, <laughs> so I make dua for you as well. Uh, what, can you, what kind of advice can you Thank give you. For, uh, for females who uh, are interested in are, for our sisters who are interested in pursuing a uh, a life in uh, in Islamic scholarship uh, as yourself and uh, what kind of tips would you give them and, and how and how important is it for us to have more uh, more sisters involved in this? Yeah, um, I'll, uh, uh, we have another hour. I guess <laughs> we can spend an hour and talk on this topic, but. Um, I, I would advise sisters to, inshallah, study this deen. Um, uh, you know, if they have this loa in their heart, they have like a desire in their heart to study it, um, to go for it, inshallah. And that this, uh, we are definitely in need of this as an ummah. Um, you know, we are, inshallah, in terms of scholarship, we have had female scholars in our history. Um, and then there's a period where, you know, the, 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 the names have been lost. But it doesn't mean that it didn't exist. Um, so much can be said about it, but we, it needs to be revived. So it did exist. I mean, we have a 56 volume, I think, uh, work by uh, Sheikh Akram Nadwi that talks about, for example, the Muhaddisa, just the female scholars that in the realm of Hadith, let alone the other topics. Um, there's a book by a non Muslim uh, Jewish uh, woman who researched. Um, who did a research in Islamic biographical dictionaries about women in the Tabakat. Uh, and the, how many she talks about how many scholars that she read about and how she found that so many of her stereotypes about Islam and about women were just completely wrong when she looked at the lives of the great female scholars in the in the in the tradition of uh, of our Islamic history. So it has existed. There are times in the post post colonial era where the Ummah really didn't. Um, I don't want to say it didn't produce, but it's not as widely known who they are. But they still existed. Um, maybe the numbers being a lot less. We still need the female voice. Um, you know, the ummah is in need of both the male and the female. And we believe in both the, the I want to say, the spiritual patriarchy that we have in the form of our, our great prophets, and the, and the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi being the greatest of them all in terms of, um, in terms of that. But we also believe in spiritual matriarchy, 
We have spiritual mothers, like the mothers of the believers, like Aisha radiallahu anha, and the great female scholars that came after the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the, the, the great female awliya, uh, the intimate friends of God that we know about, like Rabbul Adawiyah and others. And that we had them before the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We had uh, our, our, our mother uh, Mary, alayhi salam, right? Uh, and she was one of the first women to be devoted um, to scholarship and to worship in the mosque. Uh, again, today is December 25th, and we're thinking about people like our mother Mary. But this is this is not new. A woman who is pursues this is not doing anything new. She's she's only renewing a tradition that goes back to the very beginning. And um, yeah, I could say a lot more, but I know we don't have that much so, time. So yeah. I'll say that. Barakallahu feek, Allah is the I know it's a big topic, and uh, but I appreciate your time and your efforts, and uh, uh, we have a lot of questions. I wish we can get to more. Barakallahu feek, wa jazakumullah khair. May Allah bless you and your family. Inshallah, this will uh, conclude this session, and uh, we will uh, continue in a few minutes after a word from our sponsors. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, sister. So we will break, inshallah, with a word from our sponsors, and we will uh, begin uh, the next session with Dr. Yasser Qadi and the Q&A that will follow after that. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. You don't know me, but I know you. I am a refugee and an orphan. And you are the person who helps me every year. You make sure I have food to eat and a place to sleep. You make sure that I'm taken care of when there is no one to take care of me. And you have given me hope for the future. I'm not the only one who needs help. There are many more that need someone to care for them. Donate now. Thank you for being there for us. أتمنى أنكم تجيبون نماذج أنا بناشد العالم بناشدكم كلها كن تجيبون نماذج كل الجمعيات بتمنى أنكم تسمعوا نداءنا والأطفال كلها تبع عند الجزامة عم تطلع بالشحات لبرا
are the millions of displaced refugees living in camps worldwide. For us, winter is a battlefield that we're ill-equipped for. Our tents are not insulated and our bodies are exposed to the harsh elements. In the depths of a cold winter night, our beds don't provide any safety from the freezing temperature. And because of this, many of us will become sick and some of us may not survive until spring, especially the kids. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khair everyone for attending our knowledge retreat. We have two more sessions to go. I've been your, your host, Muhammad Atta. Uh, before we go into our next session with uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi, which will be a Q&A session, will be a question answer session. And then after that, we will end the night with uh, Dr. Omar Sulaiman. Uh, I want to just uh, give you guys a little insight on why this theme and what goes into preparing for the knowledge retreats and what we what our goal is with all that and how it differs from the convention uh, the knowledge retreat is meant to be uh, as the name implies a time for knowledge and there's different types of knowledge some knowledge retreats have focused a lot more on technicalities things like fiqh halal and haram different madhahib some knowledge retreats have focused on historical concepts historical events like we did the uh, the Khulafa al-Rashidun a couple of years ago. And this year we're doing, we're trying to go with a more intellectual focus. And that's kind of what we were going with, with this retreat. And one of the questions that we asked ourselves before starting or before even brainstorming for this was, what is the biggest challenge that Muslims face nowadays? What is the, the issue at hand that Muslims are constantly having difficulty with. And you can make a long list of what it is that Muslims are struggling with. But we found that probably one of the biggest issues, or if not the biggest issues, is the issue of identity. There is an identity crisis amongst Muslims nowadays, especially in America. And so our speakers have kind of gone through these issues, but I kind of wanted to bring it home for you all. And uh, uh, Sheikh Muslim Formal brought this up earlier as well. But we wanted this to kind of revolve around three basic yet very important questions. Number one, who is Allah? Simple enough, right? Who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Number two, who am I? Meaning, how do I perceive myself? And number three, what is life? What's the objective of life? What is the point of all of this? And the Quran, Allah, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers these questions profoundly and easily. And our speakers have gone through these and answered them very well. But it's something that we always have to wonder. Again, who is Allah? Who am I? Meaning, how do I perceive myself? And what is life? Most Muslims on the surface, dare I say, generally speaking, can answer that first question really well. Who is Allah? 
they'll give answers like Allah is the, the king, Allah is the most merciful, Allah is the highest. Generally, Muslims have a pretty healthy, generally, again, have a pretty healthy perception on paper of who Allah is. But then the second question can get a little bit more murky, right? Who am I? How do I perceive myself? Most Muslims will just say, I'm Muslim. But then that third question really hits kind of hard. What is life? And the thing is, if you don't have a good idea of what that first question, or those first two questions are, if you don't have a good answer, that third question is going to be really problematic. So for some people, life is be happy. Life is whatever I make out of it. For some people, life is just a pursuit of happiness, of a good career, of wealth, of fame, of power. See, if a person answers those first two questions incorrectly, then that third question about what is life becomes skewed. They may answer who is Allah in a good way, but then when life hits hard, they start questioning Allah. They start questioning their identity. And this is where you have people questioning Islam and questioning their role as Muslims. You see, if I perceive life as something that should just be enjoyed, that's for my own benefit, but then a calamity hits, a pandemic, death, financial loss, then it becomes difficult to reconcile that first question, who is Allah? Allah is the most merciful, but I'm not seeing his mercy in my life. And I'm supposed to be Muslim. And these are the kind of questions that we were aiming to kind of uh, to address. And alhamdulillah, the speakers have done a wonderful job explaining how we are dependent upon Allah, who is the independent, how we should not be deluded by the shaitan and by the the materialistic out, uh, outward appearance of this world. And that's where we really want everyone to kind of understand and where we want the benefit for our, for our uh, audience to come about with. At the end of this knowledge retreat, you should have a better understanding about who is Allah, who am I, and what is life all about. In this next session, Dr. Yasser Qadi will now be addressing some question and answer, uh, some questions, and he'll be answering them. فَلْيَتَفَضَّلْ مَشْكُورًا جزاكم الله خير. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wa lahum abad. So uh, I've been asked to um, answer a number of questions that have been posed by uh, the viewers. And so I begin with the uh, first question uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began Surah Fatir by explaining the wings of the angels. Uh, given the fact that we live in a very materialistic world, what lessons can we derive from the description of the unseen entities such as angels, such as jinn, or such as the hereafter? So this is a, a very good question that deals with uh, what is called in Arabic Iman bil ghaib. And of course, the concept of Imam bil ghaib is something that is fundamental uh, for our faith. In fact, what does the very first verse of the Quran state? Alif la mim dhalika al kitabu la rayba fi hudal lil muttaqin alladhina yu'minuna bil ghaibi. So Allah describes the believers as those who believe in the ghaib. And the ghaib is the world that is beyond our peripheral senses, it is beyond our vision. It is beyond our physical uh, uh, impulses and sensations. And Allah Azza wa Jal says that in order for us to believe, there has to be a leap of faith. There has to be Iman bil ghaib. And this raises the very interesting and deep question. Why should we believe in the ghaib when we have not seen or experienced it? In fact, an even more profound question can be asked, and that is that, if our faith requires us to believe in ghaib, and other faiths as well believe in ghaib, then how do we know that our faith is true and other faiths are not true? And the response to this is that this is where Islam differs from other faith traditions. You see, firstly, the ghaib, the belief in the unseen and the aspects that are in the realm of the ghaib, they never contradict that which is 
uh, rational, that which is understood, that which is logical. The ghayb is never irrational. It might be beyond rationality. Beyond rationality means our minds cannot think about those issues. But it is never irrational. We would believe that in contrast to this, many other faith traditions would tell us to believe in that which is irrational and then say this is of the mysteries of God. So for example, to say that there are three gods but three is one and one is three, we would say this is irrational. It is not beyond rationality. Rather, it is against rationality. However, our faith tradition, it tells us to believe in the ghayb, which is beyond rationality. A simple example is angels. Belief in angels is not something that is irrational. Science, reason, logic, the, the mind, the eyes can neither prove nor disprove belief in the angels. Therefore, for us, it is very clear that iman bil ghayb is that which involves that which is beyond rationality. We cannot uh, verify the angels exist via science, but at the same time, we cannot negate their existence as well. And one of the reasons why uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to believe in the ghayb uh, about matters, for example, the description of the angels, uh, is that this is conditioning us. It is making us understand and appreciate the overall belief in ghayb. So for Allah azza wa jal to describe the angels and how they exist, and the Prophet told us so many descriptions about the angels. So Allah Azza wa Jal is then allowing us to enter into a realm that our minds cannot, uh, our eyes cannot see, our minds cannot comprehend. If we can believe in this, then we can believe in that which is beyond this as well. And by the way, I said that aspects of the ghayb are uh, not necessarily, um, uh, be, they are not irrational, but they are beyond rationality. However, there are some aspects of the ghayb, some aspects that are actually fully rational. So for example, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is rational. Belief in the day of judgment is rational because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions rational arguments to affirm the day of judgment. For example, Allah says, do you think that the sinner and the good person are going to be the same? Therefore, belief in the ghayb is something that allows us to have more yaqeen in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, we uh, see this demonstrated in a beautiful hadith that uh, the angels uh, will go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the angels will say that uh, Allah will ask them, how did you leave my servant? And the angel will say, oh, he was asking for Jannah and seeking refuge in Jahannam. So Allah will say, have they seen Jannah? Have they seen Jahannam? And the angels will say, no, they haven't seen it, but they believe in it because of what you have said. So Allah Azza wa Jalla will say, what if they had actually seen it? How much more so, uh, you know, would their passion be? But even the fact that they haven't seen it and they're still pleading and begging and praying, therefore I have forgiven them and granted them Jannah because of their Iman. So here we have Iman in Bil Ghayb putting into action where people are actually praying for Jannah, seeking refuge for Jahannam despite the fact they have not seen it. So belief in Ghayb, you cannot be a believer without believing in Ghayb. And therefore by mentioning these other facets around us, it helps us to understand and to then believe in the Ghayb. And then of course lastly for the believer himself or herself, obviously we accept uh, all that is mentioned in the, uh, in this uh, the, the realm of ghayb in the Quran and Sunnah and it only increases our Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I firmly believe the angels exist I firmly believe it is as Allah Azza wa has described and to merely think and imagine about those magnificent uh, creations of Allah, it increases my Iman, it should increase all of our Iman, so these are some of the uh, benefits of believing in uh, uh, ghayb and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. The second question uh, that uh, Allah has uh, tells us that His promise is the truth, and so He says in the Quran, "فَلَا تَغُرَّنَّكُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا وَلَا يَغُرَّنَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ." Do not be deluded or deceived by the dunya. Do not be deceived by the grand deceiver, meaning Shaytan. The question is. How do we understand and increase our trust in Allah's promise, especially if our current situation seems to show otherwise? For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised the believers will be victorious while the Muslims are currently not uh, victorious, say they seem to be weak or inferior to others. So um, this is a very good question. And in fact, it can be responded to in multiple ways. First and foremost, uh, the verse does not promise 
political victory instantaneously. This is a misunderstanding of the verse. The verse does not promise political victory instantaneously. Let us be careful, let us be very careful and learn from the mistakes of the previous generations and the previous uh, nations. Remember, uh, the children of Israel were expecting uh, the Messiah to come and the Messiah in their minds an imaginary messiah was created who would become a king who would overthrow the romans you know who would establish the kingdom uh, that as had been established in the time of solomon allah did not tell them that uh, the prophets did not tell them that but they started thinking into the scriptures and they started thinking that the scriptures are predicting a political messiah when the actual messiah came and he said to them your kingdom is not of this world it is of the next world he said to them this is not you know how, uh, the you're not intended to establish the kingdom over here. What you're looking for, that's going to come to you in the next. That caused them to reject the message and the messenger. So we have to be very careful that we don't read in more than what is being uh, promised. That Allah Azza wa Jalla says His promise is true. Do you know what is the promise of Allah? Uh, the promise of Allah is His Ridwan, His pleasure, His Jannah. That is the ultimate promise of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Uh, just like in the Quran, uh, that uh, in in the people of the Araf, right? Hal wajatum ma wa'ad rabbukum haqqa. Qalu naam. Did you find the promise of Allah true? Right. And also when the resurrection takes place what does Allah say that the people will say this is the promise of Allah and the prophets are speaking the truth so the ultimate promise of Allah is the promise of his religion being true and the promise of resurrection and the promise of judgment and the promise of heaven and hell that is the ultimate promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now that promise shall always be true indiscriminately upon individuals and upon societies and that promise every human will see the reality of that uh, promise therefore we should understand <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me, we should understand that the ultimate promise of Allah is the truth of what the messengers preached and the truth of uh, the, the resurrection and uh, Allah's judgment and Allah's uh, reward or we seek Allah's refuge, Allah's uh, punishment. At the same time, there is another promise in the Quran which is somewhat of a political one. Allah has promised those that are believers and righteous amongst you that he shall allow them to rule over the land and that he shall substitute their fear for their uh, for uh, um, uh, um, uh, power, safety and security uh, and that he shall give them uh, you know power now some have interpreted this verse to be a specific promise for uh, the Muslims of Mecca that Allah shall give them authority and that is exactly what happened and some have said that this is a promise for every generation that acts in, in this uh, manner. And at the same time, of course, there's a huge condition. Allah has promised those who believe and those who do good deeds. So if enough of a group of people, if enough of a quantity of people truly have belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and implement iman and amal salih, then insha'Allah ta'ala, good can be expected. At the same time, let us not ever forget that many of the early Muslims, they died in uh, as martyrs or they died natural deaths before they saw the establishment of the Medinan uh, society and state and their deaths were not in vain. It is not that Billah, the promise was not meant. No, rather it was that uh, indeed the promise might be there but Allah knows when it might uh, happen. So this notion that the promise of Allah means political strength, it needs to be re uh, thought through. The ultimate promise is that Allah's uh, 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 statements about the hereafter is going to be true. Also, uh, the statement that um, the the uh, the Muslims seem to be, you know, uh, uh, on the weaker side or inferior or whatnot. Once again, we state that uh, political strength is not a sign of moral 
uh, courage. It is not the sign of truth. On the contrary, generally speaking, uh, tyrannical regimes, generally speaking, pharaonic entities are given uh, a time. Remember, the pharaohs of Egypt rule for centuries, and the pharaoh of Musa and his father, they rule for uh, two generations until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought about uh, Musa and the Bani Israel. And by the way, even after Musa and the Bani Israel were saved, the pharaonic dynasty still lived on in Egypt, right? So, so therefore, do not uh, think that it is this world that is the truth will be separated from the falsehood. On the contrary, this world is a world of testing. This world is a world of ibtila. And it is possible that a righteous dies in jail in a, under a tyrannical dictator who lives a very good, luxurious life in this world. This is not the world that the truth is going to be manifested. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really uh, uh, explicitly says in the Quran, all peoples, the good and the bad, we will give from this uh, dunya. That's not the, 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 the test. Rather, the real test. The real fadl of Allah, the real blessings of Allah will be the next and not this one. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. It is the hereafter where the real darajat and the real tafdil is going to come. Never think that the Muslims are inferior just because of political power. Muslims are superior superior because they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they know why they are here because they believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa it is enough of a sharaf enough of an izzah for the Muslim that he believes in Allah and believes in the promise that is where izzah lies izzah does not come from clothing it does not come from how one dresses it does not come from the language that one speaks it does not come from the land that one lives in ultimate izzah comes to know your humanity and to know your God and creator and to know your purpose in life and therefore anyone who says the kalima automatically has izzah that the one who rejects the kalima does not have and uh, that inshallah is a brief response to that uh, question uh, the third question uh, is that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to take shaitan as an enemy. So how much power does shaitan truly have over us and how much of what happens to us is because of shaitan and not because of our own self. So shaitan actually does not have any power per se over us. Shaitan does not control us like robots are controlled. Not at all. Rather, it is very clear in the Quran. Allah is explicit in the Quran. Uh, in Surah Ibrahim, we are told that Shaitan will give, uh, Ibn Qayyim says, the khutbah to Shaitan. Ibn Qayyim says that Shaitan will give a khutbah on the day of judgment. And according to some reports, he will gather all the people. He will stand on a chair or, or whatnot what and gather all the people. And he will give a speech and he will say, Inna Allah wa'adakum wa'ad al haqqi wa wa'adtukum fa That Allah promised you the real promise and I promised you a broken promise, a fake promise. وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي I had no power over you. All that I did was, was I called you and you responded to me. So in reality, shaitan has no actual power over us. However, what shaitan is able to do is to waswasa, seduce intellectually seduce inside of us and so thoughts come and uh, it is also true that sometimes our own souls might also desire and uh, it's it's uh, technically um, of course there are two separate entities that is your soul as uh, uh, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Yusuf that in the nafs al-ammaratun bisu that the soul also entices to um, evil uh, and so you have the soul enticing to evil you have shaitan enticing to evil can you tell the difference between the two our scholars mentioned that there are some signs but in reality for let's leave the signs aside in reality the origins of these waswas does not impact that we must uh, repel both of them and we must live righteous lives and it doesn't matter to us where the origin of the waswas is, whether it is our soul or whether it is shaitan. It does not matter to us. In the end, the net result in the say is the same. And uh, that net result is that we must repel and not act upon those uh, desires. But some of the differences that uh, uh, people mention, our scholars mention, is that if a thought comes out of nowhere, if a thought seems completely like blasphemous, and we are not accustomed to such thoughts at all, and we're wondering ourselves, 
themselves where did this come from it didn't come from you it actually came from uh, shaitan this is in contrast to the one who has accustomed himself to an evil is constantly doing a sin and so the soul becomes attached to the sin and therefore the soul then might entice the person as well and so the point being though regardless of what the origin is both the soul and shaitan they're simply intellectually whispering or I should say mentally whispering I tell you, mentally whispering and in reality they have no actual uh, control and therefore when we get these thoughts, we should always turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Yusuf alayhi salam did uh, when the thoughts came to him. Uh, he said, Allah, that Allah is the one that I seek uh, refuge in and Allah azza wa jal knows best. Uh, the next question in Surah 28 of Surah Fatir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ The question is, well, the, the translation, indeed it is the ulama who truly fear Allah. The question is, is this restricted to the Islamic knowledge or one or can secular knowledge also be included? How important is it to have knowledge in order to establish the fear of Allah? And these days we have access to so much knowledge of Islam through the internet, but unfortunately that doesn't always lead to the fear and taqwa of Allah. What is useful knowledge versus useless knowledge? And how can we consolidate between this ayah and the unfortunate situation of finding some Islamic scholars committing big mistakes? That's a lot of questions and actually these are very, very important questions. So let us see how much we can do uh, uh, given the time that I have. So, is this knowledge restricted to Islamic knowledge? The brutal reality, and I know this is awkward to state, but whenever the Quran or Sunnah praises ilm and ulama, the primary connotation, notice I'm not saying exclusive, the primary connotation is ilm related to Allah and to the sharia of Allah and to the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, the primary connotation of ilm is that which is linked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, there are many evidences for this. Of them is shahid Allahu annahu la ilaha illa huwa wal malaikatu wa ulul ilmi qa'iman bil qist. Allah testifies to the kalima and the angels testify to the kalima and the people of ilm testify to the kalima. Notice the people of ilm, most scientists, many scientists and, 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 and people of you know, research and whatnot, they're agnostic and atheist in our time. Yet Allah is saying the people of ilm because the ilm that is being referenced is the ilm of the soul, the ilm of the kalima, the ilm of tawheed, the ilm of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيَّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ The Quran is clear verses that has been encompassed in the hearts of the people of ilm. So notice the ilm here is the ilm of the uh, Quran. And Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran that uh, These are the parables we give for mankind. It is only the alim who understands these parables of the uh, Quran. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that uh, never does a person uh, leave his house seeking ilm for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except the angels come and surround him you know and uh, uh, Allah azza wa jal makes the path to Jannah easy for him and it's obvious here that the ilm is the ilm of uh, Islam and the ilm of the Quran and the ilm of the Sunnah so uh, the general default is that wherever ilm is mentioned uh, it is primarily for Islamic ilm and that is uh, and therefore uh, when Allah says innama yakhsha Allah min ulama the primary meaning is that those who study uh, the Quran and study the tadabbur of the Quran and study the laws of Islam uh, through that and study of course uh, Allah Azza wa Jal's names and attributes and the seer of the Prophet Sallallahu that knowledge will empower them and help them to increase their fear of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala their love of Allah no one can achieve a high level of hope and love and fear without knowledge because the more you know about Allah the more you will love him the more you will fear him the more you will hope him the less you know obviously it's common sense therefore uh, knowledge directly impacts knowledge directly impacts your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that having been said there is an element I said it primarily applies true there is an element of encompassing any type of knowledge if it is linked to Islamic knowledge and if it is done with the proper paradigm you see a person who doesn't believe in Allah an agnostic an atheist can study 
the most amazing facts about biology, about chemistry, about physics, about astronomy, and it does not impact spiritually at all because they're not coming from that paradigm. It doesn't affect him at all. There's, there's no increase in awe or whatnot. And the Muslim who believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will read in signs everywhere without even formally studying biology. As for the one who studies formally and studies the intricacies of the creation and studies how Allah Azza wa has created these mechanisms, then his iman will increase even more. And that's what Allah says in the Quran, الَّذِينَ يَتَفَكَّرُ um, يتفك, um, uh, That Allah says in the Quran, رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ That they are the ones who reflect on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in that reflection, they increase in their iman. Therefore, Primarily, the verse applies to Islamic knowledge, but not exclusively. So, uh, the the reality as well, of course, what type of knowledge is being referenced here? It is knowledge that is absorbed by the qalb, the heart, and not just knowledge that is recited by the tongue. Iblis had plenty of knowledge that he can recite by the tongue. It didn't benefit him at all. Because what is truly beneficial is knowledge that is absorbed into the heart and then is manifested in the actions. It is manifested in the actions. And this explains why we have access to so much knowledge in our times and yet it does not have the impact on us that it did on previous generations because knowledge doesn't mean regurgitation knowledge does not mean parroting information true knowledge is that which impacts the soul and it is acted upon subhanallah you know these days a total uh, a person who has never studied Islam at all but knows the basics of Arabic and, and downloading and YouTube and whatnot is able to access more books of hadith and more narrations of hadith than all the scholars of hadith of the first two, three, four generations. Uh, and yet, the barakah and the blessings of that person is nothing compared to the blessings of the scholars of the past. The reason being, they valued that knowledge. They acted upon it. And they uh, truly understood its importance. You know, there are many narrations to this regard. You know, some of the sahaba, they traveled an entire month for one hadith. Just one hadith. Imagine the impact that hadith would have they put so much effort into it as well. It is famously narrated from Imam Malik that uh, Imam Malik spent, you know, uh, over 20 years compiling his famous book Al Muwatta, and his uh, methodology, of course, the students would have to write it the, uh, by dictation, right? They would write the entire Muwatta, uh, and so uh, once a student came and took a few weeks, you know, to write the Muwatta with Imam Malik, and Imam Malik, when he finished uh, the the you know the the uh, the writing was finished by the student, Imam Malik said that. It took you two weeks to write the book. It took me, you know, two decades to compile it. How will you possibly appreciate this book, right? And subhanAllah, that student wrote every hadith by hand under Imam Malik himself. And Imam Malik basically remarks, how will you appreciate it? We can download it in 10 milliseconds and we have PDFs of the Muwatta. And you think we're going to appreciate it, right? So it's not a matter of access to the knowledge. It is a matter of appreciating the knowledge. And it is a matter of truly acting upon it. And that is why real knowledge is that which is acted upon. And that's why as well uh, that uh, our Prophet ﷺ would seek refuge in Allah from knowledge that is not beneficial. And he would ask for knowledge that is beneficial. So beneficial knowledge is that which is appreciated, that which is absorbed by the qalb, and that which is acted upon by the limbs. Uh, the, the last part of this question is that how do we consolidate between this ayah and between the unfortunate situation of uh, we see we're seeing certain you know scholars doing things that are problems and whatnot. So actually this is a very deep topic as well. And uh, I have uh, my views that um, you know they might be slightly different uh, than the not not radically different but I think we also have to uh, understand multiple things first and foremost scholars are humans okay scholars are human beings no scholar is an angel no scholar is an angel and therefore we as well have to lower our expectations of what exactly uh, a, a person of knowledge uh, can and cannot uh, do 
all scholars without exception uh, because they're human they will be making uh, mistakes they will be making judgment call errors they'll be sometimes speaking beyond their area of expertise uh, they will get impetuously angry act rashly sometimes act rudely this is human nature you know they might get irritated for something and they all commit sins as well because they are all human beings they are not angels uh, we hope that their sins are less we hope that their sins are their repentance to Allah is stronger we hope that they are monitoring you know more than others but in the end of the day scholars are human beings uh, also uh, as we said real scholarship is that which is absorbed by the heart and acted upon simply being able to quote does not guarantee that one is an alim in the spiritual sense one might be an alim in the technical sense one might pass the exams and know the materials and we seek Allah's refuge from that but the real alim is the one who absorbs and then embodies also, let me just say this again clearly for the record, and that is that we need to be brave enough, uh, we need to be brave enough and accurate enough to not lump all mistakes into one category. And I think this is something that uh, this is not the time to go into, but I have spoken about this very clearly in other lectures, that uh, it is a mistake of the highest magnitude to make scholars infallible number one or to at least treat them like that and then number two to make any mistake equivalent to the worst mistake imaginable we have to be brave enough to be frank enough to discuss spectrums of mistakes and certain mistakes are far worse and others are very bad and others are slip-ups so we need to be brave enough to discuss this entire spectrum and uh, help inshallah ta'ala those that are on the smaller slip-ups right a slip-up a mistake an anger statement or whatever and i don't want to give too many examples but you get my point here that uh, uh, something that is not uh, uh, egregious and of course, what that is, we have to have that discussion. And it's a one-off, for example. Uh, this is something that we should be frank and say, okay, let's see, does this this person, uh, is he a threat to... to and let me give you a simple example that inshallah will help uh, uh, clarify. That suppose we were to discover somebody uh, that you know we look up to, a trustee of the masjid or whatever, somebody that's supposed to have a, a good position, that we seek Allah's refuge, but you know he's uh, smoking a cigarette, let's say, right? I um, mean, smoking is definitely something that is not healthy, it's not good, it should not be done, you know, but it is a private sin that he's doing in the privacy of his life, right? Does that mean that we strip him away from uh, being, if he's active on the board, or he's helping the community, or he's, you know, um, uh, doing a volunteer work for the masjid, do we say, oh, because we somebody saw you smoking a cigarette and I'm giving a, an example that's a bit easier to deal with so that we understand is that the same as somebody who billah, was embezzling funds from the masjid is the two the same obviously not if that is the case then why can't we understand the same applies for crimes of a moral nature as well right there should be a spectrum and we should be brave enough to have a frank uh, conversation in this uh, regard and uh, understand that uh, not all mistakes are the same definitely some mistakes no compromise and we are very clear that if somebody goes down a certain path or whatnot and crosses a certain red line for example then there is no compromise and so we do it on a case-by-case -case basis but the bottom line in this regard is that uh, scholars are human beings and not everybody who can regurgitate facts is necessary in alim in the spiritual uh, sense um, the next question that we have over here is that The next question we have is in Surah, uh, uh, in Surah Fatir, verse 8. Allah says that that the example of the one whose sins became adorned for him so that he considers those sins to be good. How can we build our internal compass to be able to see beyond the adornment of sin and the true reality of the sin itself? Very good question. Multiple things. First and foremost, accompanying the righteous being amongst the people of taqwa and virtue you know we are people who are socially conditioned we are people who are weak we are people who just like the Quraysh just like the people of Mecca when Islam came with Tawheed what did they say they said we found our forefathers doing something else our society did something else so we have to be careful and we have to understand especially living in the world that we live in that fahisha and evil has become so prevalent that 
all too often we will begin to absorb those ideas without even realizing it. So by accompanying the people of taqwa, by accompanying the people of virtue, by accompanying the people of iman, it automatically has an impact on us. Secondly, one of the ways that we need to avoid this is by in our own personal lives avoiding sin. So Allah says in the Quran that um, uh, whoever continuously does evil, he begins commanding others to do that evil. That do not follow the whisperings of shaitan or the footsteps of shaitan. Whoever follows the footsteps of shaitan begins to command others to do it as well. So the one who keeps on drinking, 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 the one who becomes habitual drunkard, he will say, what's the big deal? Uh, why is this a sin? And that's because he himself is involved in it. So therefore, the one who is himself doing a sin all the time, therefore they might also go down this uh, path. And then of course, the third way to make sure that we do not fall down this path is very important and that is ikhlas and sincerity to Allah, dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, constant ihdina sirat al-mustaqim, constant dua to Allah to keep us firm, to keep us upon the straight path. And you know, anybody who is sincere to Allah, anybody who is genuinely sincere will not have a problem with the internal moral compass even if they commit a mistake. A uh, question that we have here is that uh, Allah says that whoever seeks izza, that know that Allah has izza. Uh, so what is the difference between izza through Allah and izza through anything else? And what are the ramifications of seeking izza through means other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So uh, ultimate izza is of course uh, honor and glory belongs to Al-Aziz. Al-Aziz is the one who confers izza. And so ultimate izza is the uh, recognition and love from Al-Aziz and from those whom Al-Aziz loves. That is the ultimate izzah. The ultimate honor is to be honored by those who are worthy. You want their honor. So if people who are impious, if people that are evil honor you, that is not izzah. That is not izzah that we're interested in. It is a fake izzah. It is a shallow izzah. Ultimate izzah is to be honored by Al-Aziz. And of course, that izzah will come by recognizing who is Al-Aziz and by lowering our heads to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by being ultimate worshippers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, a corollary of ultimate izzah, a corollary of this, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, then those whom Allah loves also loves. And so, amazing thing. When Allah loves somebody and when Allah wants to confer honor on somebody, automatically the people will support and love. And as for the one whose izza comes from fake things like money, like fame, like prestige, that is an izza that is superficial. And it will go as soon as the man goes. It will go with, and you know, the simplest example of this, you know, the simplest example of this is that if you were to ask the Muslims that who do you know of Islamic history? Mention to me names. Just leave it like this. Who do you know of Islamic history? Mention anybody famous, anybody respected for the last, you know, uh, the medieval years of Islam, yani after the time of the Sahaba and before modernity. Who do you know? Look at the names that will come. Imam al-Bukhari, Imam al-Ghazali, Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, you know, you're going to mention uh, the great scholars, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, right? Okay, good question here is that how many politicians and sultans and millionaires, how many uh, prime ministers and, and, and uh, dynasties came and went? When Imam al-Bukhari was living, right? Which dynasty was in, was in charge? Who knows this? Who knows this? It was the Samanids, by the way. Who knows this? What was the name of the main Khalifa or the Sultan? Nuh, uh, whose name was Nuh, by the way. Who knows this? Nobody knows at all. The average person has no clue or concern, even though when uh, the Samanids were in power, everybody knew their name. Everybody, quote unquote, feared and loved them. Everybody admired them. It was a superficial admiration, an admiration based upon fame and power and wealth. This is the difference between the izza through Allah and the izza through fame and wealth. Is that in the long run, it is izza through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is going to uh, last. The next question we have here is that um, in ayahs 15 to 16, Allah reminds us who is in need as who is independent and living through the pandemic 
and we're awaiting a vaccine, it is evident how truly we're in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now that the vaccine is on the horizon, some may fall into a false sense of relief and security. How do we avoid lulling ourselves into this false sense of security and constantly reminding ourselves that we are in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? SubhanAllah, this is a very good uh, question. And it is one that I recently gave a khutbah on as well. You will find it online. Uh, that Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, Ya Nasu antumul fuqara ilallahi wallahu huwal ghaniyul hamid. That we are all fuqara to Allah. And Allah is the one who is al-ghani and the one who is al-hamid. And uh, this notion of feeling a sense of, of uh, uh, superiority now over uh, our past selves, feeling a sense of complacency. This is a constant struggle of our lives. It's not just about the pandemic. It is a constant struggle. And Allah mentions this in the Quran that anytime a calamity strikes, anytime a disaster happens, that man is so weak that they call to Allah standing and sitting and lying down. They call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in fear and in hope. And as soon as Allah answers, they turn away. As soon as their calamity is lifted up, they do not worship the way that they were worshiping. And this is a constant problem, the weakness of us as human beings, that we uh, cannot see that we are in constant need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that verse actually is so powerful. O mankind, all of you are constantly in need of Allah. And this is a key point here. The fact that a person might be rich or poor does not change the fact that they are in need of Allah constantly. The fact that a person is healthy doesn't mean he doesn't need Allah and that the one who is sick needs Allah. No, all of mankind is equally dependent upon Allah at every instance of their existence. It is but an illusion that when I'm healthy, I don't need Allah. Question, who made us healthy? Who made us healthy? Was it me or was it you? It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, we need to uh, overcome this illusion that just because I am wealthy and healthy that I need Allah less. No, we need Allah the same constantly at every instance of our lives. It is simply our weakness that when something pinches, I turn to Allah. And when something doesn't pinch, I'm not turning to Allah. We need to turn to Allah in every instance of our lives. Uh, lives. Uh, time is finishing up for me, so let me finish up uh, the question over here as well. Uh, that uh, 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 we'll, we'll go on to the, the, the last question over here. That any personal reflections on Surah Fatir that you would like to uh, share? Uh, surah Fatir for me is definitely one of my uh, favorite surahs. It is a powerful surah. It's a, a moving uh, surah. And there are a number of key passages that really resonate with me immensely. And of them, of course, is uh, the one that I just recited. Ya ayyuhun nasu, antumul fuqara ila Allahi, wallahu huwal ghaniyul hamid. In yasha yudhibkum wa yati bi khalqin jadeed, wa ma thalik ala Allahi bi aziz. That's a very powerful verse. Uh, and also uh, of the uh, verses uh, that uh, I find to be extremely, they resonate with me, is that Allah says, ثُمَّ أَوْرَثْنَا الْكِتَابَ الَّذِينَ اصْطَفَيْنَا مِنْ عِبَادِنَا We then allowed our chosen servants to inherit the book. Right? So Allah is saying we bless certain people with the book. And then Allah says that uh, uh, that uh, there are three categories, right? فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مُخْتَصِدٌ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخِرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Three categories. One group did wrong to themselves and they didn't act righteously. The second group are muqtasid, average, so-so. The third group are racing forward. So Allah divides the Muslims into three categories. Which category are you going to be in? That's something you need to think about. ظَالِمُ لِنَفْسِهِ مُقْتَصِدْ سَابِقٌ بِالْخِرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ And then uh, in the next few uh, verses, Allah Azza wa mentions one of my favorite verses in the Quran that uh, Allah speaks about the people that are entering Jannah. وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبَ عَنَّ الْحَزَنِ إِنَّ رَبَّنَا لَغَفُورٌ شَكُورٌ This is such a powerful verse and I quote this verse to myself when I'm feeling grief or anxiety for any reason. Allah says when the people enter Jannah, that is when they will thank Allah for having removed anxiety and grief from them. Hazan or Huzn will only be removed permanently when we enter Jannah. This world 
is a world of anxiety and grief. This world shall always give us certain problems and issues. It is only in the next world, when we enter the next world, that is when we will say to Allah, inshaAllah ta'ala, Alhamdulillah alladhi adhaba anna al-hazan. From now on, there is nothing to worry about. From now on, there shall no, be no grief and no cause for any discomfort. Verily, Allah is ghafoor and shakoor. Allah is ghafoor. He forgave our sins or else we would not be here. And Allah is shakoor. Whatever meager things we have done, He magnified and He made it much bigger and better. And therefore, He blessed us more than we deserved and He forgave us the sins that we did. And because of that, we're able to enter Jannah. Therefore, I pray that I and you all of us will be of those who make this dua that Alhamdulillah alladhi adhaba anna al-hazan inna rabbana laghafoorun shakoor alladhi ahallana daru al-muqamati min fadlihi la yamassuna fiha nasabun wa la yamassuna fiha lughub May Allah make us amongst those people who say this as they enter Jannah wa akhru da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Jazakum Allah khair, Sheikh Nal Fadil, Dr. Yasser Qadi. Barakallahu feek, may Allah bless you and your family and reward you immensely for your efforts with this knowledge retreat and all of our speakers as well. Inshallah, this concludes the question and answer session. We will have one more session at uh, 8.30 Central with uh, Dr. Omar Sulaiman. No God, no glory. In the meantime, uh, uh, a word from our sponsors. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. You don't know me, but I know you. I am a refugee and an orphan. And you are the person who helps me every year. You make sure I have food to eat and a place to sleep. You make sure that I'm taken care of when there is no one to take care of me. And you have given me hope for the future. I'm not the only one who needs help. There are many more that need someone to care for them. Donate now. Thank you for being there for us. أتمنى أنكم تجيبون نماذج أنا بناشد العالم بناشدكم كلها كن تجيبون نماذج كل الجمعيات بتمنى أنكم تسمعوا نداءنا والأطفال كلها تبع عند الجزائر يعني تطلع بالشحات لبرا
are the millions of displaced refugees living in camps worldwide. For us, winter is a battlefield that we're ill-equipped for. Our tents are not insulated and our bodies are exposed to the harsh elements. In the depths of a cold winter night, our beds don't provide any safety from the freezing temperature. And because of this, many of us will become sick and some of us may not survive until spring, especially the kids. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. You don't know me, but I know you. I am a refugee and an orphan. And you are the person who helps me every year. You make sure I have food to eat and a place to sleep. You make sure that I'm taken care of when there is no one to take care of me. And you have given me hope for the future. I'm not the only one who needs help. There are many more that need someone to care for them. Donate now. Thank you for being there for us. أتمنى أنكم تجيبوا لنا مازوف، أنا بناشد العالم بناشدكم كلياتكم تجيبوا لنا مازوف، كل الجمعيات بتمناكم تسمعوا نداءنا، والأطفال كلياتها ما عندها جزامة عم تطلع بالشحات لبرا. We are 
with the millions of displaced refugees living in camps worldwide. For us, winter is a battlefield that we're ill-equipped for. Our tents are not insulated and our bodies are exposed to the harsh elements. In the depths of a cold winter night, our beds don't provide any safety from the freezing temperature. And because of this, many of us will become sick and some of us may not survive until spring, especially the kids. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. You don't know me, but I know you. I am a refugee and an orphan. And you are the person who helps me every year. You make sure I have food to eat and a place to sleep. You make sure that I'm taken care of when there is no one to take care of me. And you have given me hope for the future. I'm not the only one who needs help. There are many more that need someone to care for them. Donate now. Thank you for being there for us. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear brothers and sisters, uh, respected elders and honorable guests, welcome to the final session of the seventh annual uh, Mass Knowledge Retreat. Uh, inshallah, we pray that the uh, khitamuhu misk with uh, our esteemed uh, speaker, Dr. Omar Sulaiman, uh, with the uh, topic, No God, No Glory. And of course, this is a play on words, it can be taken with K N O W or N O. Uh, every single human being, without exception, is in pursuit of certain goals. And these goals revolve around different ambitions. Some involve money, some involve power, fame, intimacy, wealth. And these goals ultimately help us in our pursuit towards glory. The question is, where do we find that glory? Where is our pursuit of that glory? And what happens when that pursuit of that glory is in contradiction to the pursuit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the highlight of this talk will involve the ayah, Man kana yuridul izza, fa lillahi al-izza tu jami'ah. 
Our speaker is Dr. Omar Sulaiman, the president of Yaqeen Institute for Islamic Research and professor of Islamic studies at Southern Methodist University. He's also a resident scholar of the Valley Ranch Islamic Center and co-chair of Faith Forward Dallas at Thanksgiving Square, a multi-faith alliance for peace and justice. Uh, before, uh, before we begin uh, the topic uh, and the, uh, the session with Dr. Omar Sulaiman, I just wanted to tell you, Akhi, uh, before we begin, uh, I read your uh, post online about uh, uh, one of your father's uh, best friends passing away, uh, Dr. Nabil Fayyad. So I wanted to uh, just make a dua for him that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him and forgives him and grants him uh, uh, Jannah al firdaus And I hope that all of our viewers say ameen to this dua. Barakallahu feek. Fatafaddal mashkoor. And jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair for beginning that way. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So actually, um, I was going to start off by just praising Mass and thanking you all for putting this together despite the pandemic. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you because uh, just like with everything else, Mass uh, shows ihsan, alhamdulillah, even in the midst of a pandemic. So the way that you all have put this program together is flawless. And may Allah reward you all and increase you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to gather next year, inshallah ta'ala, uh, physically for a convention that I always uh, look forward to. And may Allah azza gather us around our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Jannah al firdaus Allahumma ameen. ameen. Secondly, in regards to actually um, uh, Dr. Nabil Fayyad, uh, I do want to mention, since you brought him up, that uh, it's a mass family, mashallah, in Arizona. So um, alhamdulillah, his family is very involved in mass. And of course, they're part of the Muslim family regardless, and also the mass family um, specifically. May Allah reward them and bless them and, and bless all of those pioneers that leave behind great legacies that inspire us to continue to do good. Allahumma ameen. So inshallah ta'ala, uh, with this short time uh, that I have with you all uh, tonight, I wanted to talk about this concept of izza um, from a few different angles. And I'll start with the most predictable angle, if you will, which is this idea that, you know, both established in the Quran and the Sunnah, this idea that true honor only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, true glory only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And not just that, but if you seek that glory through anything else, you will inevitably be disappointed and disgraced. And those two things are, are different, by the way. Um, they come together, but they are different. They're different in what sense? When a person thinks that the path of success is in something other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they place their tawakkul, their trust in that final product, then when they get to the end and it does not give them what they wanted it to give them, there's a sense of disappointment. There's a sense of disappointment. And I remember, um, you know, and, and uh, I've mentioned this about one of uh, my beloved teachers, Sheikh Hatman Hajj, Dr. Hatman Hajj, Hafizahullah Ta'ala. Uh, he was targeted by Islamophobes in a nasty smear campaign and, um, you know, was, was uh, practicing at the Mayo Clinic at the time, pediatrician at the Mayo Clinic, and they went after his job. And uh, it, was a very dis it was a very nasty campaign. And I remember visiting our beloved Sheikh and seeing how comforted he was and how contented he was. And I remember the words that he told me, you know, having suffered greatly at the hands of that vicious smear campaign, he, you know, I, I was shocked by how content he was and how calm he was. And he didn't seem really phased at all. And he said that the only way this dunya can disappoint you is if you have expectations of it. If you don't have expectations of this dunya, it really can't disappoint you. The problem is when you have expectations of it and then it doesn't give you what you seek of it. And so there is disappointment and then there is disgrace, especially if a person allows for their pursuit of this dunya to make them unprincipled, to uh, lead them into cheating, to lead them into doing things that are disgraceful then they end off disgraced. So those are two things, right? The difference of those two in comparison to the pursuit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that the believer is contented by knowing that when they pursue Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if they don't reach the final goal, the final output, 
then they know they are successful so long as they die in a pursuit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so long as they put forth their best effort. So when it comes to the world, the worldly things, whether it is seeking validation from people, whether it is the pursuit of materialism, uh, whether it is the pursuit of prominence, whatever it may be, there's the time and effort wasted and the expectations that lead to you uh, being in a great state of disappointment at the end, as well as the disgrace that comes at the end of it. Because, you know, even if you got it all, you realize that it really wasn't that much. It really wasn't worth it. Whereas when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if a person pursues Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and pursues a sense of actualization, self-actualization and validation and, and, and uh, power, not in the sense of dominating someone else, no power in the sense of having izzah, dignity through the pursuit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that even if it does not materialize in some sort of tangible accomplishment in this world, as long as a person meets Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having been in that pursuit, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them the ta'ala the greatest reward, which is the reward of al-Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant it to us all. Allahumma ameen. Now the predictable or the or, or the foundational way of looking at the subject. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions wala yakhafuna laumatalaam. They do not fear the blame of the blamers. Um, you know, in, in the hierarchy of needs and Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and Dr. Rania uh, Awad actually just did a, a series at Yaqeen Institute on the history of Muslim mental health and talked about how some of these theories and hierarchies and, and systems were actually extracted from um, early works that were done by uh, Muslim scholars in the field. Self actualization is considered the highest, right? That a person gets to that point. They don't fear the blame of the blamers, means that you are so settled in your sense of purpose, that so long as what you have been diminished in is not a diminishing of that purpose, is not chipping away at what gives you motivation, at what gives you validation, at what gives you your steam and gives you your satisfaction, then you're okay. You're okay. Uh, the greatest example of that, or one of the most popular examples of وَلَا يَخَافُونَ لَوْمَ تَلَاءَ مَشَيْخُ لِسَانَ بِنْ تَيْمِيَ رَحِيمُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى When you know, he is uh, placed in the situation where, you know, his outcome in, in the worldly sense is going to be bad no matter what, but he only sees one outcome, which is the outcome of Allah's pleasure. So you can't take away something from him that you don't have access to, okay? And when he says, what can my enemies do to me? قَتْلِ shahada, uh, You kill me, it is martyrdom. You imprison me, it is a chance to be secluded with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's khalwa with Allah azza You deport me, send me out in the land, it is a chance to explore the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what does he say? My jannah is in my heart, right? My garden is in my heart. And so therefore, those that were trying to persecute him could not access what was important to him, Right? And that drives them crazier than anything else because you can't break his spirit because you can't access it. And the believer has that garden in their hearts, that jannah of yaqeen in the sense of certainty, right? Jannah to yaqeen or, or paradise in this life is having yaqeen as having certainty in Allah's uh, paradise and Allah's promise in your heart. And that, of course, materializes in the jannah in the hereafter, okay? So you can't access the garden in my heart with your insults. You can't access it with your persecution. You could even take me out of this life by killing me, but you still would not be able to access what you were trying to access because the garden that is in my heart is not one that is limited by the dimensions of this world. In fact, its true dimensions are only perceived in the hereafter. And so what, what Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah is saying, you can't really hurt me, okay, because... I'm settled in something that cannot be taken by persecution or by insult or by anything like that. And that is the, that is a station that a person should seek out in their lives. So they don't fear the blame of the blamers. That means that, you know, they're able to move forward. They're able to continue along the way with their purpose without being deterred by the blame of the blamers. Not anyone can claim that they don't fear the blame of the blamers. 
when do you know that you fear the blame of the blamers? When you stop yourself from doing what's right or saying what's right because you don't want to face the consequences of, of doing or saying what's right, okay? That's when you have indeed showed instead that you fear the blame of the blamers. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not make us of those people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to constantly uh, move forward and to do what is right, no matter what, to say what is right, no matter what, and to say it and do it in the ways that are most pleasing to him. Allahumma ameen. So that is when it comes to the, uh, you know, uh, the, the Quran. Now, an element from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then I'm going to actually go into some detail, inshallah ta'ala, of some of the more intricate points. An element of the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is very interesting because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentions man tawadha whoever lowers themselves for Allah, wa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates that person. What's very interesting about this is that what do you, what's the image that comes to your mind when you think of courage, when you think of dignity? It's probably a sense of pride. I'm going to speak the truth. Right, I'm going to speak the truth no matter what. Okay, um, and that's not that's not always a bad thing, right? I'm speaking the truth is a good thing, but uh, the opposite side of that is actually stemming from the same noble intention and pursuit, which is seeking your glory only from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So, if you see a person, for example, who lowers themselves for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and what that means is that they endure all sorts of insults. And they let the angels defend them instead. Okay, they don't defend themselves. They let the angels defend them instead. Now, to the eye of a person who, again, is limited by the worldly dimensions. How are they limited by the worldly dimensions? Because they see victory only as victory in this life. And so say, why isn't that person responding? Why don't you say anything back? And they might perceive that that person is the lead, that that person is actually humiliated. And in reality, that person is only honoring themselves in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, it, you know, they don't fear the blame of the blamers, you know, gives you the imagery of a person that speaks the truth in very, very uncomfortable circumstances, right? And that is ultimately still a person that is celebrated. That's a person that stands out, right? That's a person that you look at and you say, mashallah, that person's speaking the truth. The other side of that, though, is a person lowers themselves for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So it's not just... Uh, before it's a'izzatin ala al-kafirin, adillatin ala al-mu'mineen, right? A'izzatin ala al-kafirin. So the, the, the way that they show humility and humbleness and um, allow for certain things to happen when those things do not affect their cause, but in fact, only chip away at nafs. And you see, and, and you see the portrayal. And again, you might think like, wow, this person is really being humiliated. This person is not standing up for themselves. This person is not defending themselves. This person is this, this, that. If I was that person, I would have taught that, I would have taught that other person a lesson. You know, right? I'm gonna go online and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. And like uh, you know, we get like the 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 Twitter battles or whatever social media outlet, right? I'm gonna throw dirt right back at that person, they throw dirt back at me. You say, no, you know, that I'm gonna show that person. And subhanAllah, the Prophet وسلم, is saying what? That that person who tawadha alillah, who lowered themselves for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is just like the person who elevated themselves for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? Because it wasn't about nafs when they were speaking the truth, nor was it about nafs when they held back their tongue from defending themselves. It was about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the whole time. And that's a powerful concept, you know, because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa mentions what? The one who gives for Allah and the one who withholds for Allah, all right? Now, here's the thing. We are all inherently imbalanced people. We're all inherently imbalanced people. And you want people in your life that are going to help you with your imbalance. Okay? Meaning what? Some characteristics of Islam will come easy to you. Okay? Will come easy to you based on some good traits that you have. Other characteristics might be hard for you. They might be bitter for you. So, for example, you find it easy to spend for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because Allah has put in you and you have nurtured a goodness of generosity, a sense of generosity, right? So you spend for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You spend for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're asked and you are someone that naturally is a very generous person. Karam is, is, is a quality, generosity is a quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts inside of you. When does it become sinful? 
when you start to put yourself in debt, when you start to spend on people that, uh, you know, or, or spend, uh, you know, in, in a way that there's corruption, bribery, um, you know, it could be that, you know, like, let's say that you are in charge of a certain amount of money and you betray Amanat so that you can continue to spend on different people and uh, gain the favor of people. On the other hand, withholding for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means what? You know, we all know this, like a good parent, okay, a good parent. And usually that's why parents are uh, are to be te a team, right? Because uh, both the father and the mother are going to be imbalanced in some respects. And sometimes they do have to play good cop, bad cop, but they can't undermine each other. You know, <laughs> they have to support one another, not undermine each other. Uh, or else the kid is just going to play the parents against each other, Right. But one person is going to be a, bit, a little bit harsher sometimes. And then, you know, what do you want? Ideally, you want the child to go to the other parent. And then that parent will give them perspective in a way that doesn't turn them against the other parent, but instead helps them gain a more wholesome picture. But you might employ a different tone, a different attitude to reach the same murad, to reach the same place, which is what? The goodness of the child. So you withhold for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, you withhold for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I'll give you an example, and I think I, I, I gave this example in a different context with uh, Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu last year, that someone mentioned to Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, the people of Fitna, as they were going after Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and they said that you, uh, you know, they accused him of taking money from Baytul Mal and spending on his family. Uthman was very generous with his family, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, right? But he never took from Baytul Mal. And in fact, he put so much money into the awqaf, into the endowments of the Muslims, right? He was the most generous of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu So as he declared himself free of that accusation, what did they say? They say they said, but Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he, uh, he withholds, he used to withhold from his relatives, right? Like you find a situation of Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he had a different style with his family, right? A different style with his children. And what did Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu say? He said that Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu withheld from his family. And uh, he did that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I spend on my family and I do that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we're both right. We're both right. It's a powerful example. You know, so we balance out our characteristics. Now, when would Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu be sinful? Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu would have been sinful had he been guilty of the accusations that they threw his way. And of course he was not, right? When would Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu have been sinful if Umar radiallahu anhu failed in his duties as a father and as a husband? He did not fail at his duties, but he wanted to instill a certain mindset and tarbiyah in his children that, uh, you know, of of of, uh, of, ifa, of, of, um, of zuhud, of asceticism is the word that I'm looking for, right? So he would have descended in the sinful if, if he withheld from them at a point that he was not fulfilling the hukuk. The rights that they had. But the point is that they were both seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were both seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, whoever loves and whoever hates for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean, right? Now, if you want to hate somebody and you hate them for something else, you can easily turn it into hate for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because each one of us has some sins that can cause us to say, I'm going to hate that person for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> Right? But the reality is, is that that's not where it's coming from. You know, the very famous incident of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, where um, he was in the midst of a battle and a man spit in his face just as he was about to kill him. And, and he he stopped and he held himself back. And it was because he said, I was going to kill you for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but I, I held back because of, uh, you know, now it was going to be for myself, right? It would have come from a place of nafs, okay? So a person has to really deeply interrogate their intentions, their motives, what they are seeking. When it comes to the sense of izza, it is that you are always seeking honor for the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's always not about you, okay? You quote the uh, saying of Umar uh, ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, very famous statement, that we are a people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honor through Islam and if we seek that honor through anything else, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will surely humiliate us. Now, we have to remember that's, that 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 ghayr Allah, that other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could also be you, your nafs, okay? That you're seeking uh, something, uh, you know, uh, for, for yourself other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you look at, for example, the Quraysh, right? And the different tribes of the Quraysh. 
some of them would have readily accepted Islam if the Prophet ﷺ gave them the same access to power through Islam that tribalism gave them because they were feeding the nafs. It wasn't about the idols. The idols were tools to the nafs, okay? The idols were tools to themselves. And so when they tried to negotiate with the Prophet ﷺ, if the Prophet ﷺ would give them the same access to power and domination and the lack of accountability, that's what they were seeking, right? So it wouldn't have been for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just like it wasn't, it wasn't, it was never about the idols for them. It was about their nufus, about themselves. And so it's important for us to interrogate ourselves. We do things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We speak for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are silent for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are uh, activated for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We give for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We withhold for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? You try to always make it about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a, a saying from, I believe it was Ali Allah ta'ala anhu that he was praising a man who would always look to his nafs and he would say, whatever my nafs didn't want me to do, I did the opposite. Uh, or whatever my nafs wanted me to do, I did the opposite of what my nafs wanted me to do, right? So you, you speak when your nafs tells you, shh. You are silent when your nafs tells you speak, roar. And, you're, and you're, your nafs is telling you, go ahead and roar. You'll be seen as a line of pride. And that's when you counter it. Or your nafs tells you, uh, withhold it, you know, don't say anything. And you speak despite your nafs telling you, to withhold. Now, obviously, this takes deep introspection and working on yourself and making sure that you constantly, constantly interrogate your intentions, your motives, what you are seeking and who you are seeking from. So you only seek from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You only seek for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the bounds either way, once again, just like I mentioned, spending and withholding, uh, the bounds of haya, the bounds of modesty stop at allowing haram. And the bounds of uh, izzah stop at arrogance and pride. Okay, so haya, which is modesty and shyness, which is an inherently good quality. The Prophet Sallallahu had that quality, right? He was the most bashful of people, but it stops at allowing haram. And the bounds of izzah, of honor and dignity, stop at arrogance and pride. You have to control them, keep them between those two bounds so that they are not contradicting or conflicting uh, with one another. And so you'll find, you know, and, and I'll give a, a few more examples. I'm going to talk about my favorite hadith on this subject, actually, because the, uh, this was the hadith that came to my mind with no God, as in K-N-O-W, no God, and you will know glory. Um, so before I get to that hadith, you know, was the Prophet wasallam not showing izzah? when he did not make an example out of Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul or some of those enemies in Fatah Mecca or uh, Ghawrath ibn Harith who attacked the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet Sallallahu did not attack him when he stood on top of him and he could have done so. Was the Prophet Sallallahu not showing a sense of Izza, or was he actually sh the epitome of Izza? When the Prophet Sallallahu signed the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, for example, and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam allowed for his name to be removed, or Rasulullah to be removed from the Hudaybiyah Treaty. Was it that the Prophet ﷺ was not showing Izza? It certainly, again, to, to a simplistic eye, it could have been that the Prophet ﷺ is accepting humiliation. And no, just you should speak the truth. You should demand, command. Not a single word is going to be removed from this treaty. No, it's, it has to say, it has to say exactly what it said. Nothing is being erased from here. Because to erase it here is going to be humiliation for us. And we are a people of Izza. Could have been seen that way to a person's eye, to even a very sincere person, right? But here's the thing. His Izza was not in his name being on the treaty. His Izza when, was in his mission to spread the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that it would be successful, okay? So, the, so it's actually the opposite of it. That the Prophet took no, iz, took no pride in his name being on something. And that's why That's why his name was elevated, because his life was for Allah. You know, remember, the Prophet does not give us a good quality, except that the Prophet is the epitome of that quality. You are on an exalted standard of character. So when the Prophet says, that whoever lowers himself for Allah, Allah elevates them, who did that more than the Prophet It wasn't about the Prophet ﷺ being celebrated, his name being celebrated. It was about Allah's name being elevated. And because of that, 
he, you know, any person who is who who dedicates themselves to Al-Aziz, who Aziz and Bi'izzatillah, then that person will be made Aziz, will be made honorable by the honor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why no one is more honored than the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because no one lived that reality more than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it wasn't about his name on the treaty. It was about the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. Uh, everyone knowing the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's exactly what happened, right? That's exactly what happened. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had the foresight, he had the vision to see things through and to not be deterred and to not be discouraged by anything of that sort. Now, the last thing, inshallah ta'ala, and I'll end with this before we go to Q&A. Uh, what is the hadith that comes to my mind when I was given the title of this particular session and what matches up with, uh, with this, um, I think with the overall theme of this knowledge retreat? Um, you know, because we're talking about Al-Aziz Al-Hamid and ultimately, what Al-Aziz Al-Hamid means that you only have Izzah when you seek it from Al-Aziz, you only are praiseworthy when you seek it from Al-Hamid, from the one who needs no praise, who is inherently uh, praised even if no one praises him. He is Al-Hamid. There's one hadith that came to my mind. It's one of the most famous hadiths in Islam. It's the incident of the Prophet Sallallahu with Ibn Abbas Sallallahu Ta'ala Anhu and Abdullah ibn Abbas Sallallahu Ta'ala Anhu mentions that I and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi were riding together and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he turned around and he faced me entirely. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Ya Ghulam, inni wa'allimuka kalimat. Oh, young man, let me teach you some words. Be mindful of Allah and Allah will protect you. Be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you will find him in front of you. If you ask, ask Allah. And if you seek help, then seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And know that if the entire ummah was to gather together to benefit you with something, they would not be able to benefit you with anything unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written that for you. The Prophet said that if all of them were to gather together to harm you with something, they would not be able to harm you with anything unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had allowed that to come your way. The pens have been lifted and the pages have dried. Um, I think about this, uh, this profound hadith in so many different ways. Number one, uh, the Prophet is saying this to Abdullah ibn Abbas عنه, who is the most eloquent of people, the most knowledgeable of people. He's going to grow up and his home will become a uni- the first university of Islam. He's Habrul Ummah. You know, they said that when you looked at Abdullah ibn Abbas عنه, الناس, I said he's the most beautiful of people. Then when he spoke, I said he's the most eloquent of people. Uh, and when he expounded on things, he's the most knowledgeable of people. And then when he solved problems, he's the most wise of people, right? Like he had it all. And the Prophet ﷺ is telling him, don't put any of your dependency on the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, but instead be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he and, and I want to go through this. Be mindful of Allah, Allah will protect you. So there's hifth being protected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That means no one can persecute you. No one can harm you if you're mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the Ibn Taymiyyah rank that we were talking about. Be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will find him in front of you. And if you ask, you ask of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you seek help, then you seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the entire religion, right? The entire Madaraj al-Salikin of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala is about what, right? It's between iyyak and abudu wa iyyak and astain. You alone we worship and from you alone we seek help. When you only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you only truly seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You put your ask in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that comes from what? It comes from, for, first from a place of hifth to, to, to be mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then to deeply nourish yourself with that mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point that as you face, whether it is the praise of people or the attacks of people, whether you face a challenge or an ease. You put Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You you direct your longing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through worship, 
you direct your seeking of aid from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Everything of the religion, when it comes to pride and when it comes to showing off and ostentation, all of it comes back to It is completely breaking yourself in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's where true izzah comes from. That's where true honor and true dignity comes from. That I worship Allah alone, I seek, I seek aid from Allah alone, that I put my entire notion of success in whether or not I am doing the things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and am pleasing and Allah is pleased with me or uh, my failure in the opposite of that. So what does the Prophet son go on to say? Know that if the entire ummah was to gather together to benefit you with something, they could not benefit you with anything unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written it for you. And if they were to gather together to harm you with something, they could not harm you with something unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed it to come your way, allowed that hardship to come your way. You know, this is a, a clear message to Abdullah ibn Abbas, عنهما, this amazing human being, this amazing scholar. Don't let, don't be fooled by the praise of people or by the blame of people. Don't be fooled by the praise of people or by the blame of people. Because you know what? The, the thana of people, the praise of people, and the, the blame of people will both be equally insignificant when you go to your grave. Neither of them will matter at all, okay? Unless you endured something for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but don't be deceived by it. Don't be deluded by it. If you are deluded by those things, then you will lose sight of your purpose. Rufi'at al-aqlam wa jaffat al-suhuf, the pens have been lifted and the pages have dried. And of course, this is a, um, you know, a sign to reaffirm your belief in uh, the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, what's the connection in these last few minutes? What's the connection between believing in the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and dignity and pride in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Pride in the religion, not pride in ourselves, not the unhealthy pride, but the healthy pride, the pride in our religion and, uh, and confidence from our religion and seeking dignity from, uh, from and through uh, our religion. Um, the connection between those two is what, right? Between the belief in qadr, the belief in, in, in decree, in divine decree. That, look, at the end of the day, this person that um, I may fear, okay, they do not even have control over how long they're going to live or when they're going to die or how much risk they're going to attain, sustenance they're going to attain or power they're going to attain. If they have no control of themselves, what control do they actually have over me, right? Uh, and everything that they threaten, nothing of it will materialize unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed it to be written for something that Allah azza wa wants to see out of me. So everything that they've threatened me with, everything that they seek to persecute with, none of it's going to come to me except that Allah azza wa allows it to come to me because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to see something come out of me as a result of that. And when it comes to the praise and these people praise, what, what does their praise matter? Their praise is only equivalent to the extent that the things that they are praising me for are true of me. And if they are true of me, then Allah praises me for them. Okay, because that's the only praise that matters. And so neither their harm nor their praise will go beyond the extent of what Allah Azza wa Jal Al Qadir, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, allows to be true of me or allows to come my way to be uh, to be a form of test for me, and so there's a deep belief between dignity and honor and Izzah uh, and 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 knowing glory through knowing God, and uh, and and being completely settled and at peace with the decree of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the decree of God, and we pray that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala allows us to always keep that perspective. And that Allah always allows us to keep to our deen and keep to that which is uh, pleasing to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not to leave us to ourselves and not to leave us to anyone else, but instead to leave us only to him. You know, when you say in your witr, وَتَوَلَّنِي فِي مَنْ تَوَلَّيْتِ وَتَوَلَّنِي فِي مَنْ تَوَلَّيْتِ O oh Allah, take me as a wali amongst those that you have taken as a wali. إِنَّهُ لَا يَذِلُّ مَنْ وَالَيْتِ وَلَا يَعِزُّ مَنْ عَادَيْتِ You know, there is no honor. Uh, or, or there is no humiliation for the one that you have taken as a wali, and there is no honor for the one that you have taken as an enemy. Because man adali waliya faqad adantuhu bilharb. Whoever takes me, uh, who, whoever 
uh, takes a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone who is beloved to Allah azza wa jalla as an enemy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will wage war on that person. So, innahu la yadhillu man walayt wa la ya'izzu man adayt. So what does that mean? O oh Allah, tawallani fi man tawallayt. Make me amongst those awliya. And what's the process of wilaya? It's in that hadith, right? Uh, deeply immerse yourself. No servant comes to me with something more beloved to me than that which I've made obligatory on them, on them. Don't lose your obligations. Keep to your obligations of the deen. And then continue to get closer and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Immerse yourself deeper in your nawafil, in your voluntary pursuit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through those deeds. And then you know what's going to happen after that? Uh, Allah azza wa jal will love you. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the hearing with which you hear. He's the sight with which you see, right? Tajidhu tujahak, okay? You find him in front of you always, meaning you only see that which is pleasing to Allah and you only hear that which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the connection. And I pray that Allah azza wa jal makes us all amongst those who are his awliya, uh, those who are beloved to him, those who are under his protection. For surely, innahu la yadhillu man walayt wa la yaizzu man adayt. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never allow us to be on the other side of that, never allow us to be accounted amongst his enemies. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khayran. Inshallah ta'ala. I'll turn it back over for questions. Barakallah feek. Jazakumullah khayr. Inshallah, these questions are going to be related to all of the lectures that we've had. Uh, uh, first question, um, we talked a little bit about uh, the uh, uh, One particular prophet that comes to mind when you think about someone who seemed to have everything is the Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam. Uh, who really was in control of the world through 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 Allah subhanahu through the through the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa taala control over the jinn uh, control over the winds and how is someone like him able to have so much yet remain humble at the same time we live in such a materialistic world and we own so much especially compared to people centuries ago and yet sometimes it's difficult to be humble or to remember to be humble what any practical advice. Sulaiman alayhi salam was a zahid in this dunya. He was an ascetic. And that does not make sense to a lot of people because when you think asceticism and zuhud, you know, you think poverty, you think a person that is sitting on the side of the road, begging, wears humble clothes, um, lives in a very humble home. Uh, Sulaiman alayhi salam was a great zahid. How in the world was Sulaiman alayhi salam a zahid? Okay, an ascetic. And this goes to a saying attributed to Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, لَيْسَ الزُّهْدْ أَلَّا تَمْلِكُ شَيْئًا Asceticism is not that you own nothing, وَلَكِنَّهُ أَلَّا يَمْلِكُ كَشَيْئًا But it is that nothing owns you. It's not about how much you have. It's about whether or not you own it or it owns you. Do not let it distract you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. لَا تُلْهِكُمْ أَمْوَالِكُمْ وَلَا أُولَادِكُمْ Right, so you, a person might have uh, 10 kids and they're still a Zahid. A person might have one kid and they're not a Zahid. Okay. <laughs> Likewise with wealth, a person might have a lot and they're a Zahid, they're an ascetic. A person might have very little wealth, but they're still materialistic. Okay. So it's not about quantity. It's about the heart of the person, the lens of the person that that person has on life. So for so with Sulaiman alayhi salam, qala rabbi khirli wa habli mulkan la yambaghi bi ahadin min ba'd. He said, oh Allah, forgive me, my Lord, forgive me. Before he asked for a kingdom, he asked for Allah's forgiveness. And he only asked for a kingdom to spread the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And had Allah azza wa withheld the kingdom from him for his sake, then he would have accepted that because he was seeking the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was his test and he passed that test. He passed that test because he used the kingdom to spread that which was that which was beneficial and that which was beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there's a, there's another athar about Sulaiman alayhi salam that he was uh, once walking and as he was walking with his entire kingdom and you can imagine the sight I mean this is a kingdom talk about a posse okay he was walking and he had the animals on one side and all the different types of animals on one side. He had his human army, he had his jinn army, <laughs> he had all the wealth around him and he's walking with his posse and one of the um, one of the worshippers of the time, 
Abid. He looked at that and he remarked, right, as it was passing by, he said, Yabna Dawood, Laqad Atak, Allah, Mulkan Adima. He said, O oh, son of David, Allah has given you a mighty kingdom. And he turns around and he goes to that man and he says, Listen, one tasbih, one subhanallah is better than everything that has been given to the son of David. All this kingdom is not worth one subhanallah. Why? Because what has been given to the son of David, yadhab, it's all going to go away. But that one subhanallah is going to plant you trees in paradise, palaces in paradise. So one glorification of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, since we're talking about glory, one tasbih, everyone should say subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al-azim. Everyone who hears this should say subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al-azim. So that is better than the kingdom of this world because any kingdom, even the greatest kingdom of the world that Sulaiman salam had, it disappears with this world. But the tasbih is glory in the hereafter. Jazakallah khair. Uh, next question, we, we didn't really delve too much into this as it's more for the convention uh, titled The Pandemic of Racism. But in Surah Fatir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about وَمِنَ الْجِبَالِ جُدَدٌ بِيضٌ وَحُمْرٌ مُخْتَلِفٌ أَلْوَانُهَا وَغَرَابِيبُ Sud That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the differences and the diversity in nature. How can we reflect upon these ayat when it comes to uh, uh, in, the, in the Islamic uh, stance when it comes towards uh, towards loving our Muslim brothers and sisters and really all humanity and against racism and being and having a stance against that. What do you reflect on when you hear this ayah? Uh, Surah Al-Rum, I always mention, by the way, that because uh, it, it matches this, that the ayah, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُ إِلَيْهَا The ayah about marriage is situated between Two ayat, the ayah before it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and khalaqakum min turab, that from the signs of Allah is that he created you from dirt, and then you were spread throughout the earth. And then Allah Azza wa mentions the marriage, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions ikhtilaf wa al-sinatikum wa alwanikum. That from the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the differences, the diversity of your languages and the diversity of your skin colors. Uh, SubhanAllah, and, and still some people would read this ayah and not reflect, right, on, on where it's situated, right? It's situated between two ayat that remind us, first and foremost, that we all have the same origin, and then remind us that we should celebrate our diversity, that our diversity enriches us. It does not uh, diminish us. And so, um, you know, when I, when I think about how Allah Azza wa Jalla describes nature, the human the human race is no different in that sense. Um, I, you know, I'm currently doing a series, and I just paused it for for uh, I'm going to be pausing it just for a few weeks, inshallah, but called the firsts, where we talk about, um, you know, where we we talk about uh, uh, different companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the way that as you're just going through the list of Sahaba, uh, you know, it's just casually mentioned that this person was a black man, right? Or a black woman. Uh, and some people that were never really recognized as sort. So if I told you that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a black man who had, uh, his hair was braided into two. Okay, that was Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu. What did the Prophet some say about him? Of course, he was noted for an incident where he was uh, short, uh, very short, and, and um, you know, uh, a person sitting down was the same height as Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu standing up. And, you know, an average person sitting down was Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu's height when he was standing up. And once Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu was uh, picking a, a siwak from the Arak tree, and the wind blew him into the tree and it exposed his legs, and the Sahaba laughed, and the Prophet said, what are you laughing at? I said, Ya Rasulullah, we were just laughing at the size of his legs. They're so small. And the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that each one of his legs on the Day of Judgment is the size of Uhud. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> that is, uh, you talk about, um, you know, inna akramakum indullahi atqaqum, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah, is the one who has the most taqwa, is the one who's most pious. Think about that image, right? And the Prophet ﷺ saying that that, that leg is the size of Uhud on the Day of Judgment. What a man Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu was. So our diversity, those who can't see um, 
the beauty and diversity, and in fact, see the, uh, the, the priority of taqwa, that taqwa is what defines a person, um, then they are blinded by their own arrogance. Jazakallah khair. And inshallah, we will talk a lot more about this in the convention uh, uh, as well. Uh, another question that came about, and this is related to the ayah, فَمِنْهُمْ ظَالِمٌ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمِنْهُمْ مُقْتَسَدْ وَمِنْهُمْ سَابِقٌ مِنْ الْخَيْرَاتِ But this, uh, this uh, brother or sister in particular asked, uh, sometimes I feel myself being heedless and sinning. How can I identify when that's happening and how do I stop? I'm getting kind of comfortable with sinning almost and it doesn't seem to affect me like it used to. You know, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَتُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say, oh my servants who have transgressed against themselves, they've been extravagant with their sins. Do not despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah forgives all sins. وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ أَسْلِمُوا لَهِ Turn back to your Lord and uh, submit yourself to Him in قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمُ الْعَذَابِ Before punishment comes to your way and you perceive not. Um, one of the greatest punishments of a sin is that a person keeps sinning, that it opens up a door and a person continues to sin and sin and sin, and they become desensitized to that sin. And so they move on to the the the, the next degree of that sin within that same genre, right? So that's a tabi'u khutwat shaitan Follow the footsteps, a gate opens, a door opens, a door opens, a door opens, you become desensitized. The good news is, is that it doesn't matter how far down you've gone that path when you make tawbah to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's all forgotten it's all made up by tawbah by sincere istighfar and sincere tawbah but you need to start turn the other direction and start practically moving in the other direction what you mentioned of heedless sinning um i'm going to try to word this right and it's been a long night, so hopefully I'll get this right, inshallah. <laughs> uh, to be mindless in doing good is better than being mindless in doing evil. To be mindful in doing evil is the worst of them all. And to be mindful in doing good is the best of it all. Let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, that a person becomes habitual and evil to where they do it mindless, mindlessly and sinning, um, that is a problem, right? And it becomes worse when even in your full senses, mindfulness, you sin further and you, you devise further within that sin and delve deeper within that sin. When it comes to good, um, to mindlessly do good is better than mindlessly doing evil. What does that mean? Let's say that you have the habit of dhikr, all right? Uh, SubhanAllah, alhamdulillah, you know, you're saying it and your heart's not there, your mind is not there. That mindless dhikr is better for you as a habit than the mindless sinning, okay? So establishing the regimen, right? You're moving in that path. Now, ultimately though, what do you wanna do? You wanna make your dhikr mindful, okay? So you wanna bring the heart into it, make sure that you're being more uh, present in your athkar, in your good deeds. Uh, so it really is about practically establishing a different route, a different way of life, a different uh, a different way of clinging to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and um, don't leave the sparks of sin present in your life to where that fire can be lit up anytime. Radically detach yourself from sin, gradually attach yourself to good. When you recognize something is haram uh, and you recognize something is sinful, cut it off right away. When you see something good that you want to pursue, take baby steps to it, okay? Take baby steps to it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all and place us on that path to good. I mean, final question, Sheikh. Um, this uh, brother or sister asks, uh, it's, reg it's human nature to want to fit in and uh, to tend to do things that help us fit in, whether it's conforming or feeling insecure about ourselves. Um, can there be some good to conforming and doing things in order to fit in, as long as it makes you feel good about yourself and your identity? Look, uh, Islam does not place on us the burden of doing things that unnecessarily place a barrier between us and people. Uh, the goal is not to put a barrier between you and the people. The goal is to not let the people put a barrier between you and Allah. All right. So conformity in the sense of, you know, uh, you know, in, in the sense of being agreeable in the gatherings and things of that sort, that's fine, but it stops at sinfulness. Uh, so 
you know, that's where a person has to think about these things, you know, like, and that's where the, 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 we, we have to flip the way of thinking here, right? And that's why I was talking about Izza and, and, and Haya um, and the, the boundaries of Izza and Haya, okay? That, you know, some people, by the way, are just naturally very combative people. And so they love this concept of Izza. They hate the concept of Haya. <laughs> some people are naturally just very shy people. And so they love the concept of Haya. They hate the concept of Izza, you know? And again, the point is, don't think about the people, think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you can. And being firm on your principles and steadfast with your principles and articulating that in the best of ways. And all of that, inshallah ta'ala, is found in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu for us to strive and strive and strive and strive. Jazakumullah khair, barakallahu feek, Dr. Omar Sayyiman. We appreciate you coming on so late and for being a part of our knowledge retreat. Inshallah, we look forward to your talks during the convention as well. That is the uh, uh, end of the knowledge retreat for tonight. Inshallah, we hope you all will stay uh, for the next sessions that will come about. Uh, before we conclude, I'd like to end with a dua. Allahumma laka alhamdu wa ilayka al-mushtaka wa anta al-murtaja wa alayka al-tuklan. La hawla wa la quwata illa billahi al-ali al-azim. Ma sha Allahu kan wa ma lam yasha' lam yakun. Allahumma laka alhamdu hatta tarda wa laka alhamdu idha radita wa laka alhamdu ba'da rida ya akram al-akramin. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa zidu wa barik wa an'im wa munna ala sayyidina wa habibina wa qudwatina Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa azwajihi ummahat al-mu'minin wa ahla al-bayti wa dhurriyatihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan ila yawm al-deen. Allahumma aghfir lana wa rahamna wa aafina wa aafu anna. Rabbana aghfir lana wa li walidina. Rabbana rahamuhuma kama rabbayana sigara. Rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa dhurriyatihi. قرة أعين واجعلنا للمتقين إماما اللهم كن ما إخواننا المستضعفين في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها في فلسطين وسوريا وأفغانستان ومصر وليبيا وبرما وفي اليمن والعراق والصين وفي كل أرض يبتلوا فيها المسلمين برحمتك يا رحم الراحمين وصل اللهم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم جزاكم الله خير thank you all for attending in Shalom yes these lectures I've been asked uh, by many people will they be available afterwards yes all this will be available in Shalom if you missed anything or if you want to go back uh, Stick around. We have another uh, uh, wonderful uh, night and uh, with the Quran recitations. Uh, again, Jazakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أتمنى أنكم تجيبون نظاف أنا بناشد العالم بناشدكم كلها أنكم تجيبون نظاف كل الجمعيات بتمنى أنكم تسمعون دائنا والأطفال كلها تبع عند الجزامع يعني تطلع بالشحاط لبرا Project 100 has truly been a transformative experience. It has opened my eyes to so many different aspects. The course in both its content and structure was extraordinary. The Islamic paradigm versus the modern worldview was one of the big draws I had toward this program. Really, the knowledge, I think, is essential for any Muslim. The reflection part in using the journals in particular was really important for me. I'm very grateful for my group as we truly became a family throughout the process. It was just Project 100 brought us together in such a unified way. To shadow my lifestyle in the way of the Prophet. 
If you're someone who loves to ask questions, who does not take things at face value, who loves to learn and pushes themselves to be engaged in the community, then this program is for you. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. You don't know me, but I know you. I am a refugee and an orphan. And you are the person who helps me every year. You make sure I have food to eat and a place to sleep. You make sure that I'm taken care of when there is no one to take care of me. And you have given me hope for the future. I'm not the only one who needs help. There are many more that need someone to care for them. Donate now. Thank you for being there for us. أتمنى أنكم تجيبونا مازوت أنا بناشد العالم بناشدكم كلياتكم تجيبونا مازوت كل الجمعيات بتمناكم تسمعوا ندائنا والأطفال كلياتها ما عندها جزامة عم تطلع بالشحات لبرا the millions of displaced refugees living in camps worldwide. For us, winter is a battlefield that we're ill-equipped for. Our tents are not insulated and our bodies are exposed to the harsh elements. In the depths of a cold winter night, our beds don't provide any safety from the freezing temperature. And because of this, many of us will become sick and some of us may not survive until spring, especially the kids. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. 
Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. You don't know me, but I know you. I am a refugee and an orphan. And you are the person who helps me every year. You make sure I have food to eat and a place to sleep. You make sure that I'm taken care of when there is no one to take care of me. And you have given me hope for the future. I'm not the only one who needs help. There are many more that need someone to care for them. Donate now. Thank you for being there for us. أتمنى أنكم تجيبوا لنا مازوت، أنا بناشد العالم بناشدكم كلياتكم تجيبوا لنا مازوت، كل الجمعيات بتمناكم تسمعوا ندائنا، والأطفال كلياتها ما عندها جزامة عم تطلع بالشحات لبرا. We are the millions of displaced refugees living in camps worldwide. For us, winter is a battlefield that we're ill-equipped for. Our tents are not insulated and our bodies are exposed to the harsh elements. In the depths of a cold winter night, our beds don't provide any safety from the freezing temperature. And because of this, many of us will become sick. And some of us may not survive until spring, especially the kids. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, 
but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. You don't know me, but I know you. I am a refugee and an orphan. And you are the person who helps me every year. You make sure I have food to eat and a place to sleep. You make sure that I'm taken care of when there is no one to take care of me. And you have given me hope for the future. I'm not the only one who needs help. There are many more that need someone to care for them. Donate now. Thank you for being there for us. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakum Allah khair for joining us uh, on this evening for the Quran night. Before we begin, we wanted to give a uh, special message from one of our sponsors, Islamic Relief, a dear sponsor for this, ev for this event as well as for the Masikna convention. And then we will begin the program momentarily. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dear sisters and brothers, 26 years ago, an orphaned child landed on the doorstep of the American Muslim community. We didn't know much about how they got here, but we knew that when they cried, they cried for the people around the world who were suffering from crises like starvation, violence, and drought. This orphan child's name was Islamic Relief USA. Born of conflict, climbing of lives of thousands from mosque to mosque, city to city, and from cost to cost, we explain to anyone who would listen that by carrying for this organization, you would be carrying for the lives of thousands desperately looking for help. You answered the call. And now Islamic Relief USA has grown into the largest Muslim organization in the United States, serving over 7 million beneficiaries around the world. Your donation have helped our neighbors survive earthquake in Pakistan and Haiti, war in famine in Yemen and Syria. Now, this is the time for you to keep supporting Islamic Relief USA, especially during this hard time. We were able to continue our mission during COVID-19 by supporting the society and our neighborhood here in America and our projects worldwide. I'm calling upon you this Ramadan to keep supporting Islamic Relief USA to help us to fulfill our mission. Thank you so much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Hamdan kathiran, tayyiban, mubarakan fih. Mil as-samawati wa mil al-ard wa mil ama sha'a rabbuna min shay'in ba'd. Ahaqqu ma qala al-abdu وكلنا له عبد والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على سيد ولد آدم سيدنا وقائدنا وحبيبنا وقرة عيوننا محمد اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه صلاة وسلاما دائمين متلازمين إلى يوم الدين رب صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعه بإحسان إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الإخوة والأخوات يا من تتابعوننا من خلف الشاشات تحية من عند الله معطرة طيبة 
في بداية هذه الأمسية القرآنية المباركة من مؤتمر ماس 2020 حياكم الله وأهلا وسهلا بكم في هذا اللقاء الطيب المبارك الذي نسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يجعله في خالص أعمالنا وأعمالكم آمين آمين رب العالمين قديما نادى الإمام الشاطبي لأهل القرآن في أهل القرآن وإن كتاب الله أوثق شافع وأغنى غناء واهبا متفضلا وخير جليس لا يمل حديثه وترداده يزداد فيه تجملا وحيث الفتى يرتاع في ظلماته من القبر يلقاه سنا متهللا هنالك يهنيه مقيلا وروضة ومن أجله في ذروة العز يجتلى يناشد في إرضائه لحبيبه هذا القرآن يناشد الله لأهل القرآن يناشد في إرضائه لحبيبه وأجدر به سؤلا إليه موصلا فيا أيها القاري به متمسكا مجلا له في كل حال مبجلا هنيئا مريئا والداك عليهما ملابس أنوار من التاج والحلى فما ظنكم بالنجر عند جزائه أولئك أهل الله والصفوة الملا أولو البر والإحسان والصبر والتقى حلاهم بها جاء القرآن مفصلا جزى الله بالخيرات عنا أئمة لنا نقلوا القرآن عذبا وسلسلا في هذه الأمسية الطيبة المباركة أصحبكم أنا الدكتور إسامة جابر الإمام في مسجد بيلو سبارك في هذه الليلة المباركة بصحبة شيخان كريمان آتاهم الله سبحانه وتعالى من كرمه ونعيمه صوتا يدندنون به في القرآن العظيم يطوف بنا بل يطوف بنا في رحاب السماء الشيخ حسن ناصر من نيوجيرسي والشيخ ناصر الروبي من هنا من شيكاغو لا نطيل عليكم خير ما نبدأ به هذه الأمسية الطيبة المباركة آيات طيبات عطرات من فم طيب مبارك لطالما هيج القلوب حبا في القرآن العظيم الشيخ حسن صالح فليتفضل مشكورا مأجورا في بداية هذه الأمسية الطيبة المباركة أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقترب الوعد الحق فإذا هي شاخصة أبصار الذين كفروا يا ويلنا قد كنا في غفلة من هذا قد كنا في غفلة من هذا بل كنا ظالمين إنكم وما تعبدون من دون الله حصب جهنم أنتم لها واردون لو كان
لهم فيها زفير وهم فيها لا يسمعون إن الذين سبقت لهم من الحسن أولئك عنها مبعدون لا يسمعون حسيسها وهم في مشتهت أنفسهم خالدون. نعم. الله 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 الله. لا يح. زنهم الفزع الأكبر لا يحزنهم الفزع الأكبر وتتلقاهم الملائكة وتتلقاهم الملائكة هذا يومكم الذي كنتم توعدون يوم نطوي السماء كطي السجل للكتب يوم نطوي السماء كطي السجل ما بدأنا أول خلق نعيده وعدا علينا وعدا علينا إنا كنا فاعلين إن الذين سبقت لهم من الحسن أولئك عنها لا يسمعون حسيسها لا يسمعون حسيسها وهم في مشتهت 
أنفسهم خالدون لا يحزنهم الفزع الأكبر لا يحزنهم الفزع الأكبر وتتلق قاهم الملائكة لا يحزنهم الفزع الأكبر وتتلقاهم الملائكة هذا يومكم وتتلقاهم الملائكة هذا يومكم الذي كنتم توعدون يوم تطوى السماء كطي السجل للكتاب يوم تطوى السماء كطي السجل للكتاب يوم تطوى السماء كطي السجل للكتاب كما بدانا أول خلق نعيده وعدا علينا وعدا علينا وعدا علينا إنا كنا فاعلين يوم تطوى السماء كطي السجل للكتاب كما بدانا أول خلق نعيده وعدا علينا وعدا علينا إنا كنا فاعلين ولقد كتبنا في الزبور من بعد الذكر أن الأرض يرثها عبادي الصالحون إن في هذا لبلاغ لقوم وما أرسلناك إلا رحمة للعالمين
وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزُّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِ الصَّالِحُونَ إِنَّ فِي هَذَا صدق الله العظيم طيب الله هذه الأنفاس ما شاء الله عليك شيخنا أكرمك ربي ذكرتنا بموقف رسولنا صلى الله عليه وسلم حين اتكأ يوما على حائط لأبي موسى الأشعري يستمع القرآن ثم قال له في اليوم الآتي قال يا أبا موسى لو رأيتني وأنا أستمع إليك البارحة لقد أوتيت مزمارا من مزامير آل داود وما نظنك إلا على هذا إن شاء الله سبحانه وتعالى فطيب الله هذه الأنفاس أما أنتم إخواني وأخواتي الذين تشاهدوننا في هذه الليلة الطيبة المباركة من خلف الشاشات فبشراكم على لسان رسولنا صلى الله عليه وسلم ففي الحديث الذي يرويه الإمام مسلم بسنده عن أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه وأرضاه قال رسولنا صلى الله عليه وسلم وما اجتمع قوم في بيت من بيوت الله يتلون كتاب الله ويتدارسونه بينهم إلا نزلت عليهم السكينة وغشيتهم الرحمة وحفتهم الملائكة وذكرهم الله في من عنده أي نعم فرقت بيننا هذه الجائحة فرقت بين أجسادنا لكننا نسأل الله عز وجل وإن كنا من خلف الشاشات إلا أننا نعقد النية أن هذا اللقاء على مأدبة القرآن نستمع إليه ونتدبره ونعيش مع معانيه كيف لا؟ وقد قال عثمان بن عفان رضي الله عنه وأرضاه ذو النورين صاحب رسولنا صلى الله عليه وسلم وتلميذه النجيب قال لو طهرت قلوبكم ما شبعت من كلام ربكم اللهم يا أكرم الأكرمين لا تحرمنا لذة الاستماع والتدبر والعيش مع كتابك العظيم المبارك ضيفنا الثاني الشيخ ناصر الروبي أيضا مزمار من مزامير القرآن المبارك آتاه الله سبحانه وتعالى صوتا نديا طيبا مباركا ناداه عبد الرحمن العشماوي في نداء لأهل القرآن فقال له يا قارئ القرآن داوي قلوبنا بتلاوة تزدان بالتجويد اقرأ لينجلي الظلام عن الربا وليسمع الغافي زواج رهودي اقرأ لعل الله يوقظ غافلا من قومنا ويلين قلب عنيدي يا قارئ القرآن إن قلوبنا عطشا 
يا قارئ القرآن إن قلوبنا عطشة إلى حوض الهدى المورود شرف مسامعنا بآيات الهدى وافتح منافذ دربنا المسدود الرسالة إليك شيخ ناصر والمساحة بين يديك فأسمعنا يا قارئ القرآن ما يشنف الآذان ويقربنا إلى ربنا سبحانه وتعالى الرحمن إلى الشيخ ناصر الروبي وتلاوة عطرة من آيات الذكر الحكيم فليتفضل مشكورا مأجورا إن شاء الله أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم تبارك الذي جعل في السماء بروجا تبارك الذي جعل في السماء سماء بروجا وجعل فيها سراجا وقمرا منيرا وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفة لمن أراد أن يذكر أو أراد شكورا وعباد الرحمن وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا طبهم الجاهلون قالوا سلاما والذين يبيتون لرب بهم سجدا وقياما وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض هونا وإذا خاطبهم
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم وهو الذي جعل الليل والنهار خلفة لمن أراد أن يذكر لمن أراد أن ذكر أو أراد شكورا وعباد الرحمن الذين يمشون على الأرض والذين يبيتون لربهم سجدا وقياما اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم ان عذابها كان غراما ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساءت مستقرا ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم
ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساعة والذين إذا أنفقوا لم يسرفوا ولم يقتروا وكان بين ذلك قواما والذين لا يدعون مع الله إلها آخر ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم ولا يقتلون النفس التي حرم الله إلا بالحق ولا يزنون ومن يفعل إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا وكان الله غفورا رحيما إلا من تاب وآمن وعمل عملا صالحا فأولئك يبدل الله سيئاتهم حسنات 
وكان الله غفورا رحيما ومن تاب وعمل صالحا فإنه يتوب إلى الله متى صدق الله العظيم صدق الله العظيم أيها الله هذه الأنفاس جزاك الله خيرات حلقت فينا في سماء واسعة مع هذه الآيات الطيبة المباركة صدق رسولنا صلى الله عليه وسلم حيث قال لا حسد إلا في اثنتين وأحدهما رجل آتاه الله القرآن فهو يتلوه آناء الليل وأطراف النهار أسأل الله عز وجل أن يجعلنا وإياكم من هذا الصنف الذين يعيشون القرآن تلاوة وترنما وتجملا وعيشا وتطبيقا وتدبرا آمين آمين رب العالمين لا يمل والله لكن تعالوا بنا ننتقل من رحاب القرآن العظيم الكريم إلى رحاب الكلم الطيب المبارك ينشد يشنف الآذان يدخل إلى القلوب ويحض على كل صالح من عمل وبر وخلق وأدب نعود مرة أخرى إلى نيوجيرسي إلى شيخنا الحبيب ضيفنا في هذه الأمسية الشيخ حسن صالح لكن هذه المرة ليشنف الآذان بنشيد وكلم طيب مبارك فأتوجه إليه مباشرة فليسعدنا بما بين يديه من كلام طيب من يرى ما في الضمير ويسمع يا من يرى ما في الضمير ويسمع أنت المعد لكل ما يتوقع يا من يرجى للشدائد كلها يا من إليه المشتكى والمفزع يا من إليه المشتكى والمفزع يا من خزائن رزقه في قول كن أمن فإن الفضل عندك أجمع ما لي سوى فقري إليك وسيلة ففف بالافتقار إليك فبالافتقار إليك فقري أدفع فبالافتقار إليك فقري أدفع ما لي سوى قرعي لبابك حيلة فلئن رددت فأي باب أقرأ ومن ذا الذي أرجو فأهتف باسمه إن كان فضلك عن فقيرك يمنع حاشا لفضلك أن تقنط عاصيا 
حاشا لفضلك أن تقنط عاصيا الفضل أجزل والمواهب أوسع بالذل قد وافيت بابك بالذل قد وافيت بابك عالما أن التذلل عند بابك ينفع بالذل بالذل قد وافيت بابك عالما أن التذلل عند بابك ينفع وجعلت معتمدي عليك توكلا وبسطت كفي سائلا أتضرع وبسطت كفي سائلا أتضرع فاجعل لنا فاجعل لنا فاجعل لنا فاجعل لنا من كل ضيق مخرجا والطف بنا يا من اليه المرجع فاجعل لنا من كل ضيق مخرجا والطف بنا يا من اليه المرجع يا أشكو إليك ضآلتي ومذلتي فارفع بفضلك ما أذل زماني أدعوك أدعوك في صمتي وفي نطقي وفي همسي بقلب دائم الخفقان أدعوك فقبل دعوتي وارفع بها شأني وكل يا عظيم الشان لك في الفؤاد محبة ومهابة يا من بحبك يستضيئك ياني أنا يا إلهي عائد من وحدتي أنا هارب من كثرة الأشجان من لي سواك يجيرني ويعيدني من عالم الأهواء والشيطان سدت بوجهي كل أبواب المنى فأتيت بابك طالب الغفران يا رب يا رب يا رب يا رب إني 
قد أتيتك تائبا فاقبل بعفوك توبة ندماني نبي الهدى صلوا عليه اللهم صلي وسلم وبارك عليه الله يفتح عليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على حبيبنا وقرة عيوننا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أيها الإخوة الكرام في كل مكان ونحن نعيش وإياكم هذه الأمسية المباركة خطر في بالي أن لو نعيش هذه الأمسية القرآنية المباركة لا مرة في العام ولا اثنتين ولا ثلاث بل أن نعيشها كأسرة مسلمة كل أسبوع في بيوتنا ما أعظم وأجمل أن تلتقي الأسرة المسلمة ولو مرة واحدة في الأسبوع ولو لنصف ساعة أو ساعة في الأسبوع هذا يقرأ القرآن وهذا يسمعنا نشيدا وهذه تذكر لنا موقفا أو قصة وهذا يدعو لنا في الختام أسرة مسلمة تبدأ مسيرة الحياة نحو القرآن ومع القرآن بأمسية قرآنية أسبوعية في كل منزل ما أحوجنا أن نعيش هذه المعاني وأن نطبق ما ندعو الله سبحانه وتعالى به ألسنا ندعو الله ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذرياتنا قرة أعين ألسنا ندعو الله عز وجل كما دعا إبراهيم الخليل عليه السلام رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء تحتاج هذه الدعوات المباركة خطوات عمالية بعد هذا الدعاء ومعه هذه الفكرة المباركة الأمسية القرآنية فكرة تصلح لكل بيت مسلم في كل أسبوع أن يلتقوا على طاعة الله قرآنا ودعاء وذكرا وكلما طيبا لعل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يحفظ بيوتنا وأن يعيننا آباء وأمهات على الارتقاء بأنفسنا وبأولادنا وتحصينهم بالإيمان والقرآن سريعا أعود إلى ضيفي الثاني الشيخ ناصر ليتحفنا أيضا بما فتح الله عز وجل عليه بمناجاة كريمة ونشيد طيب فإليك المايك أخي العزيز أنعم وأكرم بك سيدي لا إله إلا سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا وعظيمنا محمد رسول الله يا رب يا رب عفوك ورضا وحسن لقاك وحلمك على من عصاك يا رب يا جابرا كسر كسر القلوب جميع ذا اجعل لنا اجعل لنا فيما جبرت نصيبا من للنفوس من للنفوس إذا تعاظم كربها من للنفوس إذا تعاظم كربها 
وبدا لها خطو الحياه صعيبا من للعيون من للعيون من للعيون اذا تقاطر دمعها من إذا تقاطر دمعها يجل الأسى دون الأنام قريبا إن الذي أبكى إن الذي أبكى وأضحك قادر إن الذي أبكى وأضحك قادر سبحانه إن الذي أبكى وأضحك قادر قادر أن يبرئ القلب العليل طبيبا فاشرح بنورك فاشرح بنورك يا مهيمن صدرنا وجعل لنا درب الحياة رحيبا سيدي يا رسول الله سيدي يا رسول الله يا حبيب الله يا سيد الكونين صلوا عليه يا سيد الكونين يا علم الهدى هذا النبي الهاشمي محمد هذا النبي الهاشمي محمد هذا لكل يا سيدي يا رسول الله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على خير خلقك نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين جزاك الله الخيرات أيها الإخوة والأخوات قطار أمسيتنا يوشك أن يصل إلى محطته الأخيرة الدعاء نختم به إن شاء الله سبحانه وتعالى فأيا كنتم أينما كنتم خلف الشاشات ارفعوا أيديكم وأمنوا خلف الدعاء على الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يكرمنا وإياكم بأن نوافق 
ساعة إجابة وأن يكون وتكون أبواب السماء مفتوحة على الله عز وجل أن يستجيب دعاءنا ودعاءكم إلى الشيخ الحبيب الشيخ حسن صالح ودعوات على الله سبحانه وتعالى ليتقبلها منا ومنه نذهب إليه لنعود بالختام إن شاء الله أنا لك الحمد بالإيمان ولك أمين. الحمد بالإسلام أمين. ولك الحمد بالقرآن أمين. اللهم لك الحمد كله ولك أمين. الشكر كله وإليك يرجع الأمر كله على نيته وسره سبحانك جل شأنك وعظم جاهك ولا إله غيرك سبحانه. ولا إله إلا أنت خلقتنا ورزقتنا وأكرمتنا وهديتنا للإسلام وعلمتنا الحكمة والقرآن اللهم صلِّ وسلِّم وبارِك على سيِّدنا وحبيبنا محمد صلاةً دائمةً متلازمةً بدوام ملكك يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل جمعنا مرحوما اللهم اجعل جمعنا مرحوما اللهم اجعل جمعنا مرحوما وتفرُّقنا من بعده معصوما ولا تدع فينا ولا منا ولا بيننا ولا في من يستمع إلينا شقيًّا ولا محروما اللهم لا تصرفنا من جمعنا هذا في ليلتنا هذه إلا بذنب مغفور وسعي مشكور وعمل صالح مبرور اللهم هب المسيئين منا للمحسنين اللهم ربنا يا ذا الجلال والإكرام أكرمتنا وجمعتنا على تلاوة القرآن في هذه الليلة المباركة والاستماع إليه فاللهم أكرمنا بصحبة آل القرآن وأصحابه في الدنيا والآخرة اللهم إنا نسألك يا ربنا أن تملأ بيوتنا بالقرآن وأن تحفظ أولادنا ببركة القرآن وأن تنعم علينا بالرضا والقبول والسعادة في الدارين ببركة القرآن يا رب العالمين اللهم حفظه أولادنا وعمر به بيوتنا واشرح به صدورنا وأصلح به أحوالنا واجعله قائدنا ودليلنا إلى جناتك جنات النعيم اللهم ارزقنا تدبر القرآن وفهم القرآن والعمل بالقرآن والاحتكام إلى القرآن اللهم أدخلنا الجنة بكرامة القرآن اللهم ربنا نسألك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام أن تشفي مرضانا وأن ترحم موتانا وأن تفرج كروب المسلمين في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها اللهم إن لنا إخوة وأخوات سألون الدعاء ونحن لا نملك لهم ولا لأحد من خلقك ضرا ولا نفعا أنت أعلم بحاجاتهم فاشف الله اللهم مرضاهم وارحم موتاهم واقض حوائجهم واغفر لنا ولهم ولجميع خلقك أجمعين اللهم بارك في هذا المؤتمر وفي القائمين عليه وتقبل جهودهم في خدمة الإسلام والمسلمين يا رب العالمين اللهم ربنا بارك في إخواننا وأخواتنا الذين يستمعون إلينا في هذه الليلة من كل مكان يا رب العالمين اللهم إنا نسألك فرجاً عاجلاً لأمة الإسلام في كل مكان كما نسألك بزوال هذا الوباء الذي عمت به البلوى وعانت منه البشرية يا رب العالمين اللهم إنا نسألك فرجاً عاجلاً للدنيا كلها من هذا الوباء يا ربنا ليس لها من دونك كاشفة سبحانك سبحانك جل شأنك نسألك أن تفرج هذا الكرب يا ربنا يا مولانا يا ذا الجلال والإكرام يا حي يا قيوم نسألك فرجا عاجلا للدنيا كلها يا ربنا اللهم أحسن ختامنا وتوفنا وأنت راض عنا سبحانك هذا الدعاء ومنك التفضل والإجابة ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله وصل اللهم وسلم وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم آمين 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 يا رب العالمين في نهاية هذه الأمسية القرآنية المباركة لم يبقى إلا أن نتوجه بالشكر أولا وآخرا لله رب العالمين أن من علينا وعليكم بهذه الأمسية المباركة وبصحبة القرآن وأهل القرآن والاستماع لكتابه العزيز الحمد لله والشكر له أولا وآخرا ثم الشكر للقائمين على هذا المؤتمر المبارك أسأل الله سبحانه وتعالى أن يتقبل جهدهم وأن يجعله خالصا لوجهه الكريم وأن ينفع به أولئك الكرام خلف الشاشات وخلف الكاميرات أولئك الذين أرادوا لهذا المؤتمر أن تستمر مسيرته ورسالته وألا تنقطع بأفضل الوسائل الممكنة فجزاهم الله الخيرات الشكر لكم أيها الكرام الذين تبعتونا في هذه الأمسية وندعوكم غدا للاستمرار 
في متابعة محطات هذا المؤتمر المبارك غدا وبعد غد محطات عظيمة لا تفوتكم ولا يفوتنكم الخير ولا أنسى شكر ضيفاي الكريمان الحبيبان الشيخان الكريمان الشيخ ناصر الروبي والشيخ حسن صالح الذين تجشموا عناء القدوم ها هنا ليتوا القرآن ويسمعوه قلوبنا مع أسماعنا فجزاهم الله الخيرات لم يبقى إلا أن أقول سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief. I know you. I am a refugee and an orphan. And you are the person who helps me every year. You make sure I have food to eat and a place to sleep. You make sure that I'm taken care of when there is no one to take care of me. And you have given me hope for the future. I'm not the only one who needs help. There are many more that need someone to care for them. Donate now. Thank you for being there for us. أتمنى أنكم تجيبوا لنا مازوت، أنا بناشد العالم بناشدكم كلياتكم تجيبوا لنا مازوت، كل الجمعيات بتمناكم تسمعوا ندائنا، والأطفال كلياتها ما عندها جزامة عم تطلع بالشحات لبرا. the millions of displaced refugees living in camps worldwide. For us, winter is a battlefield that we're ill-equipped for. Our tents are not insulated and our bodies are exposed to the harsh elements. In the depths of a cold winter night, our beds don't provide any safety from the freezing temperature. And because of this, many of us will become sick and some of us may not survive until spring, especially the kids.
winter is coming. As our hands begin to feel the cold, our breath can once again be seen. We wear our boots and drink our cocoa. We have warm food and spend time with family. The season is the same, but the difficulties are not. Winter is a dreadful season for those who have no shelter, no heat, and no food. Share your warmth this winter. Donate to Islamic Relief.